Canadian, or Canadian, French Canadian descent. Uh, turns out that Professor Chason and I have passed once before in our careers. I installed a physics honor society chapter at the University of Lowell the year after he graduated, and he was invited back to become a charter member of the group. So we have passed once before. He's known as one of the best instructors at Harvard University. Uh, he's had some articles published recently in Scientific American and is going to talk to us about Einstein's influence on scientific research as it goes today. Professor Chason. Thank you, Dr. Shigat. Can everyone hear me reasonably well? Okay. We can take that first slide. Thank you. That's good. Well, as I understand it, my task uh, this afternoon is an attempt to distill for the general public a popular lecture concerning the consequences, in particular some of the experimental consequences of Einstein's theory that are now being tested uh, in a contemporary sense. I'd like to uh, essentially address two themes, one of which will be the entire universe in bulk, in general, something that Einstein thought about, something that we're now testing experimentally. And secondly, I'd like to inquire about some of the specific bizarre states of matter that Einstein predicted, namely the black hole, that are also now being tested experimentally within uh, the past few years. So let me begin by suggesting that uh, Probably since the dawn of civilization, since the dawn of thought in our civilization, uh, men and women have wondered, in particular natural philosophers have thought about the nature of our universe. They've thought about the universe, they've thought about the planet, they've thought about themselves. They've thought and they've thought. But only recently, relatively recently, at the time of the Renaissance, for example, did people recognize that they had, you had to do more than think, generally. To understand nature, to understand the universe and our planet and ourselves, You've got to take an additional step. You've got to experiment. You've got to observe nature and test the theories, test the hypothesis to either refine the hypothesis if the experiment sort of works well, but reject the hypothesis if the experiment doesn't work well at all. And interestingly enough, the application of this so-called scientific method, whereby you form an hypothesis and then test it experimentally, only within the past 50 years or less has suggested strongly that we live in no very special place in the universe at all. In fact, we live on what seems to be an ordinary rock called Earth that just happens to be orbiting about a run-of-the-mill type star called the Sun. One star, the suburb of an enormous coagulation of stars called the Milky Way, and one just small, relatively un un undistinguished galaxy among billions upon billions of uncounted, uncountable perhaps, galaxies strewn throughout an abyss that we just happen to call the universe. So essentially now, in contemporary thought, within this century, we ask the same questions that the, that the philosophers of old, that the philosophers of ancient times asked. We want to know about the universe. We want to know what it is. We want to know essentially what the inventory of matter is that exists there. We want to know the size, the shape, the structure, the whole darn big picture. We seek out the same questions, but now, with the aid of technology and a real renaissance in machinery and equipment, we can begin to test theories of, uh, of Einstein and theories of others to really begin to examine the nature of the universe in particular and all as well as bizarre say, states of matter that might exist within such as black holes. Now if you're going to hang in here today and follow what I have to offer, you've got to put, put behind you common sense. You've got to put behind human intuition. You've got to recognize that a million years is a wink in the cosmic scheme of things. You've got to recognize that a billion years, B, a billion years, is still short time interval. You've got to really broaden your horizons and expand your mind and allow yourselves to appreciate the big picture, the whole darn show, with respect to, in particular, the way in which Einstein thought it might be characterized, theoretically. Now, again, you can suggest that uh, we look out into the universe, as might be shown on the next slide. We look out into the universe with telescopes, and we see galaxies. Enormous coagulations of matter, much like those in which we live, the Milky Way galaxy, strewn throughout the observable abyss. And in photographs such as this, uh, taken through the world's largest optical telescope at Mount Palomar, you can see easily a number of uh, galaxies 
but a close examination of this photograph would easily show, uh, oh, perhaps uh, 50 to 100 individual galaxies. Now, each one of these galaxies, such as this one down here at the lower right, is a pinwheel type of structure generally with uh, stars, gas, dust, radiation, lots of stars, perhaps on the order of 100 billion or more stars, some of which may have planets, some of which may have intelligent life, but that's another story. The point here being that uh, as we look out from our perspective, from the Milky Way out, we see essentially galaxies. Now we're not concerned in this particular examination today with the structure of the universe, we're not concerned with planets. They are irrelevant. We're not concerned with people, fortunately. They are irrelevant, except for the people perhaps thinking about these subjects and experimenting about them. Generally, planets and people are irrelevant. Even stars are just point sources of hydrogen consumption. Even the galaxies individually are mere details in this big picture. But we are interested in the bulk motions of these galaxies. We need, in fact, two, two pieces of information to, us, to address the structure of the universe. We need, we need a study of the motions of the galaxies in general, and we also need a knowledge of relativity theory. So I propose to spend a few moments to examine the nature of galaxies as we see them from planet Earth, outward, beyond our own Milky Way system, and then after giving you an appreciation for their bulk motions, come back and try to share with you something about relativity, and then put them, to, put them, put them together in order to derive the structure of the universe as we understand it now as well as perhaps some inferences about the origin of the universe and the destiny of the universe. So we see galaxies like these and we can study their physical and chemical contents, but more importantly, we can use spectroscopy in order to study their bulk motions. And interestingly enough, when we look at these optically, when we look at these galaxies, we see that they are all moving away from us, with one or two exceptions very, very nearby, and we know those nearby exceptions, we know how to interpret those, all of the other galaxies in the universe, and there are billions upon hundreds of billions uncountable galaxies, are all moving away. It would suggest, at first sight, that we are at the center of something, if everything's moving away from us. But that's not only anthropocentric philosophically, and probably wrong, but I think physically we can show that it's wrong. Uh, in particular, if Einstein's theory is correct, and space-time is really curved and warped to a large extent. Now the next slide shows a representative sample of several galaxies, of five of them. I've noted here on the left, five different galaxies. And I've, 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 they're plotted here, or they're listed here, in order of increasing distance, shown here, from a mere 770 million light years distant to about three and a half billion light years distant. Now you've got to remember one very important thing, and that is as we look out into space, we're looking back into time. Why is that? Because when we look out at a galaxy that's far away and sample the radiation incident on the Earth, that radiation has taken time to get here. Even though it's traveling at the fastest velocity possible, the velocity of light, it takes time to get here because the universe is so vast. It still takes a certain amount of time such that if this, this object called Virgo is really 70 million uh, light years away, then it takes 70 million years for the light to get here. So the radiation that we detect from Virgo, for example, tonight with our telescopes, might tell us, if we can understand it reasonably well, something about the physical conditions in the universe 70 million years ago. And consequently, as we look out to greater distances in the universe, to somewhere around what we might call the galaxy horizon in the vicinity of 4 billion light years, we start determining something about the very ancient past. So you see, the astronomer is really the historian. Just like the archaeologist or the paleoanthropologist who sifts through the data, sifts through the rubble, and tries to obtain some hints as to what the origins of men and women might be, the astronomer sifts through ancient radiation, arriving, for example, tonight from distant galaxies. It's been traveling through space for eons of time, and if we can unravel what's, what, what lies deep down inside this radiation, then perhaps we can understand something about more than the origins of men and women, more than the origins of planet Earth. In fact, the origins of the universe, if we can look out into space and therefore back into time enough. Now, the point here that's quite important is that as you examine spectroscopically this, the, the characteristic fingerprint of all galaxies, you can determine through the Doppler effect that each one of their characteristic fingerprints are shifted.
Doppler effect in great detail. You know the story. The train comes by, and the audio signal is shifted. As the train's approaching, it's the highest pitch than the train's leaving. Well, that's a change in acoustical signal. That's terrestrial familiarity. Light and other forms of radiation shift in the same way because of the motion of the galaxy, because of the motion of any astronomical object. But the neat thing to be noted is that when these galaxies are listed in order of increasing distance from top to bottom, the velocities derived from the Doppler effect spectroscopically also increase from top to bottom. And you might think that maybe there's a correlation between distance and velocity. And indeed, there is. Edwin Hubble, the uh, astronomer at Caltech in the 1920s, recognized this empirically, shown in the next slide. In particular, the five galaxies that uh, are shown in the previous slide are plotted at the top of this particular slide. I, I don't want to get too technical, but I simply plot velocity as a function of distance. And I correlate, I show, as Hubble did, the correlation, the perfect correlation between uh, the velocity and distance for each of the five galaxies at the very top. And then you can generalize that for many galaxies, as astronomers have done in the past year, uh, number, of, number of decades now, showing in this bottom slide here, the bottom frame, that there indeed is a correlation, a reasonably good one, between distance and velocity, all, all the way out to this, what we might call, again, the galaxy horizon. Why is it a horizon? Because, in fact, we have a tough time seeing galaxies beyond this point, objects that are recognizable as galaxies. There are objects beyond this point. Generally, they are quasars. And the quasars are so mysterious and so difficult to understand at the present time, we don't plot them here. But again, you see the correlation. And the correlation can be quantified in this way by noting that the velocity is proportional to the distance, the proportionality factor being this <coughs> Hubble constant. The Hubble constant being a very, very important, uh, what do you call it, uh, fact of nature, uh, numerical value, because it can specify, if we can determine simply the slope of that line properly, what the rate is that the universe is moving out, the rate at which the universe is expanding. Because you see, again, from our point of view at planet Earth, we see all the objects moving away. We see them all moving. They're not static. They're not steady. They're not quiescent. They're moving out. There's activity. The universe is uh, evolving with time. It's time dependent. It is, in fact, expanding. And it's expanding in a very reasonable way according to this Hubble relationship. I can't call it a Hubble law because there's no law of physics that predicts that the universe ought to obey this sort of thing. But you can see the data. The data show that, in fact, the relationship is quite good and continues to hold at least out to the galaxy horizon. It's an empirical finding. So that's galaxies. From our point of view, it looks as though everything's pushing away. Experimentally, everything is pushing away, as best we can tell. It implies, at first sight, that we're, the, we're at the center of the universe. But that's not true. I want to show you why. But to show you why, we need the other tool. And that other tool is relativity. Now, Einstein uh, makes two, uh, two statements in relativity as I understand it. He says simply that the laws of physics, as we heard this morning, the laws of physics are generally the same. With respect to all observers, no matter what those observers are doing, no matter how you look at the, uh, no matter how the observers look at an experiment, the laws of physics remain the same. It seems simple enough. The other statement, the other basic tenet of relativity that Einstein postulates is that, in fact, um, time is the fourth dimension. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, look, there are three dimensions of space. It's up and down, and back and forth, it's in and out. We live in three dimensions, three dimensional space, it's easy. But there's also time, past and future. If I want to meet you up there at the exit sign, that space, I've got to tell you when, in order to create the event in space time. Otherwise, we won't intersect in space and time, and the event won't occur, we won't meet. Must be by accident. So you've got to consider not only space and time, and as suggested by many relativists, space time. And then you've got to generalize the nature of space-time in the universe. Now, one of the very important implications of the Einstein general theory is sketched, I think, on the next slide. Here's uh, a notification of the equivalence principle that uh, Professor Lightman will speak about in the next lecture for the most part. But I'll just note briefly here that uh, generally Einstein suggested that if you were to go into an elevator, Say you go into an elevator in this building, if there be one, and if the elevator goes up, you can feel a pull. You can feel a pull on the bottom of your feet, in particular. 
That's because the elevator is accelerating upwards. Now you could take that same elevator, provided it has no windows, and take it out into free space, in the case at the left here, where there's no gravitational field, and then accelerate the elevator again. You'd feel the same pull on your feet, due to the acceleration of the elevator, far from a gravitational field. But you could have the same sort of effect existing in this elevator when the elevator is at rest in the vicinity of the Earth's gravitational field or some other gravitational field due to an object that has mass. And Einstein suggested, as we heard this morning generally, that you can't tell the difference between the effect of gravity on an object and the effect of acceleration of that object. They're one and the same. And so Einstein suggested that, in fact, this notion, this Newtonian notion, this notion of Isaac Newton, Renaissance times of gravity, pulling, we just done away with. It's just the way in which objects accelerate in the universe. What objects are accelerating? Well, the Earth is accelerating around the sun. We're accelerating right now. We're moving around the sun. The universe is pretty well greased in the absence of friction, so we don't know that we're accelerating. But we are accelerating around the sun, either because in the Newtonian sense, the sun is pulling, or in the Einsteinian sense, because the Earth is accelerating due to the warp of the curvature of space-time created by the sun. Let me show you what I mean by that in the next slide. Here's an attempt, could you lower that just a bit, in uh, frame A at the top, to note how in the Newtonian sense, the sort of common sense view, how the Earth orbits about the sun. You have the central sun, and you have the Earth going around. And you say the Earth stays in its orbit reasonably nicely, makes this a nice abode for life, simply because the forward momentum of the Earth is counteracted by the inward pull of the uh, gravitational force field of attraction of the sun, and everything's hunky-dory. But in, in the case of Einstein, the view was a little different, a little stranger, perhaps, but more relevant, more general. Now, one way you can make, I can make an analogy. I can't give you an example of four-dimensional space time. I just don't know how to work in four-dimensional space without using the math. I can't give you an example, so let me give you an analogy. An analogy is frame B, a rubber sheet. Just a rubber membrane. You can think of it as a trampoline, if you want, or a pool table where the felt's removed and it's a rubber, thin rubber sheet. And if you deposit a brick or a rock or some object that has mass on that rubber sheet, then there's going to be a dimple or an alteration in, in space-time. Uh, sorry, an alteration in the rubber sheet created by that brick. Well, it's the same sort of thing in space-time of Einstein's view. You have the equivalent of space-time being relatively flat in the absence of any mass. And that's OK. It's flat space. Euclid was right. The Greeks knew it all. But when there's a mass around, when there's a massive object, whether it be uh, a piece of rock, a planet, a star, a galaxy, a cluster of galaxies, or a cluster of cluster of galaxies all the way up to the hierarchy of matter, the space-time begins to warp. So I show a warp of space-time due to the sun here, and a warp of space-time, a smaller dimple here, of the Earth, because in fact the Earth has less mass and would alterate, would warp, or would curve, it, curve the nature of space-time to a lesser degree. Again, you can think of it as a pool table. You can think of the dimple existing in this table due to the fact that the rubber membrane is dipping, and then visualize billiard balls moving around in the vicinity. They would be accelerated, they would be warped, they would be curved as they pass in the vicinity of the massive object. And you can begin to characterize the nature of gravity, not in the way Newton did long ago up top, but in the way Einstein did here, by considering the way in which the Earth accelerates in the vicinity of the sun. Now let me give you a further example of this, as shown on the next slide. Here's three planets. The planet, planet at the left is Jupiter, the planet at the middle is uh, Earth, and the planet at the right is Mars. I've chosen these three planets because they have different mass. Jupiter is pretty big, much bigger than Earth, but Mars is kind of small, much smaller than Earth in mass. And consequently, we can visualize an advanced civilization on each of these planets and give the civilization the same technology and the same rocket ability and visualize then, or imagine, a rocket being launched from each of these objects with the same kick, with the same thrust. And then once the thrust has been given to the rocket, let the rocket glide freely and see what happens. Well, in the case of Jupiter, when you launch the rocket with a certain amount of energy, with a certain amount of thrust, the rocket, as shown, goes into an elliptical orbit about planet Jupiter. That's because the thrust of the rocket that I've chosen for this example just didn't have enough boost. It didn't have enough kick to escape from Jupiter. Why? Because Jupiter has too much mass. 
Newton would say that Jupiter is pulling on the rocket too much. Field created by the by by the uh, mass contained within Jupiter is just too much. It pulls the rocket back. Einstein would simply say that the rocket is responding to the space-time curvature created by the mass contained within Jupiter to the extent that the rocket cannot escape. But if you consider the Earth in the middle frame and give the rocket the same boost, identical boost, because the, ma the mass of the Earth is less, then the rocket can begin to escape. It can begin to escape because Newton would say the gravitational force field just isn't enough. But Einstein would say that the curvature of space-time in the vicinity of this smaller mass, the dimple, is less, and consequently the rocket can get out. Theoretically, mathematically, this parabolic case, according to the mathematics, suggests that the rocket will uh, reach infinity. But it will reach infinity with zero velocity. So it will reach infinity and stop. But that's, 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 that's semantics. It'll never reach infinity. Consequently, this is a case whereby the rocket continues to recede forever. Now, in the other case, there's another corollary can be distinguished for an even smaller uh, mass, such as, the, such as Mars, an identical kick of the rocket, because again, Mars has less a mass than the Earth or Jupiter. So the rocket will once again reach infinity, but the distinguished, distinguishing case is made here that the rocket, in this particular case, uh, would reach infinity, and it would reach it with a finite velocity and keep going. That simply means, again, that the rocket reaches infinity. And let me see the next slide, please. Here's test number one, OK? I'm back to the Hubble relationship. And I'm talking about the real world now, data, experimental, work. Here's the distance, uh, velocity plotted against distance. Because the distance of the objects plotted here is small, I'm talking about relatively recent times. If I look out into greater distances in space, I'm talking about more ancient times. Generally, the Hubble relationship is, as was shown previously, OK, linear continues along that solid line up to about 4 billion light years. There are some galaxies that hang around just beyond the galaxy horizon. Again, you can't use the quasars. They're too controversial. There are some galaxies out here that seem to suggest that there's an alteration, a deviation from that, from that solid line. And each of the omegas there are indicative of different types of universes. You see, when the whole thing popped off, it was just like an explosion some place in, in time, uh, some, loca some location in time, some event in time. And as with any explosion, the movement out at the very beginning will be very, very quick. And then it will sort of slow down. Well, if there's a lot of matter in the universe, the explosion occurs as a big push out. And then if there's a lot of matter in the universe, it will slow down quicker than if there's a lesser amount of matter in the universe. And consequently, looking out to great distances and back into great intervals of time, you can begin to determine whether you can measure experimentally the, 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 the suggestion that the universe must have been expanding at a quicker rate at earlier epochs, at more ancient times ago. It, it, making a long story short, because time runs slow here, or, uh, time runs quickly rather, uh, in fact, uh, the data seem to suggest, the experimental data of galaxies slightly beyond the galaxy horizon, that the universe is closed. It suggests that the universe will come back and end. Or will not end, maybe bounce. This test doesn't discriminate against an ending universe and a bouncing universe. But it does seem to suggest that the universe is closed. But the problem is that you have to utilize this test for galaxies that are out beyond the galaxy horizon. And it's just not easy to do that. Test number two is shown on the next slide. Here's a test of simply counting the galaxies. You take a big piece of real estate in the interstellar me inter intergalactic medium. You don't take like a cubic centimeter. You take a cube a few billion light years on the side. And you count the number of galaxies within. And you attribute to any galaxy a certain amount of mass, somewhat similar to our own. You count up the, num the amount of mass within that, within that cube. And you calculate the mass density of the universe. And you call that generally the mass density of the whole darn show. And that suggests that there's not enough matter in the universe to pull, ever pull it back. This test suggests that the universe is open, unfortunately in contradiction to the previous test. But the problem here is that you're counting only the matter in the galaxies. You're not counting any of the matter that might be in here, in the dark regions of space. Any of the matter that you can't see. The galaxies are visible objects. They emit light. 
but there might be other material out here in the dark regions of space that would emit radio, infrared, x-rays, gamma rays, ultraviolet radiation. To make another long story short, the point is that the x-ray orbiting satellites about the Earth now do suggest that there is matter within clusters of galaxies in the dark regions of space. To make this test reconcilable with the previous one, you need 10 times more matter in the dark regions of space as there is seen in the visible regions of space. But the X-ray satellites suggest, at least at present time preliminarily, that there's only double the amount of matter in the dark regions of space as there is in the galaxies. Not enough to close the universe. That's where we stand on our structure of the universe experimentally. And uh, we just don't know at the present time whether the universe be open or closed. Now let's proceed again to the next slide. And to note finally uh, for you with respect to considerations of the universe, that this is a machine, a radio telescope, the Sugar Scoop Antenna, at Homedale, New Jersey, the Bell Telephone Laboratory, that has been able to eavesdrop essentially on the most ancient parts of the universe. Simply by listening in the radio to uh, the relic of the, uh, of the most, uh, of the hottest, the most dense condition close to the origin of the universe. There's just a hiss everywhere. Using any radio telescope, there's some static left over after you've removed all of the known sources of radiation. There's something left over, and that's interpreted experimentally, again, as an indicator of what the universal conditions might have been in the first few minutes of the universe after the bang. But it doesn't tell us how to get any closer to the very origin of the universe itself, to time t equal to zero when the bang occurred. It looks as though the key to that might be consideration of the bizarre states of matter that exist within the universe, namely the black holes. So let me use the, bla the black holes now as an example of a bizarre region of space that might eventually not only tell us something strange about black holes, but also something about the origin of the universe itself. Next slide. Now I want to recapitulate in one, one and a half minutes or less this general scenario of, 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 of stellar evolution whereby you have generally within our own galaxy, for example, coming back close to home, an interstellar gas cloud. And over a period of time, that begins to contract to form a star, a very bright radiating star in red that eventually continues to contract down to something like our sun, frame three, having planets about it as well. It takes about 100 million years to do that. And then as the star begins to burn quiescently by nuclear fusion, it does so in the case of the sun for about 10 billion years. It's been doing so for about 5 billion years, we're pretty sure. So it's got another 5 billion years before it begins to literally run out of gas, shown on the next slide. Continue this type of thing, where the sun will begin to panic 5 billion years into the future and expand into a red giant, engulfing in the process some of the planets, probably Earth as well. It's 5 billion years downstream. Don't worry about it now. The point is here, the remnant of this, of this, of this red giant, in the case of a star like the sun, is this small object shown at the right, a white dwarf. It's a relatively small object, not too much bigger than the Earth. And it's a relatively dense matter because you're taking an entire star as it dies and pack it into a small region of space. And that means gravity is going to increase quite a bit because you're taking a lot of, a lot of mass and you're packing it into a small volume. Mass is one thing, but the other half of the law of gravity is that when the, the law of gravity specifies that the gravitational force field runs inversely as a square the square of the distance. And as you compress matter within such a thing as a white dwarf, then the separation between different parts of the star grows smaller. And consequently, the gravitational force field increases dramatically. The density on this guy, on a white dwarf, which are seen experimentally, about a million tons per cubic centimeter. A teaspoonful of that matter would weigh about a million tons. Now. That's one type of endpoint in a star, a star like our sun. Let me have the next slide. Here's a general scenario, which I don't want to get into in great detail, but to note for you that the endpoint in stellar evolution for a low mass star is the white dwarf, which just eventually peters away to a red dwarf and then a black dwarf, cold clinker in space. Very uninteresting. Higher mass stars can die, however, not as quiescently. They die more explosively. They can die if they have a reasonably high mass as a neutron star, which is even a more bizarre state of matter than the white dwarf. But if the mass be very, very large, 
when the star dies catastrophically by exploding, some of the material implodes to form the hole, which disappears. Next slide. Here's a comparison. At the top of a red giant, at the very top, compared to the sun near the arrow at the top there. Then in frame two, I bring down the sun and compare it on scale with the white dwarf, noting that the white dwarf in general is on the size of the planet compared to the sun. Then come down into frame three, where I have the white dwarf shown in comparison to the neutron star, which is smaller yet, about the size of a city, with densities of about a billion tons per cubic centimeter. And in comparison and to scale, the neutron star to the whole. Now the next slide shows a neutron star versus Manhattan Island. <laughs> That's about the size and scale. Okay? But that could never be done because the gravitational force field on a neutron star is so severe because you've got so much mass packed in such a small volume that the entire Earth, not only Manhattan Island, but the entire Earth would be pinned, collapsed and flattened against the neutron star like a postage stamp instantaneously. There aren't any neutron stars nearby. <laughs> Next slide. Now, this is an example of another Gedanken experiment, a thought experiment. An experiment that I'd like you to imagine that there's a three-dimensional vice that could exist in space, crazy enough, whereby you could insert the Earth three-dimensionally and start twisting the vice to compress the Earth. Okay? It's crazy, but think about it because I want to compress matter into a small region of space and I want to do it for something that's terrestrially familiar like the Earth. And I want to talk about escape velocity again in order to get to the black hole. I want to talk about the escape velocity noting on the planet Earth now that you need, NASA needs 11 kilometers per second to launch a rocket into orbit. It's about 10 times faster than a speeding bullet, which is the reason why when you shoot a gun, the bullet doesn't go into orbit. But indeed, as the object compresses, as the Earth compresses under this three-dimensional vice, the size of it grows smaller, the mass stays the same, the volume decreases, the escape velocity increases. If I decrease the size of the Earth by a factor of four, the escape velocity doubles. If I, increase the si if I decrease the size of the Earth by about a factor of a thousand, then I need about 700,000 kilometers per second to launch a rocket. And in the extreme case of the Gadanken experiment, whereby the Earth is compressed in such a crazy device to a size of a centimeter, the entire Earth compressed to a centimeter, then the velocity that you need to escape it 300,000 kilometers per second, and that's no ordinary velocity. That's the velocity of light. It implies that if you can compress the Earth to a size smaller than a centimeter, then in fact the velocity that you'd need to escape it would be greater than light velocity, and that's not possible, and consequently nothing could escape from such an object. Next slide. This is a comparison of the black hole uh, relative to Cambridge, relative to, uh, I show this in my class, relative to Harvard Square. So it will again give you a feeling for terrestrial familiarity with the size of a typical black hole. Not the black hole that would be created in the case of the Earth, because there's no such three-dimensional vice, fortunately. There's nothing out in space to compress the Earth like that. But there is something out in space that can compress stars, and that's just mass, that's just gravity. Big stars, when they die, can compress in and of their own accord to form a black hole. And the black hole generally would be in comparison, size and shape, to terrestrial familiarity. Next slide. Here's a case of three-dimensional curvature again on the surface of the rubber membrane to give you a feeling for why the black holes can wink out. Consider this crazy case. You have a ant, uh, family of ants, first considered by Kip Thorne at Caltech and generalized by Larry Smarr and Bill Press at Harvard. Uh, an ant family on the rubber membrane again all the ants converge to hold a reunion at the center of the rubber membrane, except one that stays back in bed, stick. Okay, then as the ants come together, they create more mass at a small location in space. The dimple on the rubber sheet grows. But the ants can continue to communicate by throwing back these rubber message balls along the trampoline, along the rubber sheet. And as the ants continue to converge on a given location, the message balls get back okay, but at a slower and slower rate. They still move out at the same velocity, but they arrive less frequently to the ant sick in bed back there. And as you proceed to the next two, next slide, the next two frames here show that as the ants continue to come together in this three-dimensional analogy to four-dimensional space-time, that the rubber membrane can essentially snap, fold over on itself, trap the ants within, and with it, their message balls, so that nothing can get back.
to the ant sicken bed. And from the point of view of the ant sicken bed, this thing disappears. That's an analogy. Let me show you the real world in the next slide. Oh, this isn't the real world yet. <laughs> <laughs> this is a case of a hypothetical rocket ship in the vicinity of the hole. Because I do want to point out two things. Namely, the black holes don't go around running through space sucking up matter. They don't even do that theoretically. They're not vacuum cleaners. Uh, it's a one-way turnstile, right. Matter ha that happens to fall into the hole is kept forever, but it doesn't go out of its way to, to trap matter. And in, in such, as, as a result, the spacecraft could come within a few thousand kilometers of a black hole, which generally now is very small for a typical star on the order of a less than the size of a city, a good city. And consequently, you can begin to perform experiments, at least hypothetically, in the vicinity of a black hole, provided you can identify such a black hole in the sky by launching a spacecraft and studying it relatively close by in a stable orbit. Can't do that yet, unfortunately, because we don't know of any unambiguous black holes nearby. Next slide. There's another way that you could possibly begin to uh, test a black hole. This isn't it, actually. This is just an examination of how matter being, uh, being trapped into the hole could be accelerated, could be, uh, could be heated. Because you see, the tidal force on the matter in the vicinity of the hole is so great, just before it falls below the hole, it becomes heated. And in the process of becoming heated, like any hot object, it radiates energy. So the black hole can become a prodigious emitter of radiation because of the matter falling beneath the hole just before it be moves below the event horizon and disappears. Come, become very prodigious emit emitters of radiation if there's a lot of matter falling within. Humans can't get anywhere near black holes, but presumably robot spacecraft might. We don't know of any black holes. We can't study them yet nearby. Here's another uh, next slide. Another way, oh, yeah, I don't know how that got in there. Next slide. <laughs> Here's another way to potentially detect a black hole, it would seem. If a black hole is a part of a binary star system, a two-star system, one of which stars is a big, big bright one, the other of which is a black hole. You might expect that you could see a black hole filtering across the front of it as a small dot, black dot. But heck, we can't even see, v we can hardly even see Venus. Venus is 12,000 kilometers across, transiting across the face of the sun. That's hard enough, let alone a small dot that's just a few kilometers transiting across a bright star. In fact, it's more complex than that. The nature of space-time in the vicinity of this black hole is so curved that the light trying to get around the black hole would be curved to the point of becoming indistinguishable here on Earth. You can't detect the black hole in that way. Next slide. Here's some other ways to potentially detect a black hole. You can hope to find a black hole, as is shown on the top, in the vicinity of another bright star, the bright star of which can be examined for a wobble. Some wobble that the star might have as the bright star that's visible to us would move about the black hole, which is invisible. And you can infer the existence of a black hole. Point two is that the matter falling below the hole, before it gets sucked down into the event horizon and disappears forever, could be heated and emit x-rays. Another point here is that region around the hole could be in, uh, in the vicinity of the hole could be heated to the extent to determine uh, to detect infrared and in particular radio radiation. That's another crazy case which is no longer tenable. Next slide. So these are various <coughs> possibilities whereby one could experimentally detect the existence of a black hole in order to study its structure. Here's a, here's a region on the sky, the real world now. This is a region the ancients called Cygnus. And there's a bright star. This is a negative, of course. So the bright star is shown as the big black dot there. That's the bright star. That's the one that's seen. Someplace in the error box, or someplace in the green box, is uh, as located by one of the MIT satellites, a suggested region whereby lots of x-rays are emitted from an object that's orbiting about, but unseen, this, ob this bright star here. The orbital velocity is known. The x-rays are measured. And lots about this binary star system can be studied despite the fact that you cannot see visually the object that's orbiting about that star there. Here's another slide. The latest uh, satellite that has been launched into orbit, the HEO-B spacecraft, which the Harvard observers have nicknamed the Einstein Observatory because it was just launched recently. This spacecraft is now orbiting above the surface of the Earth. The results have not been released, but I do have one slide, the next slide which has come down to Earth in the vicinity of the region that I just showed you, Cygnus. This is a reasonably good uh, spatial resolution 
image of invisible x-rays. The x-rays come down, they're converted to radio waves in the spacecraft. The radio waves are filtered on the ground onto a tele and converted to electronic images from which I've taken this uh, photograph. This is reasonably good evidence for x-rays falling into a region of uh, darkness for which there can be no object seen. It seems to suggest a small black hole, a bit ambiguous, but a small black hole. Next slide. There's an artist's conception of what the black hole might look like in the vicinity of the bright star. The bright star is evolving. Some of the matter is being gravitationally attracted by the hole, goes into a whirlpool on this small scale, moves down below the event horizon just before it does, it gives off x-rays. But you know, a certain amount of artist conception, artist license is required here because you can't see the hole. Next slide. Here's a better way, I think, to detect. Could you move this up a little bit? There's a guy down here. This is a better way to detect uh, black holes, big black holes, by examining the infrared, in particular the radio radiation, as we've been doing at Harvard in the radio astronomy group, trying to utilize a telescope this big relative to this man here, very small man, very big piece of machinery, in order to listen to regions that cannot be seen, listen to darkness. And in particular, we've been listening in the past year to regions in the vicinity of the nucleus of our own galaxy. We've been listening at Harvard to radio waves, and the Berkeley group, Professor Towns and Associates, have been essentially detecting infrared radiation from the vicinity of the nucleus of our own galaxy. And the results, uh, our results in the radio, are actually being published today in the Astrophysical Journal using this telescope, which suggests one way of doing this, one trick that can be used that Einstein recognized early on, was that you can take three space that we live in and collapse one of the, one of the uh, dimensions of space just compress one dimension of space into a plane. And then that plane, you're restricted. If you live in that plane, you take our bodies and squash us down, you're restricted to the plane, you can look back and forth, you can look side to side, but you can't look up and down. Why? Because up and down in this analogy becomes time. And the consideration of this plane can move through time. But then you've got to warp the plane. If there's a mass in the vicinity of this flat space, this flat three-dimensional analogy of four-dimensional space, you've got to warp it, as Einstein suggested, if there be a mass in the vicinity. And in the special case of extreme warping, extreme curvature, the solution would look like this here, where I've compressed, again, all of space into a plane and then warped everything. So everything, all matter, all planets, all people, all galaxies, exist two-dimensionally on the surface of this sphere not inside the sphere, on the surface of the sphere. There's nothing inside the sphere in this particular model of the universe, which was, in fact, Einstein's first model. His first solutions of the universe suggested that the whole darn show was curved and warped in this way, or can be visualized in this way from the mathematics, provided that, again, matter is superposed only on the surface of the sphere. Now again, the axis of such a model, the axis of a sphere here in this case, is time. <coughs> Einstein didn't know it when he first utilized the mathematics uh, that the universe was expanding. Hubble hadn't done his thing, hadn't discovered that the galaxies were receding yet. After all, Hubble had done his thing in 1920s, Einstein in 1915. Actually, the Einstein field equations predicted that the universe ought to be expanding. But even Einstein thought this was crazy. There's something left over from Aristotle that said that things had to be more or less static and unchanging. And Einstein inserted into his equations a fudge factor to keep the universe from expanding. He later took it out and everything was nice. But he said that this was the biggest blunder he ever made. But the point is, there are a number of interesting points that you can be made about the geometry of space-time distributed on the surface of a sphere like this. In particular, it doesn't matter in which galaxy you reside, whether it be this one here, well, this one there, you see generally the same type of picture. You see generally that there's no center. There's no center to the universe anywhere on the surface of the sphere. It doesn't matter where you exist on the sphere, you would generally see the same picture in the universe. And if you relax the, the, the mistake that Einstein made and recognize now that in an expanding universe, this type of model is going to blow up like a balloon because the balloon will move along the axis of time. As time proceeds, the universe expands. The surface area of this sphere becomes larger. But the point is, it's a sphere. And just like we live on the surface of a sphere, on the surface of the Earth, there's no center. 
there's a center deep down inside the Earth, but on the surface of the sphere, there's no center. You could walk around the Earth or navigate in some way around the Earth and come back to the point where you started. Similarly, you could navigate throughout the universe, if this be a correct character of the uni universe, and you could, in fact, navigate all the way around the universe and come back to where you started from without reaching a boundary, without falling off an edge. Okay, so this is Einstein's curveball. There's no boundary, there's no edge, and there's no center. There's no center anywhere in the universe in space. You can't point to any location in space and say, that's where it all began. You can visualize by mathematically reversing the expansion of the universe, collapsing it down to a point where it all began, namely taking this balloon, collapsing it down to the point deep down inside there. That's a center. That's a center of time, however. Okay? That's not the center of space. That's the center in time. And in fact, by examining the rate at which the universe is expanding now, mentally reversing the expansion to, to, to imagine a contraction, you can ask how much time would it have taken from a small point of singularity at the origin of time deep down inside there to reach the state at which we now reside with a much larger universe curved in this way. The answer is about 18 billion years. It's taken about 18 billion years for the universe to do its thing in accord with what we observe now. So the origin of time, as best we can tell, occurred at a finite time ago, 18 billion years ago. Next slide is an examination of uh, the balloon, or this curved space-time, with again all of space and all of matter and all of radiation and all of people and everything being compressed onto the surface of the sphere and noting once again that it doesn't matter, even in an expanding universe, which galaxy you inhabit, you would see the universe expanding from the point of view of any galaxy. Just imagine that you're at any one of these galaxies and then follow that same galaxy from frame 8E, you'll see that in fact all the other galaxies around it seem to expand, seem to recede, seem to uh, be consistent with an expanding universe. And consequently, if space-time be curved in this way, as Einstein suggested, then there is no center in the universe and everybody would derive the Hubble law or the Hubble relation as we derive it here. Nobody is at a preferred position in space. The preferred position in time is the origin of the universe. Now let's try the next slide. Here's the big picture, would you believe? I told you we were going to consider it. Here I have the audacity to plot size of the universe as a function of cosmic time, would you believe? Here's the origin of the universe, 18-ish billion years ago. Here's the present. So this interval in time is 18 billion years. And the question is naturally, what's going to happen to the future? How is the universe going to continue to evolve? Setting aside for the moment considerations of this very interesting point here when it all began. We can ask, how will the universe proceed into the future? What is the destiny of the universe in large, over large intervals of cosmic time? I can show you the first case in the next slide. Here's a case of a universe that continually recedes forever, that just moves toward infinity. Why? Because there's not enough matter contained within the universe to ever pull the universe back, to ever stop it. It's the case, the hyperbolic or parabolic case, similar to Mars or the Earth in the case of the rocket, where there just wasn't enough mass in the case of Mars or the, or the Earth to pull the rocket back. In this case, the big picture, the universe just expands and expands and expands. There's just not enough stuff in the universe to ever pull it back. It might slow it down. That's why that curve is curved, but it doesn't ever halt it. That's an interesting universe. Everybody dies a cold death at some time in the future, but that future is a long time into the future. Now the other case that, that uh, coincides with that, shown in the next slide, it's the uh, closed universe. The case in that analogy form of the rocket in the vicinity of Jupiter, where there was enough mass to pull the rocket back, to keep the rocket uh, from escaping to infinity. In this case, when you consider the big picture again, you have the universe that's expanding up to about 18 billion years, billion -ish years continues to expand into the future, but then at some time in the future, not clear when, not clear if this is the model of the universe, sometime in the future, if this model would be correct, the universe would stop expanding. And in fact, it would just uh, halt and then begin slowly to contract. And all astronomers everywhere in any galaxy would announce that the red shifts have stopped, that everything's blue shifted now. But everybody would see the same picture because nobody is a preferred position in the universe. There is no preferred or central location in the universe. Everybody more or less 
according to the cosmological principle, sees the same sort of thing. If this be the model of the universe, the universe eventually dies, a heat death. Everything comes back down, crunching into one another, galaxy upon galaxy, planet, planet upon planet, everything heats up, the temperature, the density grow enormously large, similar to this, this point of singularity from which the universe began. It's a mirror image, if that be the proper case in the universe. Now, it's not clear from the mathematics at the present time if, in fact, the universe will just simply end there or it will bounce. A bouncing or oscillating universe is shown on the next slide. An oscillating universe is one where there is no beginning and there is no end. It just always was and always will be, but it's of the still Big Bang cosmology where there is a bang, it expands the universe, it stops, it contracts, it doesn't end, it bounces and has been bouncing all the time over an enormously large intervals of time so that again you can avoid, at least philosophically, the need to talk about the very beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, the unique point in space and time before which there might be problems. In this case, there is no before which. It just always was. It's a neat type of, 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 of example whereby the philosophy uh, of the Big Bang cosmology can be uh, more or less alleviated. But in, in, in particular, I note there's no evidence, no experimental evidence that this is correct. What I would like to do is examine experimentally which of these universes we live in. Is it a closed type of universe that will come back and end in a heat death? Or is it an open type of universe that will just keep I don't get too technical, but as is shown on the next slide, there's this dramatic increase in rotational velocity at the nucleus, at the very heart of our own galaxy. I'm simply plotting here rotational velocity vertically as a function of distance. Here's the galactic center, the very nucleus of our own galaxy as a function of distance out. The sun is over there, five blocks someplace. And theory suggests, as is shown on the, on the, on the, on the solid line, that the spin of the galaxy inside should continue to decrease toward the galactic center. But the data from our group, Harvard, as well as the Berkeley group in the infrared, suggesting, the data are shown by the cross lines, suggesting that the, the rotation in the interior of the galaxy increases dramatically. And the dashed line that we have modeled and that we are publishing today is consistent with the normal spread of matter in the galaxy plus a point mass of five million solar masses. That is to say, we're proposing that at the very heart of our galaxy, there's a point source, probably no bigger than about a solar system, though we can't tell yet for sure, because we're only listening and we're essentially groping radio and infrared radiation, a, an object that's reasonably compact containing five million times the mass of our sun, and that's a very big amount of mass. There's only one thing that that can be according to the current theories of stellar evolution, and that's a black hole. The model for this is sketched in the next slide, which is the penultimate slide. Here again is we're seeing not the black hole itself, I claim, at the center of the galaxy, but the whirlpool of ma matter in the vicinity of the hole at the center of our galaxy, as is the Berkeley group in the infrared seeing the whirlpool of matter as it swirls around. If the black hole were not present there, with the tremendous swirling motions circularly, the stuff should just fling out into the galaxy. In order to hold this matter at the center of the galaxy, in order to hold it there while it's rotating extremely fast, you need a large amount of mass to pull it in, to hold it there. And that's the inference, the indirect suggestion that there's a black hole at the center of the galaxy, the center of our own galaxy. Now others have suggested within the year at Caltech, as is shown in the last slide, that there is also a black hole of very large amount in the vicinity of this active galaxy called Virgo, M87. Thousand times more mass deposited in that suggested black hole than in the vicinity of our own Milky Way. It seems that these suggestions now in the radio that we're picking up, Harvard, the infrared at Berkeley, the optical observations of other galaxies at Caltech are, are correct, that indeed all objects, especially if our own galaxy be dominated by black holes, all galaxies in the universe probably are dominated, at least at their hearts, at their centers, by a supermassive black hole, which can be, again, a prodigious emitter of radiation. And if you extend this analysis, this thought process, although it has not been experimentally confirmed, you could conceivably begin to explain the quasars, as the theorists have suggested, for some years now, 
by allowing the black hole of fantastic amount, gargantuan quantities, to exist in the vicinity of the quasar and thus give off incredible amounts of radiation were heretofore previously not understood. Now, as I show the final slide, I just want to note for you again that we're on the cutting edge. I could probably tell you within a month, if this conference were uh, a month later, in April or May, I could tell you almost definitively whether there's really good evidence for a black hole at the center of our galaxy. But we really are at the cutting edge, and the cutting edge is not an edge, it's fuzzy. It's always fuzzy for those of us who are lucky to work at the front, lucky enough to work at the front, trying to distinguish between what's known and what's not known. It's just not clear at the present time whether we can claim unambiguously the existence of a black hole. Some suggest it's irrelevant anyway because you can't understand what's happening deep down inside the hole. Others suggest that we've got to understand the black hole. We've got to understand it theoretically and experimentally because if we don't, we might begin to worship it. Our culture, if you believe, <laughs> our, culture, our culture has always, in many cases, throughout history, worshiped the unknowable. We still do so now to a certain extent. But at any rate, the point I want to leave you with is that it seems to me most interesting to study the black hole experimentally to see if they exist, theoretically to determine their properties deep down inside, because it's the black hole that more than any other object in the universe seems to mimic the conditions that would have existed early on at the very origin of all things, at the very beginning of the universe. Thanks for coming. No, the thing is, we're not talking about anything being 80 billion light years away. I showed you plots up to 4 billion light years, and then I told you it was difficult to go beyond 4 billion. I'm sorry. We, we can press our experiments by examining galaxies up to 6 billion, and the quasars are tied someplace between 10 inch and 15 inch. Where was Virgo? Was that not 80 billion? Virgo is 70 million. would say that he's not detected gravity waves. However, it is interesting that his initial claim made at the early 70s, physical review, was toward the nucleus of our own galaxy. But I think there's better evidence within the past few months, uh, yet unpublished as well from the University of Massachusetts radio astronomy group, that a binary pulsar 
a, a binary star system with a pulsar contained within is in fact emitting gravity waves. That's a much better case for the existence of gravity waves than Weber. I think Weber's claim is coincidental, but it is nonetheless interesting, and I made it at the end of the other night as well. Yeah. Yes? Considering the inverse square relationship of uh, the gravity has, how is it that with the universe supposedly expanding, it is ultimately going to be pulled back in? No. Considering it's going to be less dense as it expands. Oh, it's going to be less dense, sure. It's just that in fact, uh, gravity extends to infinity. One over us, one over the, inversely is the square of the distance. One over r square mean, doesn't mean that gravity ever stops pulling. It pulls a lesser and lesser extent, but it extends to infinity. Yes. We, the, the gravitational pull from our bodies extends literally to infinity. So we are pulling on all these galaxies. You are and I am. And it's a matter of whether there's enough mass to pull in a collective way. Yeah, but the point is yeah. less and less yeah. as it expands. It's not density, it's mass. It's not a function of the amount of density in the universe, despite the fact that it grows less and less. There is a function. Yes. There is a reduced amount yes. of density. Fraction. Of density, sure. As the universe expands. Sure, I agree. It reduces with time. So the question is, will it reduce to a negligible amount before, in fact, the universe stops? If it doesn't, it just keeps going. If it does, it'll stop. It's simply a question of mass. Not a density, but I understand your point. Yeah, if the question, huh? question of mass and not density, uh, then no difference in the amount of, uh, uh, of power needed to, uh, for escape velocity from the Earth, even though the Earth is continually. It's the fact that you're compressing the mass into a smaller volume. Density. Well, I think that's the wrong way to put it. I think the way to put it is that, in fact, you're compressing a certain amount of mass, a given amount of mass, into a smaller region, such that not only do we have a large amount of mass, which is half the law of gravity, but that that mass is distributed over a smaller region of space, one of our squared term, such that different parts of that massive object are pulling to a much larger extent due to the fact that a large amount of mass, and only mass, is distributed in a more compact region. See, we've arrived at the inverse of our original. <laughs> Dr. Chasen, I hate to stop sure. this, but for two reasons. One, we do have some refreshments outside, and the other is that I'd like to leave some, some things for our next three speakers. We're going to be talking about some things along this line. So let's take a break, and I uh, hope we'll see you back here. Pretty soon. person is a native of Memphis. Graduated from White Station High School, attended Princeton University, and received his PhD there, and now teaches at Harvard University. Uh, I would also like to recognize uh, some people in the audience that will be important. Uh, Professor Lightman's mother and father and his wife are here, and I'd like to get them to stand up just briefly so that you can recognize the people who are the cause of this. Now his wife is also standing, and uh, because she's not the cause of him being here in uh, the physical sense, she's, I'm sure, supportive of his being here. Uh, I'd like to now turn the program over to Professor Alan Lightman. Is this, uh, this is on? Do I put this on here? Yes. Do I need to be near the microphone to talk? Or? Perhaps. I think the acoustics are good enough. Okay. How does gravity couple to matter and other forces of nature? This is a question that I will keep returning to in my talk. We know, for example, that gravity interacts with electromagnetism because we see that light from distant stars is deflected by the gravitational field of the sun. But what is the precise nature of this interaction of gravity with electromagnetism? Or what is the nature of the interaction of gravity with nuclear forces? 
a precise description, a mathematical description, of how gravity interacts with the other laws of physics, how it meshes with the rest of physics, is one of the central challenges to any theory of gravity. Now, an important clue to the secrets of gravity is that objects, different objects made of all different kinds of substances, fall in a gravitational field with exactly the same acceleration. This is known as the weak equivalence principle. Now, other speakers have talked about other equi equivalence principles, and usually they just say equivalence principles. And I'm going to try to draw a distinction between different kinds of equivalence principles. So this experimental fact, the different objects fall all in this with the same acceleration in a gravitational field is called the weak equivalence principle. And it was first stated by Galileo in 1592, who reportedly dropped objects of different types off the Leaning Tower of Pizza and observed that they hit the ground at the same time. And I have enough extension here. I can perform a little experiment myself of the weak equivalence principle. Here I have a, a piece of chalk and an eraser. Now I'm going to let go of them at the same time. And, uh, well, I won't be using that chalk. Right. So they hit the ground at the same time. And this fairly innocuous experiment here really reflects something quite profound about gravity. And I'll try to explain that as we go on. Well, I'm not a very good experimentalist, and I was only to, able to demonstrate this experimental result sort of roughly. But in recent times, it has been demonstrated with very high precision, first by the Hungarian physicist in 1922, Laurent von Utbusch. I hope there aren't any Hungarians in the audience. Then by uh, Dickey, Robert Dickey, the American physicist in 1964, and then in 1971 by the Russian physicist Vladimir Braginsky. And the most accurate test of the weak equivalence principle is that by Vladimir Braginsky, who showed the little ball of aluminum and a little ball of platinum have the same acceleration in a gravitational field to a part in, to better than a part in 10 to the 12. That means their difference of acceleration is a, a decimal point with 12 zeros after it and then a one. So that's a very high experimental test or justification of the weak equivalence principle. Einstein himself was quite impressed by the simplicity of the weak equivalence principle. In fact, so impressed that he formulated a much stronger version called the strong equivalence principle. And this is what other people have just been refer referring to as the equivalence principle. And the strong equivalence principle states that in a freely falling frame, falling freely with a gravitational field, that all of the laws of physics locally appear the same as if gravity were completely absent. And this is sometimes recounted in the elevator experiment, and I'll have pictures of elevators in a moment, in which Einstein postulated that an observer in an elevator falling freely, an elevator with its cable cut falling freely, doing local experiments would not be able to tell that he was in a gravitational field at all. Of course, when he hits the ground, that's another matter. And could I have the next slide, please? for the first slide, and maybe the lights. It's uh, hard to resist showing a picture of Einstein at an Einstein centennial. Here is a picture of Einstein at the age of five, and perhaps he was already beginning to think about equivalence principles. <laughs> maybe he's dropping little rubber ducks and and toys off his bed and, and saw that they hit the ground at the same time. Now, it is important to emphasize that the weak equivalence principle is experimentally proven, as I stated, but the strong equivalence principle is much too general to ever be completely tested by experiment. The weak equivalence principle is merely a statement of known experimental results, like the, the Leaning Tower of Pizza experiment. Whereas the strong equivalence principle is a sweeping conceptual statement originating from pure thought, really a perfect example of the creative vision of Einstein. Einstein's formulation of the strong equivalence principle was the cornerstone 
of his theory of gravity in 1915, General Relativity. Now, unfortunately, there are many other modern theories of gravity besides general relativity. And each of these different theories has a different answer to our original question. How does gravity affect matter? Today we recognize that general relativity is the simplest member of a class of theories called geometrical theories. And technically, they're called metric theories, but I'll just call them geometrical theories. And in a geometrical theory of gravity, the complete effect of gravity can be interpreted as altering the geometrical structure of space and time. Now, I would like to now show you that any theory of gravity which incorporates the strong equivalence principle, as Einstein's theory of general relativity did, is automatically a geometrical theory of gravity. Could I have the next slide, please? And here I want to return to the statement of the strong equivalence principle. And I've, again, got the elevators, or little laboratories. These are kind of like uh, Professor Chazon's elevators falling towards the Earth, except that here my people in the elevators are not just standing there. They're doing things. And they're performing experiments. And like throwing up balls or shining flashlights and recording trajectories of these balls and the rays of light from their flashlights. That is, they're doing mechanical and electromagnetic experiments and maybe nuclear experiments if they had the opportunity. And according to the strong equivalence principle, in these freely falling elevators falling towards the Earth, the trajectories should be just straight lines locally. That is, there are no forces acting in these freely falling frames as the strong equivalence principle requires. So that what we have is trajectories in these little elevators or laboratories that are independent of the type of experiment that is being done. They're determined only by the direction of motion of the elevator at that point. And in turn, the direction of motion of the elevator is determined by the strength and magnitude of gravity at that point. That is, there's something intrinsic about the gravitational field at, at the position of the, each elevator which determines the shape of these trajectories. Now, when we connect the trajectories up on the large scale so that we would consider, extend one of these lines of the balls or the light beam from one elevator to the next, and you see the elevators are falling in different directions because they're each falling radially towards the Earth. When we connect up these trajectories on a large scale, we get curves. These curves represent an intrinsic property of the gravitational field around the Earth, because they have nothing to do with the type of experiment, just with the direction and magnitude of gravity at that point. And so, since we have these universal curves that represent something intrinsic about the space around the Earth, that, that is, these curves are representing the geometry of the space around the Earth. And if I have the next slide, please. This is sort of a schematic illustration of this geometrical effect that I was speaking about. Here's a representation of the way that any massive gravitating body, like the Earth or the Sun, which is represented by that shaded region there, bends space around it. And you can see that there's a curved surface there bending around the central gravitating body. And if any particle went by, like a planet or a mouse or a light beam on that surface and got near the gravitating body, it would have a curved path. For example, if I compute the ratio of circumference to the radius of a circle, I get something that's smaller than 2 pi. Now, for our purposes and in terms of our original question, the important fact is that all geometrical theories of gravity, and as I've shown you, these are theories which have the strong equivalence principle in them, have exactly the same answer to our original question, how does gravity affect matter? They all have exactly the same equation mathematically for how gravity affects matter. 
And this is more or less a, a cut and dried issue. If a theory of gravity has this particular equation, which I'm not going to show you, this particular equation, then it has this geometrical property that gravity can be interpreted as a geometrical phenomenon. If it doesn't have this particular equation, then it's not a geometrical theory of gravity. So if we had only geometrical theories of gravity in the world, like Einstein's theory, then we would be home free. We would have an answer, a mathematically well-posed answer to our original question of how does ma gravity affect matter. It just curves space in a certain way, as is shown here. Unfortunately, there are a lot of other gravitation theories than the geometrical theories. Theories which do not obey the strong equivalence principle of Einstein, theories which are not geometrical in nature, and theories which have widely different predictions of the way that gravity affects matter. Also, unfortunately, these non-geometrical theories typically are more difficult to treat mathematically than the geometrical theories, although it could always be true that nature is so perverse as to favor a non-geometrical theory of gravity. Now, we physicists think that we have some idea about what is simple in nature, and occasionally we use aesthetic criteria in deciding which theory we would like to be true, but when it comes down to it, it's just a matter of experimental testing. So we have to see what type of theory nature actually prefers. Wading through this combined class of both geometrical and non-geometrical theories is really a very difficult task. In 1960, the American physicist Leonard Schiff made the outstanding and really bold conjecture that this, the weak equivalence principle implies the strong equivalence principle. Now, just think about what this means. Since we know that the weak equivalence principle has been experimentally proven to very enormous accuracy, as I indicated before, then if this conjecture is true, then it means that essentially all non-geometrical theories of gravity can be ruled out if the weak equivalence principle implies the strong equivalence principle. And that means not only that a large class of theories, theories which compete with Einstein's theory and theories which we have to consider in finding the right laws of gravity, not only for these, can these theories be ruled out, but we have an experimental justification of Einstein's original conjecture or belief that gravity must be a geometrical phenomenon. It's easy to see that the reverse of Schiff's conjecture is true, that is, that the strong equivalence principle implies the weak equivalence principle. Because one of the laws of physics, remember the strong equivalence principle says something about all the laws of physics. It says that in a freely falling frame, all the laws of physics behave as if gravity were not present. It's easy to understand how that implies the weak equivalence principle, because you can just let yourself fall from the roof with two balls beside you. The three of you are falling down towards the ground. And in your reference frame, since there are no forces, you don't see any forces acting on these balls, they just stay at rest. So all three of you hit the ground at the same time and therefore satisfy the weak equivalence principle. So it's easy to see that the strong equivalence principle implies the weak equivalence principle. However, the reverse seems preposterous. How can you get information about all the laws of physics from just knowing one of the laws of physics, that objects that don't have external forces acting on them have unaccelerated trajectories? Well, let's think about this a little bit and see whether this conjecture is as crazy as it seems. We have to remember that the test bodies that were used to verify the weak equivalence principle, the platinum balls and the aluminum balls that Vladimir Boginsky used, are not just point particles. They're collections of atoms. And each one of these atoms, we take one of these atoms out of this collection and look at it. We look at this atom. And we don't just see point particles. We see protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom that are interacting by, by nuclear forces. And we see electrons that are going around the nucleus that are bound to the nucleus by electrical and electromagnetic forces. 
So this atom here is really a, a complicated mixture of point particles, nuclear forces, and electromagnetic forces. Now, if the strong equivalence principle were not true, that is, if there were no uh, frame of reference in which the interaction of gravity with these other forces vanished, then each atom would have a force, a gravitational force acting on it, which depended upon how much interaction there was between gravity and how much electromagnetism it has, how much nuclear energy it has. That is, there would be a gravitational force acting on it which depended upon these other interactions because they're not, they don't vanish in any reference frame. And so if you take one little body, one little group of atoms composed mostly of rest mass, another group of atoms composed mostly of nuclear energy, and maybe a third group of atoms composed mo mostly of electromagnetic energy, then it's difficult to imagine how the, inter the different interactions of gravity with each of these different other types of forces would be such that all of these different bodies would fall in a gravitational field with the same acceleration. So maybe the weak equivalence principle really is telling us something about the interactions of gravity <coughs> with other forces. However, what I've said so far is just sort of plausibility arguments. I haven't really given you any detailed proof, and in fact, there have been very few detailed proofs of shift conjecture to show whether it's either valid or invalid. A few years ago, David Lee and I, who at that time were graduate students at Caltech, decided to attempt a proof of shift's conjecture. Uh, and uh, it must have been exhaustive because uh, David Lee then went into economics as soon as he got his PhD. <laughs> but anyway, we decided to restrict ourselves to point particles, electromagnetism, and gravity, and consider test bodies made of just these types of interactions. So this would be a restricted proof of Schiff's conjecture if we could be successful. And the next slide is a schematic representation of the type of proof that we attempted. The trick, or the main idea rather, of the proof was to first construct a super theory of gravity. And the super theory of gravity, we left certain pieces of it unspecified. And mathematically, we left some arbitrary functions in the super theory. And for particular values of these unspecified pieces, the super theory would become a geometrical theory, like Einstein's. But for all other values of the pieces, which were most values, the theory would be a non-geometrical theory. So the super theory really contains both geometrical theories and non Now, from the super theory, we can calculate the equations for the interaction of gravity with point particles and the equations for the interaction of gravity with electromagnetism. And by putting all these equations together, we can calculate in the super theory the acceleration of a little atom that has particles moving around that are interacting electromagnetically with themselves and also interacting gravitationally in an external gravitational field. Now, this acceleration that we calculate for the center of mass of a test body is not completely specified because it has some S unspecified pieces from the original super theory. And the, the trick is to leave some pieces unspecified for as long as possible. And this is kind of like building a sculpture where some of the pieces of the sculpture, sculpture are still soft because they haven't ba been baked yet in a final shape. So we have this acceleration for the center of mass of, a, of an abstract test body and it's written there in the middle equation. And schematically, that acceleration has two contributions to it. It first has a contribution, that g there, which has nothing to do with the nature of the body under consideration, completely independent of the internal composition of the body. Then it has a second piece, which is the product of an f and another term. The f represents combinations of unspecified pieces in the original super theory. And the next term is the electromagnetic energy of the body divided by its total mass energy. 
Now, this second term, the electromagnetic energy of the body divided, divided by its total mass energy, varies from one body to the next. For example, for platinum, which is a very heavy atom, the electrons are very close to the nucleus, and therefore there's a lot of electromagnetic energy tied up in that atom. And, and for example, for platinum, that ratio of electromagnetic energy to total mass energy is four tenths of one percent. Whereas for aluminum, which is another test body used to prove the weak equivalence principle, that ratio is only a tenth of a percent because aluminum is much lighter, so the electrons are further away from the nucleus. So that as long as that second term to the acceleration there is present, aluminum and platinum will fall with a different acceleration in a gravitational field because they have different amounts of electromagnetic energy to total mass energy. So what, what do we have to do to enforce the weak equivalence principle, which says that all test bodies have to fall in a gravitational field with exactly the same acceleration independent of their internal composition? Since experimental tests and the weak equivalence principle in particular are really the practical business end of science, I've represented them by the meat grinder here. So we have to run this equation with unspecified pieces through the meat grinder of the weak equivalence principle. And the meat grinder tells us that there's only one way that this formula can show that the acceleration is independent of, test, of the type of test body under consideration, that that F there has to be zero. Because if F is zero, then that second term, which varies from one body to the other, drops out. And we only get an acceleration which is the same for aluminum and platinum. Now, if you track back what F equals zero means, remember F is a combination of the unspecified pieces of the original super theory. If you track back what that implies, that imply can only be zero if the original unspecified pieces in the super theory have exactly the values that make it a geometrical theory of gravity. Thus, Schiff's conjecture is proved. Now, although our proof has been restricted somewhat by considering only electromagnetic interactions, point particles, and gravity, it is still strong enough to rule out all non-geometrical theories in the literature which were available to us at that time. There were several theories, non-geometrical theories of gravity that had been invented between 1957 and 1970. For example, theories of Nida, Capella, Belenfante, Swihart, all very ugly mathematical theories. And even some of their authors, I talked to them, were dying to have them ruled out. <laughs> all of these theories had been in perfect agreement with all tests of gravity before enforcing the weak equivalence principle. And these theories, when you plug into this formula for how much acceleration they should predict for platinum and aluminum, they predict differences of a part in 10 to the 10, which is much more than is a permitted by the weak equivalence principle, the test of the weak equivalence principle, which is a part in 10 to the 12. So in conclusion, it seems that nature, after all, does prefer the beauty and simplicity of a geometrical description of gravity, as did Albert Einstein 65 years ago. Thank you. I mean, uh, covariant divergence of the stress energy tensor is equal to zero. That, that's the mathematical uh, statement of it. Physically, it's that in freely falling frames, uh, all the locally, the laws of physics appear to, or the laws of special relativity, locally. Right. Thank you.
Our next speaker is also a native state and then subsequently worked at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Caltech and is now a professor of physics at Clemson University. Uh, professor Burke. That screen up. Yes, I have it. Thank you. <clears throat> well, um, it's been rumored uh, that uh, mass has something to do with the fate of the universe. And <clears throat> so today, what I would like to do is tell you uh, how to make mass, uh, and then uh, perhaps uh, some of the other uh, rather doleful predictions of, uh, of uh, some of the classical or non-microscopic theories of uh, general relativity uh, will be fulfilled eventually. Uh, the problem that I will discuss is one which is really not new by any means. Uh, <clears throat> in fact, was uh, discussed a long time ago by Newton. Uh, is that visible now? Back in the back? Yes. Uh, Newton talked about an experiment <clears throat> in which he took a bucket and put water in it and rotated uh, the bucket. And as you all know, what happens eventually is that the water in the bucket uh, assumes a, uh, the form of a, a paraboloid of revolution. Uh, there's a, a, a dip in the center. Now, <clears throat> the reason that this question is interesting uh, and has to do with mass is the following. Uh, about 100 years or so ago, um, a physicist named Mach uh, discussed this same question. And <clears throat> what he did was, he said, I would like to do away with the idea of talking about this question in the context of absolute space. And instead, what I would like to do is talk about the motion of this bucket and the water in it. Uh, in uh, relation to the distant stars. They're the massive objects in the universe. They're the things that I will use to, uh, to uh, orient myself. And <clears throat> in particular, uh, what he wanted to do was suggest that it made no difference if you rotate the bucket and let the water pick up the motion in the bucket and move around, or if you rotate all of the fixed stars and let uh, the bucket stand still. His conclusion was that uh, there would be no way of distinguishing uh, the two experiments. That is to say, all of the matter in the universe, uh, millions and billions of light years away, has some effect on the water that you put in this bucket. And the way <coughs> that it uh, affects it can be inferred, if not, I wouldn't say that, uh, that uh, his discussion necessarily implied it, but we might infer that mass is something which originates uh, because there are interactions, there are forces between objects. And perhaps we can make mass without mass just by starting with forces. And that's what I will tell you about uh, today, <coughs> how to go about doing uh, this kind of construction. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, the way that I will talk about it uh, is in the context of quantum theory. And uh, perhaps uh, you're familiar, uh, at least with some of the ideas of quantum theory. It's a microscopic theory. That is, it's a theory of matter at the other end of the scale uh, than was uh, discussed earlier today, a distant scale, very small systems. Uh, <coughs> and. Uh, the reason that we talk about things in terms of quantum theory is because, uh, as you know, physics is an experimental science. It's something that <clears throat> uh, we don't sit on a rock and uh, make speculations about the universe and then demand that they be true. Instead, what happens is uh, we sit on a rock and make speculations about the universe and hope that the experimental physicist uh, will eventually um, verify the theories that we've made. So. <clears throat> Uh, quantum theory is something that was developed because the physics in the microscopic world could not be described, described excuse me, in terms uh, of classical ideas. And a quantum theory or the quantum theory of the universe, uh, <clears throat> whatever 
final form it takes uh, will contain two rather interesting and important uh, pieces of information if it's to be a quantum theory. The first is that <coughs> there is uh, a kind of, of uncertainty that exists between uh, the, the uh, variables that describe the system, uh, a complementarity, if you wish, as Bohr called it. Uh, <coughs> and the second is that physical systems are described by, uh, uh, or satisfy rather, a, um, what is called a superposition principle. If you have a system in one state and a system uh, uh, in a, a second state, then uh, it's possible to consider a system which in a certain sense is a superposition of these two states. So <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, quantum theory and specifically uh, quantum field theory. And <clears throat> I will write down one equation, which I hope will not drive anyone away. <clears throat> and then I will tell you about uh, the solutions of this equation and how they're used eventually to uh, uh, generate mass. Now, <clears throat> this equation is what is called a field equation in quantum field theory. <clears throat> it has uh, several terms, which I will just write like this. and then tell you what these terms mean. First off, these are, <clears throat> these are things that tell you how this field, this mathematical function, depends upon time. And these are things that tell you how the mathematical function depends upon space. And the essence of special relativity is that the, uh, there should be no significant distinction between the way things depend upon space in the way they depend upon time. And the only distinction here is, in fact, that there is a uh, minus sign in front of uh, the space uh, <laughs> derivatives of this field. Uh, that's very important and must be there. But otherwise, this equation looks very symmetrical in space and time. Now, <clears throat> the next term here is what is usually referred to as a mass term. In fact, uh, it's written as a square to make you believe that perhaps it's always positive. But there are instances where it's interesting to look at this term uh, when it's negative. And in that case, it's not exactly a mass anymore. Then <clears throat> there is one more term which describes the way the system interacts with itself, the force that one part of the system exerts on the other part of the system. And I'll just write this right now uh, as n of phi. It's a nonlinear term. What this means is that the system is never free if that term is equal to 0. Now, this is, uh, this is a kind of phenomenon in quantum theory that has very seldom been discussed uh, intrinsically nonlinear systems, the reason being uh, that it's very difficult to uh, do the mathematics. And so people have used uh, what is called perturbation theory. <clears throat> and if you don't remember what perturbation theory is, perturbation theory is what children do to their parents. So <clears throat> uh, that's the way that uh, quantum field theory has been approached. You make a system, and then you change it just a little bit. And then you change it just a little bit more, and you continue changing the system a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more until finally um, uh, <coughs> you have arrived at something. And the perturbative approach has been discussed in order to generate mass. Uh, I call it perturbative. Another way of describing it is to say that this is the unsuccessful way of mass generation. It doesn't work in perturbation theory, although it has been conjectured to. Now, <coughs> quantum theory is the best example of a system, uh, a, a quantum description of a system, is the best example of what we think of as a system that's always interacting with itself. And <clears throat> so what I will describe is the way we do quantum field theory with a system which is never like uh, a freely falling object, for example. Uh, <clears throat> and to do that, 
I want to talk very briefly about the kind that come out of a theory that looks like this. So first let me tell you about the waves that come out. If I only have uh, these two terms, a time derivative operating twice on the field, and a space derivative operating twice on the field, and I should have said at the very beginning that I've set all of my constants, Planck's constant and the speed of light, equal to unity here. That way I don't have to worry about making any mistakes with my constants. Now, <clears throat> what kind of waves can we get out of a theory that just has these two terms equal to zero? They're well known. Uh, they're similar to electromagnetic waves. And they have a very important property that if I <clears throat> add a bunch of them together, uh, they will move, let's say the, the picture here, this is a, a lump of matter or a lump of whatever, uh, moves off to the right. And the important property is that once I make this lump, it always keeps the same form. This is what is called a non-dispersive system. And I'll tell you what, uh, a little more precisely what I mean about that in just a minute. <clears throat> now, suppose that I erase the line here and say, OK, what I would like to do is include the part that described those waves. And in addition, I want to put in another term, which I say describes mass. And this also has the effect of being a dispersive term. If I make a packet with a certain shape and let it propagate for a while, what happens is that the packet's form degenerates, deteriorates. Now, dispersion is a phenomenon that you're all familiar with. Every time you look at uh, light through a, a piece of uh, cut glass or a diamond ring or something like that, you see the colors <coughs> uh, bent differing amounts by the material. And this difference in the amount of bending for a given color of light is one example uh, of dispersion. It's somewhat different from this, but uh, the effects are roughly so similar. Now, <clears throat> suppose that I come back, take away this, and let my system have just the self-interaction, but with no mass. Start off with no mass. Then there are solutions of this system, which look like the following. If I draw a picture in time and in space, so this is a distance from the center of my system. Uh, what I see is a picture that looks like this. <coughs> the, the, it's not a wave exactly, it's a lump. But it's a kind of lump such that if I stand here and watch it for a while, what I find is that it gets steeper and steeper and eventually explodes. So we see a solution with the nonlinearity but with no dispersion. Uh, which is explosive. Uh, it will not uh, remain a lump for a long period of time. Finally, <clears throat> suppose I let everything be in here, nonlinearities and mass terms. Then what do I see? Well, it's a very fascinating thing that was first observed about 125 years ago in uh, a shallow water system. It's called a solitary wave. And more recently, waves like this have been called uh, <coughs> solitons. And what these waves are, they're nonlinear, non-dispersive, non-explosive waves. They have the property that you can make one that's localized to start with. And after it propagates for a while, it keeps its same shape, even though I've got <coughs> this term, this mass squared like term which makes this uh, linear wave disperse. And I've got this nonlinear term, which made this wave explode. But the net result is something uh, that is stable and propagates with constant wave speed. All right, now what does this have to do with quantum field theory? Well, <clears throat> in quantum field theory, we can make waves that look very much like this. Uh, they have uh, certain properties that are different uh, from the uh, classical uh, types of solutions. 
uh, <coughs> and in particular, uh, the major difference is that the, the waves in quantum theory don't describe uh, localized systems. They're infinitely oscillating systems, but they still have this property of being non-dispersive. <coughs> there are solutions of, of uh, nonlinear field theories like this. And the important thing for my talk today is that most of these theories have a term in here uh, which looks like mass. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it may turn out that m squared is negative, so it's not really a physical mass. But nonetheless, it has all the, uh, the uh, properties for the waves that, uh, that a mass term would have. So when you make a theory like th this, <coughs> you're eventually going to have to calculate something in quantum theory that's related to a probability. And <coughs> this, this thing that's related to the probability, uh, which is called a, a propagator, what it tells you very roughly is if you're at the point x at time t, what's the, uh, the probability of getting to the point uh, x prime at some later time t prime? That's very crude. But the important thing about this propagator is that it contains the information about the mass of the system in a way which we don't need to go into. But <clears throat> in particular, uh, for some theories, uh, this this propagator contains the following statement. It says that the mass that comes out of the theory can be written in terms of the mass that went into the theory uh, in the following way. Here is the mass that goes into the theory. Out of it comes a mass spectrum uh, where this number is, a, is an integer. It can be 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And this is a number that's characteristic of the interaction and we don't need to discuss for the time being. But <clears throat> in any case, the important point is that we get mass. But we're starting with mass, so it's no real surprise. Now, <clears throat> what I have found uh, quite recently is that <clears throat> I can make a theory that has nothing like this in it. Uh, it does have solitary waves, however. They are non uh, dispersive solitary waves, so it's, uh, that in itself is a rather <coughs> interesting type of effect. And these non-dispersive solitary waves <coughs> uh, have all the other interesting properties of solitary waves, in particular that they, they move along with uh, a constant shape uh, in certain circumstances. And you can make your quantum field theory. and uh, the, the nonlinear term, this interaction term, contains two constants that I'll just call right now A and B. They're not masses. They're coefficients of forces. And what comes out is a mass spectrum that looks like um, this. something that is proportional to the cube of one of the constants and the square of the other. So I have started with no mass and uh, after working for a little while, uh, wound up with a, uh, <coughs> uh, a mass spectrum. Now this wave has uh, characteristics that are quite different from the kinds of waves that, uh, that we encounter in normal circumstances. It's what is called a non-perturbative or intrinsically non-linear thing. If you let the constants in the formula go to zero so that the forces get to be very small, you don't get little bitty oscillations. Instead, what you get is very uninteresting things that just spread out uniformly over all of space. So <clears throat> taking the limit where these forces vanish uh, is not a particularly interesting limit. Now, finally, think finally. What does it have to do with uh, gravity and what does it have to do uh, with general relativity? <clears throat> well, we know the following about Einsteinian gravity. We know that there are at least two or three places, two or three types of experiments where 
uh, theories of gravity, or Einsteinian gravity rather, not theories, but one theory of gravity, actually experience. It predicts the results uh, that are observed. So the theory is right in the sense of physics in that uh, in some places, anyway, um, it agrees with observations. Now, <clears throat> any theory uh, such as Einsteinian gravity, any macroscopic theory that is right is a sort of a vague memory or remnant of a quantum theory. And so <clears throat> uh, we can say that classical gravitational theory should have some kind of underlying quantum gravitational theory. And people have worked on making these gravitational theories. And in particular, they have made what are called perturbative gravitational, uh, quantized gravitational theories, which contain uh, massless particles, very much like the photon. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, maybe in some distant future experiment will be observed the way the photon has been observed. Uh, but these theories have some unreasonable elements. In particular, they are linearized theories. And we know that the classical theories, the classical Einsteinian theory is a very, very complex nonlinear theory. OK, so <clears throat> we have the following situation then. Classical gravity makes sense. It's possible to quantize a, um, uh, a linearized form of this theory. And finally, quite recently, uh, people have discovered um, solitary waves or soliton solutions of gravi classical gravitational equations. So <clears throat> uh, I conclude with the question then, these classical solitary gravitational waves are somehow remnants of a quantum theory. Are they, in fact, remnants of a quantum theory where you start with no mass, do all of the non-perturbative things that you need to do, and come up with uh, a quantized gravitational theory. Thank you. The title of my talk is Revisiting Schwarzschild with Geodesic Coordinates. But before talking about Schwarzschild, which is a solution of Einstein's general field equations, I'd like to go back to 1905, just set the stage and talk about flat space and what happens in flat space. And the main thing I want you to get out of this first figure over here is the idea of a space-time diagram. In the figure, Time is plotted upwards over here, and space is plotted to the right. The, what you have in, in, this set, in, in this situation is a picture of a, an, an inertial reference system. Each one of these trajectories, these vertical trajectories, represents clocks. And the clocks are fixed, so you imagine a whole series of clocks fixed along here, along the plus x axis or minus x axis or so. And as they are ticking away, the, they record different times. But besides just having clocks, the clocks are also synchronized in a fashion such that the velocity of light will move along a 45 degree line. In other words, x will be equal to t. We take c equal to 1. Two things about this. First of all, in, in flat space, we're using over here what you might call geodesic coordinates. Each one of these clocks represents a geodesic coordinate, a coordinate of a particle that is not ac acted upon by any forces. We could, if we wanted to, uh, represent space-time, flat space-time by accelerated clocks. But life is a lot easier if we use these geodesic clocks like over here. 
So a particle will move along a straight line like so, and um, the light signal will move along 45 degrees either towards the right or towards the left. That's a brief introduction to space-time diagrams. We are going to be using those throughout the whole talk. Now what I'd like to do is to go over to curved space and talk about solutions to Einstein's field equations, gravitational field equations. The first solution to Einstein's gravitational field equations was obtained by Schwarzschild in around 1960, roughly about a half a year or so after Einstein proposed the original field equations. And Schwarzschild solved the problem by, uh, the, the original field equations are 16, field e uh, 16 equations coupled with second order differential equations. They're quite hard to solve in general. But if you impose certain symmetries, you can, you can get, get solutions to these. And Schwarzschild was the first person to find a solution by imposing spherical symmetry. And what he did was to say, suppose we have sp spherical symmetry and also static solution. Let us now go and see what the solution is. And the metric that one obtains for this is written down here in the lower, in the corner. And I'm just going to worry only about the spatial part of the metric, or one, uh, the radial part of the metric. It should be an r squared times d omega squared tacked on over here. But I'm going to just neglect that because all the motions I'll be talking about will be for radi the radial case only. And if you look at this solution, this metric over here, you find the famous Schwarzschild singularity. Namely, if you look at the variable radius over here, you find out that as r approaches the Schwarzschild singularity 2m, the first term over here becomes the coefficient of dr squared becomes infinite, and the coefficient of dt squared becomes zero. So that's the idea of the Schwarzschild singularity. What I've done over here is given you a space-time diagram where I've plotted t vertically, Schwarzschild coordinate t vertically, and the Schwarzschild coordinate r horizontally. And one evidence of the Schwarzschild singularity is that if you try to follow particles or light signals from r greater than 2m across the Schwarzschild radius r equal to 2m, you cannot do this in terms of the Schwarzschild coordinates. If you, for example, if you follow a light signal coming in from infinity, here it is by, it represented by the curved line, a wiggly line over here, it goes and it becomes an asymptotic to r equals 2m, but you cannot follow it across r equals 2m. Similarly, if you took a light signal that is going out towards r equals infinity and looked at its past history, you would not be able to follow the past history across r equals 2m. If you looked at a particle, here's a trajectory of a particle rising and then reaching some maximum radius and then falling back down again. Also, the particle cannot be followed across r equals 2m. The anomaly here, if you want to call it an anomaly, is that although this particle, represented by dd prime, cannot be followed across r equals 2m in terms of the coordinate time, Schwarzschild coordinate time t, it still takes only a finite number of ticks if this were a clock, if this were a clock, a geodesic clock, to reach r equals 2m on the geodesic clock, and also uh, in terms of the time recorded by the geodesic clock, it, it, it records a finite, number, finite amount of ticks and can also, in terms of this time, be followed across r equals 2m down to r equals 0. Now, these two diagrams may look similar. You see vertical lines here and horizontal lines here, and vertical lines here and horizontal lines here. But the basic difference between these two diagrams is that over here, the vertical lines in flat space are geodesic clocks whereas the vertical lines over here in the curved space would not be geodesic clocks. These are clocks that you have to exert certain forces on in order to keep them at the fixed radius. That's the clocks that record this, this uh, Schwarzschild time t. If you did not exert these forces, in other words, if you did, if you did not, ma uh, if you made them free clocks and removed all forces, they would fall into the Schwarzschild radius. One of the things that has been done in, over the past few years, many years as a matter of fact, is to try to find coordinate systems in terms of which you can follow particles across the Schwarzschild radius. One such coordinate system is the coordinate system of Eddington and Finkelstein. Eddington discovered this in 1924 and Finkelstein rediscovered this in 1958. And essentially what happens is that a, uh, a Mathematical coordinate transformation is made between the old Schwarzschild coordinate, time coordinate t, and the new time coordinate t prime, Finkelstein Eddington time coordinate t prime, which involves a singularity type of a transformation. But with this transformation, you can take the previous Schwarzschild metric, which was represented in terms of r and t, and re express it in terms of r and t prime. And now, in terms of this, these, this new coordinate, t prime, you can follow no geodesics across the Schwarzschild radius. For example, here's a, a prime. And here's a particle, d, d prime. 
In terms of these new coordinates, you can follow them across the Schwarzschild radius, whereas before, you could not. Here's AA prime, which was not followable across the Schwarzschild radius. However, you can only follow particles and light signals across the Schwarzschild radius in one direction. And over here, you see a, the, the null line AA prime being followed across the Schwarzschild radius, but if you look at the outgoing null line B, B prime, you cannot, in terms of the past history, follow this one across the Schwarzschild radius. Now, you can, if you want to, by simply changing a constant, a plus sign to, or in this case, a minus sign to a plus sign, devise new coordinates, which just the opposite will happen. Namely, in terms of what you might call outgoing Finkelstein coordinates, you now, in terms of uh, taking this, this minus, what was previously a minus sign and changing to a plus sign, you can now follow outgoing particles in terms of the past history across the Schwarzschild radius. For example, here's BP, BB prime, but ingoing particles now cannot. So you have what they, what Finkelstein referred to as a unidirectional membrane. You can do it one way or the other, but not both. Now, one thing I want to point out to you, because I'm going to be coming back to this later on, is that the metric, either with plus one or minus one over here, is a non-diagonal metric, which means it has cross terms. It has cross terms in it. Now, this is only one coordinate system in which you can follow particles across the Schwarzschild radius in at least one way, so it's a little better than, than Schwarzschild coordinates. But there exists one, there exists other coordinates, and perhaps the most famous of these is what are called the Kruskal coordinates where you can follow particles both outwards and inwards across the Schwarzschild radius. And Kruskal posed the following problem. He says, suppose we look for a coordinate system, U and V, such that light signals will move along 45 degree lines. So that means the form has to be a, a form du squared minus dv squared in order for this condition to be satisfied. Then he said, all right, we'll write the metric in terms of du squared minus dv squared, and we'll look for a functional form that we have to put in front of here, which will be regular and finite and ev everywhere, and he came up with a functional form to be 32m squared over r e to the r over 2m. Now, in terms of crystal coordinates, particles can be followed both ways. For example, here's a particle, a, a, ge a geodesic or a particle to the trajectory i or jj prime. It comes out from r equals zero, crosses the Schwarzschild radius over here, reaches a maximum radius, and then falls back in across the Schwarzschild radius, and eventually going back to r. Similarly, you can have other particles, I, I prime, or particles that go out to infinity, depending upon the type of particles you're, you're looking at. But a price has to be paid for this getting rid of the unidirectional membrane business and going over into a two-way picture. And that price that has to be paid is what you might call the price of interpretation. If we go back to the original Schwarzschild coordinates over here, we sort of had a feeling for what was going on. We knew what R was. R was some sort of distance measured away from some s uh, center of sphere uh, of, of symmetry. But now we have strange things happening over here. If you look at a plot of R equals constant, say over here, that plot of R equals constant appears, well, I don't have it on this diagram. Oh, here's one. That plot of R equals constant appears twice. It appears over here as a parabola, like so but appears also over here as a separate par parabola. The plot r equals zero appears up here once and down here a second time. If we go back to the original Schwarzschild coordinates and we look at regions where r is much greater than 2m, we sort of feel comfortable over there in terms of future evolution. We know which way is into the future and which way is into the past because the Schwarzschild coordinate t, if you're very, very far away from r equals zero, tells you which way future is. Increasing t says that that's the way future should increase. So that allows me to draw, for example, arrows on these various uh, geodesics and null geodesics and time-like geodesics. But over here with Schwarzschild coordinates, with, with Crisco coordinates, it's not quite clear what's going on because over here, the Schwarzschild time, at least in the region where R is greater than 2m, increases up this way. But on this side over here, the Schwarzschild time increases in a downwards fashion. So it's not clear which way is future. If you want to use the criterion of increasing Schwarzschild time, future would be up over here and down over here. There have been various concepts that have been used to try to explain this phenomenon. One is, well, maybe we have two separate sheets. And over here, over here we have R equal constant, and over here we have another R equal constant, and they're two separate sheets which are not, cannot be causally connected at all. 
So the word separate sheet has come in, or maybe the word, maybe you might have heard the word wormhole, which is another way of describing this. There are two, there are two sides of a wormhole. Well, I, for one, find wormholes a little bit hard to swallow, and I have puzzled over, over this Crisco diagram for a long time, and what I'm going to do right now is to talk a little bit about other ways of getting to the Crisco diagram. Oh, but before that, I want to point out something else. If you look at any particular value of R and T, so for example, pick an R and T over here, one R and one T, single out an R and a T, it turns out that this R and T will appear twice on the Crisco diagram. So for example, here's, a, here's an R and a T on the origin, R equals zero. That appears up here. The same R and T will generate a point up here and will correspond to the diametrically opposite point uh, um, on the opposite, opposite side of a radial line, if you will, passing through the origin. So these two points correspond to the same R and T. And it's tempting to say, well, if they correspond to the same R and T, maybe there's something in the mathematics around here which makes some sort of a two-fold mapping, and these two points should be identified. In other words, it's a mathematical problem over here. And these are not really two separate points. This A and that A prime are not two separate points. And when I was a graduate student, my advisor said, hey, take a look at this. And I said, well, gee, if these, both of these points uh, correspond to the same R and the same T, R equals 0, T equals TA, R equals 0, T equals TA, they must be the same physical points. So maybe we have a way of getting outside from inside the Schwarzschild radius. So for example, if you t follow a light signal, here's a light signal, A, A. Now at that point and this point are the same, why don't we just identify these two points and again follow our light signal right back out. Here goes crossing R equals 2M down to R equals 0, identify the points, and here it comes back out again, crossing R equals 2M, and eventually going back out to infinity. The trouble with that is you have causal violations, because here you would have a, the, the light signal crossing itself, and that doesn't make sense in terms of causality. It's like meeting yourself, yourself right now, seeing a future image of yourself. So on the basis of causality, we would try to rule out this, this possibility, but it's on the basis of causality and not on the basis of um, it's the basis, basis of physics, you might say, and not on the basis of mathematics that we rule, rule that out. Both interpretations are equally good. Two-sheet interpretation or a diametric interpretation. Now, one of the things that I find I have found difficult with crystal coordinates and also with Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates is that you lose, you lose sight of the, what, what the coordinates actually stand for, what they mean. So one of the things I've done in the past few years along with Danish Hoffman is uh, to say, well, let's look at coordinates that mean something. Namely, let's look at geodesic coordinates, geodesic clock coordinates. And the procedure that we use is something like this. Let's imagine a Gedanken experiment. Where we imagine that we're going to drop clocks, drop clocks. So I'm standing here in the gravitational field, right over here, and now I'm going to release clocks. Just drop them. Now, as soon as I drop a clock, it becomes a geodesic particle, which is the analog of the clocks that we had in special relativity. Remember this, the geodesic clocks in special relativity. So let's do that and see what happens, and re-coordinatize everything, and go from Schwarzschild t coordinates to time coordinates that are measured by these falling clocks. The advantage being that now we know we at least know what the time coordinate is on these clocks that are falling. We could also do the same thing with rising. We can, sh we can sh uh, throw out rising clocks. Like imagine uh, I'm up here catching these clocks as somebody from R equals zero throws them up at me. But the easier thing is to imagine that they are falling. And one can simply work out what happens with these clocks, and it's just a mathematical. Uh, just mathematics from here on in to work out the transformation. So now you can imagine sort of like a clock factory. I'm up here, I'm the factory, I drop these clocks, and every time I drop a clock, I synchronize it by saying that it's going to be equal to the clock or the clock factory over here. And as it goes on, it goes on its merry way. As it's falling down, if an, if an event happens over there, I know the time on that event to be equal to, I assign the time of that event to be equal to the time on this clock as it's falling down. So here are some of the falling clocks over here in terms of a non space time diagram. Here are some of the falling clocks in terms of the space-time diagram. And what I've done over here is to simply go from the Schwarzschild coordinate t to the geodesic clock coordinate tau. And here's the transformation, which you can just work out. Notice it, it's a log logarithmically divergent transformation, much like Eddington Finkelstein, but it's a different type of transformation. The metric that you get is perfectly regular everywhere. 
as it was Eddington Finkelstein's metric. It's also non diagonal. So, in terms of tau versus r, a typical clock trajectory would be the trajectory EE prime over there. Well, if I don't want to drop the clocks, I can also have the clocks rising. And in that case, what happens is that you have a similar expression. No. I can't get it any better than that. A similar expression to over, as over here, except that what happens is every place you had a plus sign over here, you now have a minus sign over here. Now, in terms of these coordinate systems, the following is found, that you can follow light signals one way across the Schwarzschild radius. For example, here's AA prime being followable across the Schwarzschild radius. You can also follow particles across the Schwarzschild radius. For example, here's one particle, namely our coordinate clock being followed across the Schwarzschild radius. But you can only follow particles across the Schwarzschild radius if the particles are moving in the same direction as the clocks. So for example, here's a rising particle or a rising light signal. And this rising light si signal cannot be followed across the Schwarzschild radius in terms of the, and one of the things you should notice that along with this goes the fact that the rising light signal or rising particle is moving in opposition to the falling clocks. In the other sense, over here where the clocks are rising, those light signals like BB prime or uh, par, uh, trajectories like um, D, D prime over here can be followed across the Schwarzschild radius if they're moving in the same sense as the rising clocks. But light signals that are moving in opposite sense to the rising clocks, for example, here's A, A prime, or here's a future history of DD prime, namely moving in the opposite sense, cannot be followed across the Schwarzschild radius. So we ha now have a physical feeling for what's going on. Namely, you see that the followable, followable or non-followable properties of particles across the Schwarzschild radius depend upon whether they're moving in the same sense as the clocks determining the time, or in opposite sense. If they're moving in the same sense, they can be followed across the Schwarzschild radius. If they're moving in the opposite sense, they cannot be followed across the Schwarzschild radius. We can go even a little further with this. Several speakers have spoke about uh, the famous Einstein falling elevator. Well, here's the analog to an Einstein falling elevator. Let's take a little bunch of falling clocks over here and start them falling from this constant radius and let them go down and down and down. And there they are. And you essentially have clocks that are inside of, uh, inside of a, a, an, elevator, an elevator. And we can now look at the Duncan experiments formed by this falling elevator and see what happens is that we can imagine that as this elevator is falling along here, it looks at the motion of particles that, is, that are rising, in other words, moving opposite to that. And when you analyze this experiment, you find the following fact, that as the elevator gets closer and closer to r equals 2 and the Schwarzschild radius, the velocities of these rising particles get closer and closer to the velocity of the light. Also, you find out that as, part of, as this elevator is closer and closer to the Schwarzschild radius, the time of the rising particles is, is also dilated. In other words, we are seeing the familiar time dilation uh, expressions as objects approach the speed of light. And it can be shown rigorously that as this elevator crosses the Schwarzschild radius, all particles bend over to, all rising particles, bend over to the null, null line, and they all move with the speed of light. So we now have some feeling as to why you cannot follow particles across the Schwarzschild radius when they're moving opposite to you, because now we're getting into a situation which you might say transcends special, re special relativity, because we know from special relativity that you cannot follow, uh, you cannot have particles moving faster than the speed of light. Well, what happens when we get inside over here? We'll talk about that a little later towards the end of the talk. This is by no means the only type of, oh, I forgot something, I forgot something. It may seem a little bit unnatural to have the clocks moving through a coordinate system, so to speak. So one of the things we could do, which very, with very little um, difficulty, is to say, well, what we're going to do is we have two, one time coordinate, namely tau, but two sort of, sort of two spatial type of coordinates, namely r, and the location of each clock. Let's try to maybe make things look a little more like special relativity. And what we'll do is we'll, quote, straighten out these lines over here. And we'll assign a coordinate rho to each one of these lines, such that rho equals constant along their spatial coordinate. And we get a picture which looks something like this. Both of these are the same picture. You can all, almost imagine the deformation over there. You're, you're taking these 
uh, curve lines that represented the particles and you're now straight, straightening them out. For example, here is E, E prime over here. Here is E, E prime over there. You have, we haven't done anything new. All we've done is deform the whole re coordinate system so that the lines that were previously curved are now straight. The physics still holds. The, the, the signal that was followable across the Schwarzschild radius, AA prime, is still followable over here, AA prime. The signal that was not, BB prime, is also not followable. Now this is very important because I'm going to be making a big deal about this very shortly with another type of reference system. So let me, let me say it again. There's no physical difference between these two coordinate systems. They are simply distortions. One is a distortion of the other. The, the main change came in when we replaced the original Schwarzschild coordinate T with the new geodesic clock coordinate tau. Now we're sort of just, you might say, tidying up the place a bit by straightening out lines that we don't like to be curved. And this is evidence in the transformation that takes you from this coordinate system to this coordinate system, namely over here, which is a regular transformation as opposed to the transformation which took us from T to tau, which was logarith logarithmically divergent. This is not the only type of coordinate system that you can form with geodesic clocks. Another coordinate system was obtained by a Russian physicist by the name of Novikov around 1962 or something like that. And here's Novikov's idea. Novikov's idea is to shoot out clocks from R equals zero have them all reach a maximum radius, to that whole family of a swarm of clocks, have them reach a maximum radius, and then let, let them fall back into the r equals zero again. The synchronization condition is that when they reach their maximum radius, they are all, they are all going to reach the maximum radius at the same Schwarzschild time, time t, and also when they reach that maximum radius, they are going to be recording zero time. So that's a synchronization condition. Now, if you look at the associated space-time diagram for this, here is what it looks like. Here is a typical clock trajectory, say C, C prime, coming out. We're plotting now tau star, which is the time recording these clocks upward and R over this way, coming out, reaching a maximum radius, and then falling back down in again. There's one hitch with this procedure, though, and the hitch is that you cannot have a particle, a physical particle, tangent to a r equal constant curve where r is less than the Schwarzschild radius. In other words, you can imagine you drop clocks, or cl imagine these clocks to be dropped from, from radii. You can drop them from large radii and smaller radii, but the smallest radius at which you can drop a clock from is the Schwarzschild radius, r equals 2m. If you try dropping clocks from radii smaller than the Schwarzschild radius, they will be non-physical in the sense that they will be moving faster than the speed of light and you just cannot have this. The geodesic equations will not permit this. So there is a hitch to this whole procedure. Namely, we can, we can have these clocks reaching maximum radii, but the smallest maximum radius we can reach is that equal to the Schwarzschild radius. So here is what you might call the last clock of this coordinate system. Moving up here, just tangent to r equals 2m, and then falling back again to r equals 0. The transformation can be worked out. And again, what we're doing is something very similar. What Novikov is doing is something similar to what I just did. Namely, he's replacing the Schwarzschild coordinate t with this new time coordinate tau star. And now you get a metric which looks regular everywhere, except at ri equals 2m, that in the case that you cannot have a, a radius smaller than 2m. And it's non-diagonal. You have non-diagonal terms. So it's something similar to but different from what we did before with the other geodesic clocks. Now we have, because of this, we have uh, limitations on what we can do with this type of a reference system. If you look at a world line, say a particle line being tracked over here, say B, B prime, there are two types. One is a particle line that can be tracked along here and be followed down to R equal, across R equals 2M down to R equals 0. But there's another type of particle line that cannot be tracked down to R equals 0, namely A, A prime. Here's A, A prime. It comes along and all of a sudden it hits the last clock over there and you cannot follow it any further. You cannot follow this down to R equals 0. It's sort of a picture of a, uh, what you might call, a coordinate hole gobbling up a, a world line, so to speak. So there, there is this incompleteness. It's what's called, what's called geodesic incompleteness. There are geodesics, such as AA prime, that you cannot follow down to R equals 0. Now we can pull the same maneuver that we pulled before. Namely, if we don't like our 
the, the clocks that measure tau start, if we don't like the clocks that measure the, the time tau to move along curve lines, let's straighten these out. It's a straightforward mathematical procedure. And what we're going to do now is simply straighten out all those curve world lines. And the straightening out procedure involves a transformation which is regular. We're now going to go to a new coordinate, R, Ri, which is equal to the maximum radius that each of these, each of these clocks have. And that's, at, and that's a constant which is unique to each of these clocks. Each of the clocks has a unique Ri, so Ri is fixed <coughs> along each clock trajectory. We will use that as our new coordinate. And we are now going to straighten out the clock trajectory. So here is CC prime that was curved over here. It's now straight over here. Why? We haven't done anything new. We've just performed a little mathematical uh, game over here to straighten out the clocks. And in doing this, we wind up with a metric which goes from a non-diagonal form, which is over here, namely a metric expressed in terms of r and tau star, to a metric which is now diagonal, which is over here, which is a metric expressed in terms of the maximum radius ri and the same old time tau star. Notice that the coordinate singularity that, that existed over here, namely 1 over 1 minus 2 over ri, which indicated the boundary of our coordinate system, still exists over here, namely we have a dri squared over 1 minus 2 over ri. Now watch the following. This is something that I don't quite know what to say about except I'll tell you what happens. The coordinates that are used over here, namely ri and tau star, are not Novikov's coordinates. Novikov's coordinates, Novikov's spatial coordinate, r star, is related to ri by this relationship over here. Namely, r, it's monotonically related. r star is the square root of ri over 2m minus 1. You take the differential of that, and you have something that turns out to be very neat. See this term over here, dri squared divided by the, the, singular, the term that becomes singular at 1 minus 2m over ri? That disappears. That disappears, and you now no longer have a singular expression in the metric. The metric looks regular and finite everywhere, and if you were just started with this, as Novikov did, you'd be tempted to say, well, since I have nothing stopping me, stopping me from going to negative values of R star, let me now extend this metric and go back to negative values of R star. Now, that may or may not look familiar to you, but let, let me just rewrite the same picture over here in terms of a new set of space time, uh, just a new set of uh, particles. Here's the same metric uh, written now in terms of R star and tau star. And now this may look familiar mind you as to how, how it should look familiar to you. Go back to the original crystal diagram that we had over here. And they look very similar to each other. They look very similar to each other. In fact, I've shown you the world lines over here. And the world, over here, the world line I, I that was curved on the crystal diagram is now straightened out over here. The null line A, A prime that was straight on the crystal diagram is now curved over here. But it's, it's essentially the same thing. Essentially the same thing. Except for one thing. There's no left-hand side over here. There's no left-hand side over here. Whereas over here, on the crystal diagrams, there was a left-hand side. Now, if you go back and you look at how Novikov's coordinate system is constructed, you would say, well, there should not be any left-hand side over there. It just shouldn't exist. It doesn't make any sense if we go back to the, uh, the original way that we just straighten out things over here, but it doesn't make any sense to have a left-hand side over here. Yet Kruskal's diagram has a left-hand side, and by the way, so, did, so does Novikov's diagram. If you look at Novikov's publications, he also has a left-hand side with Schwarzschild T running downwards over here. Novikov did not proceed this way. He proceeded in a different way, and he wound up with something that looked at exactly like, essentially equivalent to Kruskal, except a little, little different over here. Well, this, what I'm saying here, I mean, if those of you that know about the field realize I'm saying something a little bit controversial over here throwing away, essentially, the whole left-hand side of a Kruskal diagram or of a Novikov diagram. Yet, if you look at the way of derived things, that's the conclusion that you seem to be led to, that the left-hand side does not belong there. It's sort of like a mirror repetition of, on the right, of what's on the right-hand side. Notice that nice things happen if you throw away a left-hand side. Remember we had difficulties with which way is up on a Kruskal diagram? Well, those difficulties disappear if there's no left-hand side. We now have only one way up. Remember we had difficulties with diametric identification versus non-diametric identification? We don't have to worry about that if there's no left-hand side to uh, identify with. 
Well, that's controversial, and what I'd like, like to do is to sort of close my talk with what you might call a speculation type of a thing. Speculation means that if I'm wrong, I can't be held to task for it. So what I want to do now is to look at things that happen inside the Schwarzschild radius. If you've been following me so far, you've found out that I have purposely avoided talking about things that go on inside the Schwarzschild radius. Well, now I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about a particle that goes through the Schwarzschild radius and inside the Schwarzschild radius emits a light signal. And I'm going to do this in two ways, one on Novikov's diagram on the left-hand side, not there, and one on uh, the diagram, this infalling clock diagram. So here's a typical particle falling from Thanks very much, Peter. Am I hearable in the back? If not, uh, shout in one way or another. When Peter first asked me to speak at this Einstein celebration, I told him that I was just the wrong man. My own work in the history of physics has dealt primarily with the 17th and 18th centuries, which are metaphorically, if not literally, light years away from the work of Einstein and his contemporaries. Barker's shrewd reply amounted to a challenge. Loudon, he said, you formulated a general account of how science is supposed to develop, and instead of trying it out on the easy cases of classical physics, why don't you see if it's rich enough to deal with science in its modern form? Being a betting man by nature, I decided to take up the invitation, stressing that I had nothing to say about the fine structure forgive me, Arthur, of Einstein's physics, but that I was quite prepared to talk about its coarse grain structure. For his part, Peter obviously decided to hedge his bets by putting me first on the program, on the entirely sound theory that one saves the best for last. Because I am no Einstein specialist, I shall leave a detailed analysis of Einstein's work to some of my philosophical and scientific colleagues on the program who are qualified to do that. For my part, I shall deal in a fairly impressionistic way with some of the morals to be drawn from Einstein's achievement. During the first 15 years of this century, in a succession of classic papers, Albert Einstein affected one of the most important revolutions in the history of physical theory. Shortly after the Einsteinian revolution, there followed an equally radical if only slightly less well-known revolution in philosophy and in the philosophy of science, producing what has come to be known as logical positivism or logical empiricism. Just as Einstein's work came to dominate 20th century physics, so did logical positivism come to dominate much of subsequent philosophy of science. The timing of these two revolutions is no accident. The figures who transformed the philosophy of science during the 1920s and 1930s, people like Moritz Schlicht, Rudolf Carnap, Hans Reichenbach, and Karl Popper, saw their own work as providing a philosophical account of and rationale for precisely the sort of physics which they believed Einstein to be doing. Hans Reichenbach, for instance, was a younger contemporary of Einstein's while he was at Berlin and during that period worked closely with the Einstein group, acting to some degree as their resident philosopher. During the 1920s, Reichenbach published a well-known axiomatization of the theory of relativity and was later to write extensively on space and time. Rudolf Carnap, in the 1920s and for much of the rest of his life, returned repeatedly to themes within the Einstein corpus. Karl Popper, for his part, tells us over and again that the impact of the theory of relativity on him profoundly shaped his views as to what the nature of science is and accordingly his views as to what philosophy of science should do. 
All of these figures perceive themselves as philosophical underlaborers, seeking to make explicit those logical and epistemological assumptions about science which had made Einstein's revolution possible. But one of the more curious ironies of recent intellectual history is that the positivistic philosophies of science which emerged out of the Vienna Circle in the 1920s and 1930s, those accounts provide a view of science which is not only at odds with Einstein's own philosophical views about how science should proceed, worse than that, they produce an account which is radically at odds with the central scientific innovations which constitute the Einsteinian revolution. Put differently, when we juxtapose what the positivists tell us science should be like with what Einstein's science itself was like, we're confronted by a massive ill fit. It's rather like trying to squeeze a size 12 woman into a size 5 dress. All the interesting bits get left out. On almost every important philosophical particular, the proposals of Reichenbach, Carnap, and Popper make it impossible to understand what Einstein did and why he did it. Still more importantly, the theories of these philosophers profoundly miss the nature of the evaluation process within virtually all the major sciences. In order to make these claims plausible, I have two tasks that I've set for myself this morning. At the outset, I want to exhibit what seem to me to be a few of the very deep differences between the image of science as one sees it in the work of the logical empiricists and positivists on the one hand, and the reality of science as one sees it in the physics of Einstein on the other. Moving beyond that, I want to sketch, and unfortunately that's all that time will allow, a sketch. I want to sketch an alternative philosophical account of what science is, an account which I shall try to persuade you, comes closer to making sense of Einstein's revolution and of the other revolutions within science than do prevailing positivist accounts. To begin, I should briefly review, indeed very briefly review, the central tenets of logical positivism in order to compare those tenets with the physics of Einstein, observing wherever appropriate the significant differences. Positivist philosophy of science is, whatever its critics say to the contrary, not a monolith. There are important and significant differences between various empiricist and positivist thinkers. I shall discuss some of those differences in a few minutes, but there are two central points which are shared by all those in this camp. There is, first of all, virtually unanimous agreement that there is a sharp distinction to be drawn between science on the one hand and all the other intellectual disciplines on the other. For virtually all the positivists, science constitutes the only legitimate form of knowledge, and everything else, whether it be metaphysics, theology, aesthetics, or moral theory, is not entitled the honorific status of being called scientific. The belief that science has a unique claim to knowledge represented a radical break with previous philosophical traditions. Until the 1920s, it was usually maintained that science was indeed one form of knowledge, to be sure, but that there were also other disciplines, such as philosophy and theology, which also embodied genuine knowledge. Where earlier thinkers had stressed the interdependence of various forms of knowledge, the positivists insisted that science, because it was the only genuine form of knowledge, must be hermetically sealed off from these other activities. On their account, it is neither necessary nor desirable that scientific theories should be criticized as it were from the outside. In evaluating whether a scientific theory is acceptable on their account, it isn't appropriate to commend or criticize that theory in terms of its compatibility or lack thereof with anything that's non-scientific. The suggestion that one might criticize a scientific theory on the grounds that it conflicts with or commend a scientific theory on the grounds that it's supported by forms of thought not exclusively scientific is completely anathema to the positivist way of proceeding. Clearly then, 
for the positivist. To be scientific is to be something very special. And accordingly, we must ask what makes something a science or scientific for the positivist? Well, there are a number of different criteria. You are all doubtless familiar with the debates about how to define verifiability or falsifiability. These need not preoccupy us here, not this morning. What can be said is that for all the positivists and for all the logical empiricists, there are essentially only two things that we can reasonably demand of a scientific theory. The first is that it be internally consistent and consistent with the rest of science. The second is that it must be empirically well supported within its own domain. Beyond these two demands, of consistency on the one hand and empirical support on the other, there is nothing more that can be said by way of characterizing scientific knowledge. All other requirements, for instance, the traditional requirement that theories should be intelligible, that they should be coherent, these are viewed by the positivists as purely subjective aesthetic criteria which have no legitimate role to play in the ongoing process of science. There are a number of ideas beyond these two, consistent support, which were widely, even if not universally, shared by the positivists. There is, for instance, Popper's insistence that we cannot count as evidence for a theory any facts which were already known when the theory was developed. Popper insists that any theory to be genuinely acceptable must make surprising predictions of facts as yet unknown. Popper, moreover, insists that it's inappropriate and unscientific to accept ad hoc theories. And on his account, a theory is ad hoc if the only evidence we have for it are the facts which were already known when the theory was devised. Certain positivists, like Carnap, Schlick, and Reichenbach, especially in the 20s and 30s, took an even more stringent view. They wanted to say not only that a theory should not be accepted until it's very well confirmed, but they wanted to argue in addition that we must, scientists must, engage in a term-by-term -term analysis of the concepts and the vocabulary used to formulate a particular theory. We must seek, so far as possible, to link every term in the theory with something that can be directly observed. To the degree to which we cannot do this, that is, to the extent to which a theory involves certain genuinely theoretical claims or concepts which cannot be linked with what is directly observable, the positivists argued that such terms are to be viewed literally as meaningless calculational devices, not as claims about what the world's really like. Any terms or concepts which cannot be linked in an appropriate way to experience were viewed by the positivists as hollow and empty, without referent in the physical world. There is, of course, a great deal more one could say by way of characterizing the philosophical position of positivism or logical empiricism. But we already have here more than enough to see just how wide is the gap between science as the positivists conceived it and science as Einstein, whom they professed to take as their model, practiced it. Einstein had no quarrel with the positivists' insistence that science should be grounded in and tested against experience. Indeed, he often used the same word as the positivists do for this process, verification. But where the positivists viewed experimental verification as sufficient for showing the soundness of a theory, Einstein thought verification was necessary but not sufficient. His view was that theories and hypotheses had to be subjected to scrutiny at a wide variety of levels and that determining the degree of empirical support for a theory was only one of several tests which a sound theory must pass. The tests which Einstein proposed and utilized at these other levels find no parallel in positivist models. Still worse, positivism absolutely denies that these other levels of theory analysis have any legitimate role to play in the ongoing process of science. In referring to these other levels, I'm seeking to draw attention to the fact that Einstein was concerned to argue over and over again that certain philosophical, conceptual, and metaphysical criteria are appropriate 
possibly even necessary to bring to bear in appraising a scientific theory. Consider one example, and there are many more one could give. Throughout Einstein's work, from his earliest papers until the end of his career, he was persuaded, as most of you will know, that a proper physical theory, a proper account of physical reality, should be one which rests on the assumption of strictly causal processes in nature. As he put it in his classic essay on the present crisis in theoretical physics, written in 1922, I quote Einstein, it is the goal of theoretical physics to create a logical conceptual system resting upon the smallest possible number of mutually independent hypotheses, which allows one to comprehend causally the entire complex of physical processes, end of quotation. Encapsulated in this view of the aim of theoretical science is, of course, the requirement of verification, coming in particular with the insistence that physical theories are to be judged in terms of their capacity to explain, in Einstein's language, the entire complex of physical processes. But note that Einstein is doing a great deal more than arguing that our theories must be compatible with what we can observe about the physical world. He is insisting, in addition, that our theories must be couched in causal language, that an essential part of understanding or comprehending the world involves showing that the causal postulate is applicable to the explanation of experience. This repeated insistence of his that physical theories must be appropriately causal is unquestionably a metaphysical principle. But a metaphysical principle which Einstein believes to be appropriate to bear, to bring to bear, and the analysis of physical theories. So committed was Einstein to some version of the causal principle that he found objectionable many developments in 20th century physics, especially those within quantum mechanics, which seemed to violate the causal postulate. But it wasn't only in his constant invocation of causality that Einstein allowed metaphysical considerations to impinge on the evaluation of scientific theories. This sort of concern comes out equally in Einstein's oft-repeated convictions that symmetry and invariance conditions must play a decisive role in determining the acceptability of certain theoretical claims. Einstein urges us in ways that the positivists can give no account of at all, it seems to me, to view the process of scientific theory evaluation as being much richer and as much more subtle than simply involving a comparison of the theory being proposed with the observational evidence that can be accumulated for it. Indeed, it was not for nothing that Einstein called himself a tamed metaphysician. But his frequent use of such regulative principles as strict causality and appropriate invariances by his use of those principles, Einstein is doing two things simultaneously. For one thing, he's challenging the positivist claim that science must be cleansed of all metaphysical and philosophical influences, believing instead that metaphysics is a perfectly legitimate instrument for evaluating scientific theories. Secondly, he is stressing contrapositivism that verifiable empirical support is not not the only relevant desideratum in the selection of scientific theories. Despite the efforts of the logical empiricists to make Einstein one of their own, his work simply will not be squeezed into their pigeonholes. Confronted, for instance, by the claim of Hans Reichenbach that, and I quote him, Einstein's work was suggested by the closest adherence to experimental facts or by Reichenbach's remark that Einstein's theory is a triumph of logical empiricism, one is forced by even a superficial study of Einstein's work to the conclusion that Reichenbach and those other positivists who saw Einstein as their model were looking at his work through heavily tinted lenses, lenses which neatly filtered out anything which they did not want to see. For the purposes of my lecture today, these are the decisive features that separate the science of Einstein from positivism, and I shall return to discuss them at length in a moment. 
For the record, however, it should be noted that there are still other important respects in which Einstein's view and practice of physics depart significantly from that of the logical positivists. Where the positivists were desperately concerned to establish, so far as possible, one-to-one -one linkages between the th terms in a theory and what could be observed, Einstein was considerably more flexible. So long as it was the case that a theory had some testable consequences, it was a matter of complete indifference to Einstein whether we could show that all the constituent terms in the theory could be directly linked to observation. But more importantly than this is Ein more important than this is Einstein's insistence that theories must be realistically interpreted. Where the philosophers of the Vienna Circle had been inclined to argue that any theoretical term which cannot be directly linked to observation has no meaning, literally has no meaning, Einstein insists on the contrary that the most important ingredients in a theory, most important for understanding, most important for comprehension, are precisely those ingredients which involve us in going beyond what can be directly observed or verified in order to postulate a world which, though unobservable, is in some sense more real and more fundamental than the world in our experience, the observable world. Where the positivists were inclined to take a correlational view of theories, according to which the function of theory is simply to give us an economic representation of what can be observed, Einstein saw the aim of theorizing as replacing the world of appearance, that is the world that can be observed, with a richer, mathematically and conceptually more elegant set of structures, structures which were construed, which were to be construed as being actually in the world, even if we had no direct evidence for their existence. For Einstein, theories were no shorthand way of correlating observations. Theories were ontological probes, instruments for ferreting out the fine structure of the natural world. In this sense, his view of the aim and function of theories and of the nature of theoretical terms could not be further from that of such positivists as Carnap, Schlick, and Reichenbach. There are other specific differences between Einstein's work and the methodology of the positivists. Compare, for instance, Popper's insistence that a theory isn't worth its salt until it's made very surprising predictions with the fact that most of Einstein's theories were put forward and accepted by him chiefly on the strength of those theories, on the ability of those theories to explain cases, facts, things about the world that were already known to be the case, not on the strength of their as yet untested ability to predict new things about the world. As late as 1917, more than a decade after propounding the special theory, for instance, Einstein could still maintain that the only empirical information which supported the special theory consisted of data that had been accumulated before it was advanced in 1905. So far as the general theory of relativity went, you've doubtless all heard the well-documented story that Einstein prior to Jean's expedition to South Africa to submit Einstein's theory to a new test, Einstein was relatively indifferent to the results. His claim was that on the strength of symmetry considerations, on the strength of mathematical analysis, on the strength of the ability of the theory of general relativity to explain a wide range of things that were already known, he was persuaded that the theory was sound. Far from doing what Popper would have him do, Einstein here, as elsewhere, voiced a high degree of indifference to the capacity of a theory to make surprising predictions. <clears throat> Equally, Einstein was quite prepared to accept theories which were ad hoc in Popper's sense. Indeed, Einstein's own special theory of relativity was itself, by the Popperian definition, ad hoc. If time allowed, we could explore further dissimilarities between the philosophy of science, which positivism espouses, and the kind of philosophy which is implicit in Einstein's work and explicit in his philosophical writings. But we already have here, 
or so it seems to me, sufficient evidence that there is a radical divergence between the physics of Einstein and the philosophy of logical positivism. Accordingly, I think the central challenge confronting those of us who take Einstein's work seriously, the central challenge is that of embedding what seems to be the wisdom of Einstein's practice as a scientist within an elaborate and carefully constructed philosophy of science, one capable of doing justice to Einstein's work. And this point becomes the more important when one realizes that the Einstein case is not the only anomaly. As much historical research has shown over the last two decades, virtually all of the important developments in science run squarely against the grain of the logical positivist analysis. There has been no, and I will stress that no, major scientific controversy. There has been no wide-scale scientific revolution which did not involve the intrusion of philosophical issues into the scientific decision-making process in ways which the positivists leave no room for. To give you just one very minor indication of the order of magnitude that's involved here, it's perhaps worth noting that more than 80 percent of the surviving Boyle and Newton manuscripts and fully one-third of Darwin's surviving notebooks deal primarily with the philosophical and theological problems generated by their scientific theories. Far from limiting their range of concerns to the question of what kinds of direct verifications are there for new theories, most of the major scientists in the past have been very much concerned to spell out the philosophical foundations of what they're doing. Thus, Einstein and his preoccupation with philosophical foundations, a preoccupation that comes up continuously in his work, he's the rule rather than the exception, which provides us all the more reason to say that if we are to have a philosophy of science that does justice to any of the major forms of science, let alone to science in its most sublime form, as we see it, for instance, in Einstein, then we need to start again. Like a number of others, I've tried to make some tentative moves in the direction of outlining an alternative philosophical view of what science is. I don't, unfortunately, have time this morning to do more than give you a very rudimentary sketch of this alternative to positivism. What I will do is to lay that sketch out in what time I have and then proceed to examine the degree to which it puts us in a position to make sense of Einstein's science and his scientific achievements more adequately than can logical positivism and logical empiricism. But before I set out that alternative, I want to stress that what's beginning to occur in my discipline, and by that I mean the systematic critique of positivism, is of much greater significance to the broader community than it might seem to be. On the surface, we have here nothing more than a family squabble among rival schools of philosophy. If that were all it amounted to, it would be neither surprising nor significant, since most philosophical quarrels, like many domestic ones, are of interest to none but the participants. But more is going on here than this. Many scientists in both the natural and the social sciences have accepted the positivist analysis of what science is as an authentic one. Although reluctant to call themselves by the label positivist, an increasing number of working scientists subscribe to a picture of science very like the positivist one I've just outlined. It's at this point that the ill fit between great science and the positivist caricature of it comes to be of more than merely academic interest. For if the positivist caricature is incapable, as I believe it is, of producing important scientific breakthroughs, and if growing numbers of scientists seek to mold their work to fit the positivist stereotype, then something's gone badly astray. What's needed, so I believe, is an account of scientific knowledge and scientific method which is likely to enhance rather than to inhibit the growth of science. The challenge, of course, lies in producing such an account. I've made myself some very tentative and piecemeal moves in that direction. 
which I'd like to discuss with you this morning. I begin with a central premise, one which goes squarely against the grain of the positivist's wish to distinguish science from everything else. That premise is that virtually all inquiry, all efforts at understanding and explanation, whether they be scientific, theological, political, moral, philosophical, or just commonsensical, all efforts at understanding share the same primary goals. They all aim to render sensible or intelligible our experience. Beyond understanding, all modes of inquiry are designed to enable us to foresee and to anticipate events and to provide economical aid de mémoire for quickly recalling and summarizing what we have experienced. These goals, the goals of economically representing what we've already been exposed to in the world, of understanding that world and of anticipating what's going to happen next, these goals are the goals of science, but they are equally the goals, I claim, of every other, every other form of human inquiry. Some disciplines are more successful in this task than others. That's doubtless true. But what's crucial for my purposes is that all inquiry is of a piece. <coughs> Moreover, precisely because every attempt at inquiry is concerned to make sense of experience, all theories, all doctrines, whether scientific or non-scientific, must be submitted to an empirical check. Systems of religion, systems of philosophy, political theories, as well as scientific ones, all must meet the necessary condition that they square with that range of experience which they purport to explain. In that sense, I want to argue that all disciplines, all areas of intellectual inquiry, are empirical. They are ultimately founded in experience. But to say as much may be misleading. For if it's the case that all ideas must be tested in the court of experience, there is another basic premise which seems to me to govern the construction of knowledge systems. That premise is an integrative one. It consists in the insistence that knowledge ideally is one. Knowledge is about the world, and any specific system of knowledge is about a small portion of the world about a subset of our experience. Since we have strong grounds for believing that the world itself is consistent, it follows that not only must it, each bit of knowledge be internally consistent, even the positivists would allow for that, but it follows much more importantly that we should attempt to integrate different modes of knowledge, for they're all forms of knowledge about the same world. Accordingly, in evaluating any theory, whether scientific or otherwise, we insist that the theory must not only be compatible with the appropriate experiments and observations that can be made in its particular domain, but moreover, we have to insist that the theory must be capable of fitting in with, of being compatible with, the best available theories in other areas of knowledge. To ignore this latter requirement, the integrative requirement, is to suggest that knowledge taken as a whole can be schizophrenic, disjoint, and inconsistent. Sometimes, of course, it is, but that's surely an undesirable state of affairs and one that ultimately we hope to move away from. The point I'm making, then, is simply this. Any theory, any claim about the world is simultaneously subject to two forms of analysis. Any claim about the world must simultaneously pass two rather different kinds of tests. On the one hand, within its particular knowledge domain, it must square with what we have come to know of the world. That is, it must fit our experience. But equally, any claim to knowledge must be compatible with the best available theories, beliefs, and doctrines in all other domains of inquiry and investigation. To use slightly more technical language, I'm proposing that every theory that is put forward, scientific or otherwise, is subject both to empirical and to conceptual constraints or checks. The empirical constraint is the more familiar of the two. Theories simply have to square with the available experimental evidence. But equally, 
theories are subject to important and profound conceptual checks. In particular, we expect of any theory of science or any theory of philosophy or any other discipline that it must be compatible with the best established theories in other domains, scientific and non-scientific. If such compatibility does not obtain, this is indicative of a serious weakness in our knowledge system, one that will ultimately have to be remedied. Historical research has made it transparently clear that in virtually all the major revolutions in the development of science, whether we talk about the Copernican Revolution or the revolution of Newton in the late 17th century, the Lyellian Revolution in geology or the Darwinian Revolution in biology, or come to that, the Einsteinian Revolution in physics, one common pattern persists. Theories, especially new revolutionary theories, are judged not only in terms of their ability to explain what is known in their domain about the world, but every bit as importantly, they are judged by a set of philosophical standards. They are judged by the degree to which they can be integrated within a coherent account of experience broadly conceived. They are judged by the degree to which they can be absorbed into a body of well-established philosophical doctrine. If a new scientific theory runs counter to a prevailing philosophical belief, the burden of proof is on the scientist to show either that his science can be reconciled with existing philosophical beliefs or else that something is desperately wrong with prevailing philosophy. For instance, when Newton first put forward his theory of physics, he had to show, he had to show, that there was a coherent account, a coherent philosophical account of space, time, force, and matter which could undergird the physics that he was proposing. When Darwin first developed his theory of biological evolution, it was clear to him and everybody else that he needed to work out a new philosophical theory of substance. Since Darwin's theory of what a species nature was did not fit with prevailing Platonic views about the nature of kinds and essences. But I want to stress that I'm doing more today at least I'm trying to do more today, than merely putting forward the contingent historical claim that as a matter of fact, philosophical and metaphysical issues have loomed large in the appraisal of scientific theories. I am saying not only that this process has occurred, I take that to be established almost beyond doubt, uh, not by my work, but by the work of serious historians of science. I'm saying not only that the process has occurred, but that it ought to occur that it is a part of the rationality of science that scientific theory should be judged along these two vectors, the empirical and the conceptual, and that the conceptual vector includes a philosophical exploration of the coherence and intelligibility of the concepts which a theory introduces. This view of science is radically at odds with the position of the positivists a position which suggested that the only thing relevant to the appraisal of a theory was the data which supported or refuted it. Beyond internal consistency and empirical support, everything else for the positivists was subjective, aesthetic, or conventional. In trying to suggest that conceptual as well as empirical factors play an extremely important role in the appraisal of scientific theories, I am manifestly not aiming to overthrow the view that science is an empirical activity, for I profoundly believe that it is. But science is empirical in a broad as well as in a narrow sense. What positivism and many scientists who have subsequently been influenced by positivism fail to perceive is that many of the philosophical doctrines often utilized as yardsticks for judging the adequacy of new scientific theories, many of those philosophical doctrines are themselves empirically well supported. Metaphysical and epistemological doctrines are no more and no less free creations than scientific theories are. All of them, science, metaphysics, and epistemology are influenced by and designed to be summations of our prior experience. That doesn't guarantee their truth, of course, 
but it does suggest that we can't simply ignore them. Take the case before us, that of Einstein. Over and over again, he reiterated his conviction that a scientific theory which ignores or runs counter to the claim that events are causally related, that such a theory is altogether unacceptable. Was this, as many of Einstein's critics have charged, just a prejudice, just a hangover from neo-Kantian metaphysics, just an unfortunate lapse in an otherwise impressive scientific achievement? It seems to me not so. The causal postulate, that is the claim that events have causes and that causes have determinable effects, <clears throat> that postulate, although certainly traditionally associated with metaphysics, is nonetheless a claim for which there was and is enormous empirical evidence. Virtually all of the things we see going around, going on around us within our experience provide constant exemplifications of the claim of causal interconnectedness. Thus, when Einstein finds quantum mechanics wanting, partly because of its failure to address itself to the causal question, he is not judging quantum mechanics by inappropriate a priori standards. He is rather, at least on my account, arguing that a large portion of our experience of the world provides enormous evidence for the claim of causal connectedness between phenomena. And he concludes from this that quantum mechanics is inconsistent or incompatible with an extremely well-established metaphysical generalization. Similar considerations apply, I think, to Einstein's arguments about the importance of symmetry and invariance factors. Over and again in his papers, particularly in the period from 1905 to 1917, Einstein will argue in favor of a particular theory or theoretical relationship because it exhibits certain symmetries. Is this just an a priori preference or merely an aesthetic judgment, as the positivists have suggested? It seems to me, again, the answer is no. The history of physics from at least the 17th century illustrates the degree to which Time and again, highly successful physical laws have been those which exhibited certain kinds of symmetries. Hence, when Einstein claimed that certain newly proposed theories of his had strong support, even prior to experimentally investigating, by virtue of the symmetries which they involved, his seemingly a priori philosophical argument or his seemingly aesthetic argument those arguments can be understood, it seems to me, as more or less straightforward extrapolations from experience, broadly conceived. A similar analysis could be given of Einstein's argument against Bohr on the incompleteness of quantum mechanics. Einstein adopts as a premise in that controversy the regulative principle that every theory should give a complete representation of physical reality within its domain. Because Einstein believed that the indeterminacy relations did not permit a complete quantal description, he saw this as a major liability in the prevailing version of quantum mechanics. Bohr's response, incidentally, which is going to be talked about in much greater detail later on today, was straight out of the positivist catechism. Bohr says to Einstein, the only way to show a formalism inadequate is to reveal either its logical consistency or to show that it doesn't fit the facts. Bohr simply will not concede that the fact that quantum mechanics contravenes several well-established philosophical principles should be given any weight in the analysis. What the Einstein case illustrates is that in philosophy, as in science, there are some well-established theories and bodies of doctrine for which there is weighty evidence and strong arguments. To ignore some well-established philosophical theory, provided it's genuinely well-supported, is as serious an intellectual sin as to ignore well-established scientific results. It was a virtue of the positivists to profess, at least in principle, the point that philosophy must take science seriously, and to urge that, in Reichenbach's language, philosophy must become scientific philosophy. But what all the positivists, and unfortunately many, many modern scientists too, fail to perceive is that the dependencies here are mutual 
and that a philosophically illiterate scientist is as much an idiot savant as a scientifically informed philosopher. My argument thus far has had two parts. I suggested, first of all, that it's a matter of historical fact that philosophical factors have played a major role in virtually every scientific revolution, including Einstein's. If we take the positivist account seriously, we have to conclude that most of the history of science has thus been a massively irrational activity since scientists have chronically let their judgment be influenced by factors which the positivists regard as unscientific. I then proceeded to outline, very briefly, a philosophy of science which would suggest that what has happened is in fact desirable. That is, that it is perfectly reasonable for scientists to attend to the philosophical foundations and implications and presuppositions of their work. Indeed, I've argued that failure to attend to these matters is itself unreasonable. I want now to try to state the case in a yet stronger form. I shall show that there are certain philosophical questions which it is literally impossible for a scientist, no matter how a philosophical he professes to be, to ignore. Let me begin with a very simple-minded illustration before I state the case in its most general form. Suppose we have a scientist, a biomedical researcher, let's say, <coughs> who is investigating whether a certain virus has caused a certain disease. The experiments which this scientist will regard as relevant to perform will depend decisively on his views about what the causal relation amounts to. If he subscribes to a Humean correlational view of causality, for instance, he will be satisfied so long as he can observe the presence of the given virus in every patient who has the disease and its absence in every patient who has not contracted it. If, on the other hand, the scientist subscribes to a more complex view of causation than the Humean one, he will not be content with the use of the methods of presence and absence. He will want to know, for instance, whether the virus is a byproduct of the disease or is etiologically related to its pathogenesis. The point is that any scientist who is investigating causal processes must willy-nilly have some views on the nature of the causal connection. Without such views, he has no idea what experiments to perform. Now, it just happens to be the case, of course, that there's a huge philosophical literature on causality. A scientist may, arguably at his peril, ignore that literature. But whether he looks to it or not, he will, by the experiments he devises and the conclusions he draws from them, be subscribing implicitly to a philosophical theory of causation. If this example illustrates the point, it doesn't prove it. For many scientists, especially many 20th century physicists, disavow any interest in causal explanation. But what scientists cannot disavow, and this takes me to my more general argument, what scientists cannot disavow is an interest in empirical evidence. Every theory must be submitted to the court of experience. Even the most uh, philosophically hostile scientist, I take it, will grant that. But experimental data don't come with flags attached to them, indicating the theory to which they are relevant. Indeed, the linkage between a theory and the data cited for it is often very indirect and based on a highly complex set of assumptions and inferences. And of course, the more sophisticated the science, the more complex will those linkages be. Before any scientist can determine even which experiments are relevant to the appraisal of his theories, he must have a theory of evidence, that is, an account of the circumstances in which one state of affairs in the world can be taken as evidence for or against a claim, a theoretical claim, about another state of affairs in the world. But a theory of evidence, without which you can't do science, a theory of evidence is unquestionably a philosophical matter, specifically a matter of logic and epistemology, or the theory of knowledge. It is the function of a theory of knowledge to specify, among other things, the circumstances under which one statement can be taken to be evidence for another. 
Philosophers have developed elaborate and highly sophisticated, even if sometimes sophistical, views on these subjects. Many scientists pride themselves on being blissfully ignorant of that literature. But that's rather like priding oneself on knowing no mathematics or on refusing to seek information. The scientist has no choice but to subscribe to some theory of evidence or other, for he can't do science without a theory of evidence. That much said, it's a small move to make to argue that the scientist should subscribe to the best theory of evidence available. If the theory of evidence to which a scientist implicitly subscribes is radically at odds with the best available theory of evidence which philosophers can produce, that indicates a serious deficiency in the system. Now, obviously, it's possible that the scientist's intuitive feel for what counts as good evidence might be more reliable than the philosopher's theories about what evidence is. And I would be the last to claim that philosophers have a monopoly on wisdom about such matters. But to whatever theory of evidence a scientist subscribes, he can defend and articulate that theory of evidence only, only by engaging in philosophical analysis. As we've seen then, one part of epistemology is concerned with clarifying the concept of evidence and is thereby essential to scientific inquiry. Another part of epistemology investigates goals and rational action, seeking to show what goals are appropriate for inquiry and what means are appropriate for achieving which goals. Because science is, like every other form of human action, a goal-directed activity, Scientists must select viable goals and achievable means, appropriate means, for achieving those goals. Is the scientist's goal truth? Is it predictive accuracy? Is it practical control over nature or some combination of these? The question is a crucial one, for divergences about such goals will lead to very conflicting choices about which theory should be preferred. Indeed, Einstein's long-standing feud with many defenders of quantum mechanics was in large measure a debate over the legitimate aims or goals of science. To resolve such questions about the aims of science is inevitably to engage, again, in epistemological analysis. For what is at stake is the choice of epistemic goals for science. Thus, with respect to decisions about evidence, with respect to the determination of appropriate methods of inquiry, with respect to the establishment of goals for scientific research, the scientist is continually and ineliminably engaged in philosophizing. It's this elementary point which the positivists and many of those scientists who subscribe to a positivist view have failed to come to terms with. The interpretation of literally every experiment the testing of every scientific theory rests upon and presupposes a prior resolution of some important philosophical issues. Those philosophical issues in turn have to be resolved in part by a study of the efficacy of scientific practice. Anyone who imagines that science can be done independently of philosophy, or vice versa come to that, is profoundly mistaken. Yet imagine it, they did and do. The positivists, along with such fellow travelers as Popper and Nagel, really believe that the appraisal and evaluation of scientific theories is entirely a matter of comparing the theories with the available data in some philosophically neutral way. The idea that one might judge theories by asking about their philosophical credentials or that one might criticize scientific theories by reference to their metaphysical or epistemological weaknesses, that idea was completely foreign to the whole positivist program. It's true, of course, that the positivists themselves were philosophers. They engaged in epistemological analysis. Under those circumstances, how can I claim that they gave epistemology short shrift? The answer is a complex one. Indeed, we could lecture about that for an hour, but I won't do that. Let me put it simply. Most of the empiricists and the positivists perceived their role as philosophers, as simply that of spelling out explicitly what was already implicit in scientific practice. The scientist, on their view, didn't need any epistemology since his own intuitions about these matters were veridical. 
The job of the epistemologist, as the positivist saw it, was a kind of mopping up operation. His task was to approach science as in a post-mortem, where the epistemic foundations already present in science are simply made explicit and opened up for everyone to observe. What the positivists didn't reckon with was the fact that scientists often disagree about what counts as evidence for a theoretical claim, and even more often disagree about how much weight to assign to a piece of evidence. Such disagreements, which are endemic in the scientific community, can only be resolved by philosophical analysis. Thus, philosophical analysis must be a continuing part of scientific development and scientific controversy rather than something to be applied after all the controvers controversies have been fully settled. In their commendable keenness to show that philosophy must be grounded in science, the positivists ignored the equally crucial role of philosophy in science. Their aim was to make science as independent of philosophy, at least philosophy as classically understood, as it possibly could be. I've tried to show this morning that the positivist attempt to excise philosophy out of science is wrong-headed. It turns out to be wildly at odds with the constitutive and regulative roles which philosophy in fact has played in science through its history. Still worse, it fails to represent the nature in which scientific claims about the world can be examined and authenticated. Where the positivists wanted to free science from its metaphysical and philosophical trappings, what is suggested here is that such a decoupling is neither desirable nor possible. The regulative principles of metaphysics, as well as the methodological doctrines of the theory of knowledge, are not readily dispensable. It's true, of course, and this is part of what lies behind the positivist attitude, that bad philosophy inspires bad physics. But there are at least two ways to do bad philosophy. One involves accepting wild and woolly speculative philosophical systems, which have little, if anything, going for them. The other way to build physics upon bad philosophy is by pretending that one doesn't have a philosophy at all, thereby adopting what is unquestionably the most naive philosophical position. The positivists and the empiricists were rightly alarmed about the former and struggled valiantly to keep to free science from pernicious metaphysical influences. But in so doing, they aided and abetted the latter by urging scientists to believe that experiment and consistency alone were sufficient grounds for choosing the right theory. The central point is this. Science and philosophy are on the same continuum. Both represent highly sophisticated attempts to explain the world both are judged by a mixture of empirical and conceptual checks. It's literally impossible to do either without making assumptions which belong to the other. Science, after all, is natural philosophy. Philosophy in its turn is ultimately meta-science. Any theory of science which suggests that philosophical doctrines have no role to play in science is as naive an account of, is as naive as an account of philosophy which suggests that philosophy has nothing to do with experience. I believe that Einstein saw the force of these interconnections. The positivists, the empiricists, and many contemporary scientists do not. If any doubts remain about the clarity with which Einstein perceived this point, I refer you to that marvelous passage in his autobiography where he remarks, and I quote, science without epistemology is, insofar as it's thinkable at all, primitive and muddled. That pregnant remark makes a fitting epitaph for positivism and I trust and hope a promising slogan for bringing to fruition the Einsteinian revolution in philosophy. Thanks very much.
Um, I want to begin this morning, I think, um, by adding some footnotes to um, the remarks that you've just heard um, by Larry Loudon. Um, Larry traced um, the development of positivist philosophy and um, contrasted what one might call the positivist style um, with the style of Einstein. Um, footnotes I have in mind are these. It's perhaps not um, so very well known that Einstein himself was um, involved with and to a certain extent responsible for um, the flourishing of positivism um, in the early part of this century. Um, he himself came out of an intellectual tradition that was highly influenced by his readings of Hume and Mach. Um, and Mach was, as it were, the original of the positivist philosophers. Um, but more than that, uh, Einstein was all his life at odds with um, the academic establishment, and especially the academic establishment in German-speaking countries. And um, one of the things that he saw happening there was a dominance um, in the philosophical faculties of people trained um, in the philosophy of Kant and Hegel. Um, Einstein's view of Hegel was roughly that this was a man who simply played with words. Um, and so he um, used his influence, um, Einstein did, whenever he could, um, to effect appointments into the philosophical faculties. And um, two of the appointments that he played a heavy role in um, engineering behind the scenes um, were the appointment of um, Schlick to his position at the University of Vienna. And of course, out of that grew the Vienna Circle and the whole circle of, um, of philosophical positivism. Um, and the other major um, European center of positivist philosophy was in Berlin and centered around um, um, the group um, um, headed by Reichenbach there. Um, and there, too, it was largely due to Einstein's interference and his prestige and influence that Reichenbach obtained a position in Berlin. So um, Einstein's involvement with, um, with the positivist movement um, was very strong. Um, Einstein himself, in his early um, writings, um, um, was certainly um, positivist in language, if not, uh, if not in, in deed, um, although he quickly grew to be disillusioned with positivism. And in his correspondence with Schlick, um, he remarks many times to Schlick that you're too positivistic for me. Um, the perhaps culmination of Einstein's reaction against positivism um, comes in a funny story that's told by Heisenberg. Um, I'm going to tell you in a moment about Einstein's quarrel um, with quantum mechanics. Um, and this was, in large part, a quarrel with Heisenberg and Bohr. And uh, Heisenberg put it to him at one point. Um, he said, look, um, I actually drew my methodology for this theory, which you now, now find so repugnant and so on, from your own analysis of space and time in your 1905 construction of the special theory of relativity. So how can you now turn on me and complain? And Einstein responded, well, you shouldn't repeat a bad joke. <laughs> um, all right, now to my topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Um, as Peter Barker says, there are two giants of physical theory in the 20th century, the theory of relativity and the theory of quantum mechanics. The theory of relativity is written largely in the hand of one man, and that man is Einstein himself. The theory of quantum mechanics in its earliest stages is also written almost entirely in the hands of Einstein. Most of the important conceptual breakthroughs um, in the early years, that is up until around 1915, um, were breakthroughs achieved by Einstein or breakthroughs achieved by taking off on the work of Einstein. Um, Einstein's work continued on quantum mechanics in a very significant way um, through the teens and into the early 20s with his development of the quantum theory of gases um, and with the theoretical machinery that this day um, gives us such wonderful inventions as lasers. Um, but around 1925, a new kind of theory emerged, the theory that we now call quantum mechanics, um, and now we can look at the period from 1900 to 1925 as a sort of historical relic. This is the period of groping around in the dark, setting up the problems and so on. And from 1925 onward, in the work of Heisenberg and Schrodinger, um, contributions of a theoretical sort by Bohr um, and other people, we get the flourishing of the theory that we now know as quantum mechanics. 
Now, um, by the, by the mid-20s, by 1925, let's say, Einstein was already the most famous um, scientist in the world and a scientist who had caught um, um, not only the popular imagination, but the imagination of the whole scientific community. And yet, increasingly, after 1925, we see the hand of Einstein being removed from the writings of science, being removed from the directorship of setting the guiding ideas um, for um, the developing work on quantum mechanics. And we see other people doing the work and Einstein fading very much into the background. So that um, in his later years, um, Einstein referred to himself as a relic. Um, and there's no doubt that although he, may, he, wa he uh, was certainly remained to be a, a kind of popular idol, a kind of hero, right, our white-haired um, grandfather that we all think of, in the public eye, in the scientific eye, um, Einstein was a nobody and a has-been. And that was his history from around 1930 onwards. Now, the problem that I set for myself several years ago was to um, ask myself, why? Why is it that this man, whose ideas made 20th century science as we know it, um, for the last 20, 25 years of his life, um, was a has-been and a relic, to use his own words. What happened? Um, well, there are several um, popular explanations um, about what happened to Einstein, and that's where I actually began my work, with the popular explanations. The first of these explanations that you can find threaded through the biographies, the Bernstein biography or the Clark biography or um, whatever is the latest um, faddish one, um, is the idea that, look, uh, around the time of the development of quantum mechanics, 1925, 26, Einstein was about 50 years old. Um, 50 years old may not seem like an ancient age to uh, you or me, um, young as we are. Um, but for a scientist, 50 years old is over the hill. And Einstein was over the hill, and he simply could not keep up with the pace of the development of new ideas. So one explanation is he didn't have it anymore intellectually. He suffered from a kind of intellectual hardening of the arteries. Well, anyone who takes a look at Einstein's work from 1925 onward, his theoretical work and technical work, if you study what he was reading, what lectures he was giving, um, what his participation was in the scientific life at Princeton, and so on, um, you'll readily um, be able to give the lie to that. I mean, Einstein understood the developments in quantum mechanics. He disagreed with them. Um, but there was no difficulty when he wanted to call on technical resources to talk the language of the quantum mechanicians that he could talk that language very well. In fact, um, often better than the quantum mechanicians themselves. So that explanation um, um, won't wash. Um, well, what else is there? Well, there's another popular explanation that um, Einstein's friend Max Born has proposed. Um, and that is that Einstein was trapped, as it were, um, in his own philosophical system, that Einstein had philosophical predilections um, that ran so much counter to the developing quantum mechanics that it necessarily put Einstein on the outside. Um, and that this was not a, a kind of physical argument or an argument that you could engage in, so to speak, rationally. It was an argument about, so to speak, innate or intuitive or um, super rational philosophical prejudices. And um, Larry Loudon mentioned the one that's most often mentioned, and that is that Einstein couldn't conceive, so we're told, of a theory in which causality and causal explanation didn't play a fundamental and primary role. And we all know the famous phrase that's out there on the bulletin boards and so on, God does not play dice with the universe. Things don't happen by chance. There must be causes and so on. Um, well, that's, a, that's actually a very interesting sort of speculation, and it's certainly correct that in the early years, up to around 1925 or so, Einstein placed a heavy role um, in his thinking about the development of physical theories on causal principles. Um, but no one can take a look at the correspondence and the later manuscripts without realizing that after 1925, and precisely because of the rise of quantum mechanics, Einstein moved farther and farther away from those ideas until by the end of his life, he's very frequently writing in the correspondence that the question of causality is not a primary philosophical or metaphysical question. It's not an attitude that we bring to the doing of science. The question of causality is simply the question, is the best scientific theory that we can have a or is it not? 
If it is a causal theory, then God favors causality, and so do I. And if it's not a causal theory, then God is against causality, and I'm with him. <laughs> um, and that would, but that, that's not a quote from Einstein, but let me tell you, that's exactly the way he would have put it. Um, so it was not, as we're very often told, that Einstein couldn't uh, understand or couldn't sympathize with the notion that God might play dice. Um, it is, in some sense, that he wasn't convinced yet that God was playing at dice. And um, I, I will um, go into that a, a little bit more. Well, if it's not that Einstein was intellectually over the hill, and if it's not that Einstein was trapped in some um, conservative, if not to say reactionary, system of philosophical ideas, then why is it that Einstein was increasingly isolated from the ongoing developments in quantum physics, from the um, fun and games played by the physics community, um, and from the participation in the direction of research? Um, well, um, I think that I can give you a, um, I think I can give you a short answer. And the short answer is a remark that Einstein makes in some of his correspondence with one of his oldest friends, Michel Besso, who helped him in the patent office in the, in the early years when he was thinking about relativity. And somewhere late in the correspondence, Einstein remarks to Besso, you know, physicists have no capacity for logical and philosophical thought. And I think, in fact, that's the secret. Einstein was as much a philosopher as a scientist, probably would not himself have recognized any important distinction um, between those capacities. And he was increasingly frustrated in, in his last years because he could not carry what he thought were logical and substantial arguments to the scientific community in a way that would get an appropriately rational response from the community. And indeed, what happened to Einstein is a very interesting sociological phenomenon within science itself, and in fact, within any, any kind of institution. And it's precisely this. A man of very powerful position who takes it upon himself to criticize from the outside um, a series of significant developments within the institution um, very often calls on himself the wrath of the institution itself. And what happens is that bad stories begin to get spread um, among scientists themselves. These stories are told from the scientists to their students. The best students are discouraged from consulting the works of the man or from working with the man himself. And eventually, over a long enough period of time, the man finds himself isolated from the institution. Now, it's not very difficult, actually, to trace precisely that process in Einstein's case. That is, to find out who said what about him to whom, and on what occasions were the brightest students told, oh, look, don't read what Einstein has to say about this because he doesn't know what he's talking about, or he's trapped in philosophical ideas, or he doesn't understand the new mathematics, or whatever. And very often, the advice was well taken. Now, there are two ways to look upon the phenomenon. One way is to say, well, look, this is scientific dogmatism. Isn't it horrible, right? Um, and I think that's the way some people respond. But there's another way to look on it. Um, in the early days, quantum mechanics was a powerful theoretical tool, but it was still um, in need of very much nourishment, articulation, development, and protection. And part of what the scientific community did is they formed a guard around the fledgling theory. And they said, look, Einstein, keep away. If we pay serious attention to your criticisms at this particular period of time, then we cannot get on with the work of developing our theory. Okay? So we will defend it. We won't let our students talk to you, and so on. And that kept up until roughly the mid-1950s, at which point um, quantum theory was so well developed that it actually began to degenerate. And beginning around the mid-1950s, um, what happens in science is we find that the real important scientific advances are harder and harder to make, that the development and articulation of the quantum theory has reached its zenith, and one does not know how to go on anymore. And at that point, the scientific community looks back over its shoulder and says, hey, look, years ago, this guy Einstein was making some criticisms. Maybe we should look back now and ask what they were, and maybe in terms of what they were, we can get some guidelines for how to proceed. So now those of us in the philosophical business are in a very good time because the scientific community is open, no longer has to be afraid and protective, um, and willing to listen to some criticisms. Well, let me then um, sketch out for you what the form of Einstein's criticisms were. 
Um, in order to understand Einstein's critique of quantum theory, we have to go back to the early days around the turn of the century and, um, and look and see what the physical problem was. Okay? Now, problems in physics are always very many. They're technical problems, they're experimental problems, and so on. But it just is the case that from around 1905, when Einstein first raised it to the consciousness of the scientific community, until 1925 or so, there was one problem that was the dominant problem in physics. Excuse me. Hey, Dr. Dealey told me to tell you to come over here to our classes, 106. <laughs> Why don't you just um, take a seat? No, I'm in his class. He sent me over here just to let you know that everything's all right. OK. <laughs> um, I've just been assured that everything's all right. So. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want to write on the blackboard. <laughs> what was the fundamental problem that Einstein raised to the scientific consciousness? The problem was very simple. It's the problem known as wave <coughs> particle duality. And I will um, tell you very briefly what the wave particle duality is. It's the following problem. It turns out that the material universe around us um, presents itself to us under two different aspects. Sometimes it presents itself under the aspect of sort of hard, grainy, particle-like whatevers. We think here of atoms and molecules and stuff of that kind. And sometimes it presents itself to us under the aspect of waves. We think of water waves and sound waves and waves of light, light rays and so on. Okay? And the fundamental question is this. What is nature fundamentally? Is it particle-like or is it wave-like? And what Einstein's work in the early part of this century demonstrated, um, and this came to fruition in 1923 with the work of de Broglie, was that in every single case it appears that we have both a particle-like aspect and a wave-like aspect. And how are we to reconcile these two, or better still, how are we to construct a picture or an account of nature that will explain to us why nature does always wear these two garments? Okay? And that's the problem of the wave-particle duality. And a great deal of work in physics in the early part of the century was trying to articulate ideas and theories and hypotheses which would trace the wave-particle duality and perhaps help us to understand and account for it. Okay? Now, how do you deal with the problem um, of this magnitude? Well, you deal with it in, by means of a particular sort of, sort of technique. So let me, let me give that a name, too. The way you deal with the problem um, is that you construct a scientific theory more general than the theories that went beforehand that somehow wraps the problem up for you, enables you to understand the phenomena that you're trying to understand. Now in Einstein's hands, this what I've called here generalizing theory construction was a very strict procedure. It was the procedure that he sometimes referred to as the method of theoretical physics. And it had two components. One component was this. You begin with an analysis of the concepts that are bothering you. If you're interested in waves and particles and matter and mass and so on, energy, whatever it is, you begin with the analysis of those concepts. All right? This is the technique that ties Einstein to positivism. This is the technique that he learned from Mach and he learned from Hume, that we begin with the analysis of concepts. In particular, we begin by asking, how do these concepts relate to our experience? And when you do that in a careful way, what you find is that the scientific concepts you're working with are not so strictly related to experience. Indeed, they're not so strict and well-defined as you might have thought. So the outcome of the first procedure is that you find room for maneuvering around in between the concepts, as it were. Okay? 
The second part of the procedure is a theory which generalizes the concepts, which extends the concepts into the domain where they were not extendable before, and which enables you to ask questions that you couldn't phrase precisely um, previously. So you don't stick with the concepts you have. You analyze them in order to generalize them. And the vehicle for that is a scientific theory. And this is where Einstein breaks with positivism because positivism had no truck with this generalizing function. Positivism stopped with the analysis of concepts and had nothing creative um, to add to it. There's a wonderful remark of Einstein's um, about that. It's in connection with um, his correspondence um, on Mach, who was also an advocate of this kind of analysis of concepts. And he wrote to a friend, you know what I think about Mach's little horse? It is useful only for exterminating vermin. Okay? That is, it's useful only in the analytical side to show you what might be wrong um, with a set of concepts, but it has no use for getting you anywhere. That has no constructive use whatsoever. Okay? Now, so if the problem is the wave particle duality, then we want an analysis of the concepts of waves and particles and the related concepts of energy and force and momentum and so on. Um, and then we want to generalize those concepts by means of a theory. Now, this whole procedure is guided by a very interesting overriding principle, um, and I want to call your attention to it. It's the principle that I call the principle of an unmasking epistemology. And what I mean by an unmasking epistemology is just this. Nature comes to us veiled or masked. The scientist's task is to strip off the mask and to find out what's really there behind the mask so that we never take appearances and brute observations for granted. We always look behind. We look for the real person behind the dress. Okay. So the guiding principle is, let's, so if you put these, these together, you have a technique. Right? If the problem is the wave-particle duality, then we want an analysis of the concepts that enter into that, and we want a theory that generalizes those concepts to do what? To tell us what things are really like. Okay? They come to us sometimes dressed as waves and sometimes dressed as particles. What is nature really like? What is matter really like? And that's the guiding principle behind the theoretical construction. So now put yourself back in 1925. Um, all kinds of experimental results demonstrate without any doubt the existence of the wave-particle du duality. De Broglie comes along and gives us a way of formulating that duality, describing it very precisely, handling it mathematically. Okay? And what we're looking forward to is an unmasking theory construction, a theory construction that will tell us where to bend and twist and extend our concepts so as to find out what's really going on when things come dressed, come dressed as waves or when things come dressed as particles. And what do we find? We find the development in 1925 of the theory of quantum mechanics. Okay? And the question is, does quantum mechanics solve the problem by means of the technique in accordance with the principle? And the answer in every case is no. Quantum mechanics does not solve the problem of wave-particle duality. It does not employ as a technique a generalizing theory. Um, and it, and it um, comes along with a, with a philosophy that is antagonistic to the unmasking epistemology. Um, I'll demonstrate all of that for you in a moment. Um, I want to make two remarks about it before I do. First remark is about um, why does quantum mechanics not, why is quantum mechanics not a generalizing theory in the appropriate sense? It's a very powerful theory. Why is it not a generalizing theory? The answer is very interesting. The theory is not a generalizing one for the following reason. It is an inherent part of quantum mechanics that the basic concepts employed in the theory are identically the same as the concepts of classical physics. That is, when we learn quantum mechanics, we do not learn a new set of concepts. We learn some new mathematical technique. But the concepts are the concepts of classical physics. And this is the root guiding principle, the basis of quantum mechanics. And whenever it was suggested to the founders of quantum mechanics, to Heisenberg and especially to Bohr, that one might try to construct a theory that was really radically new, 
that didn't simply employ the old concepts in roughly the old ways, um, Bohr's response was invariably the same. It was a philosophical response. And it was, human beings do not have the capacity to think except in the terms of classical physics. We have no recourse but to stick within that framework. So quantum mechanics is built on an essentially conservative strategy, conserve the classical concepts. And that means it cannot be a generalizing theory in the proper sense. It cannot uh, enable us to ask questions to nature um, that we could not ask before. It only enables us to ask the same old questions again. Okay? Um, so that's one sense. The other sense is um, why, why is... Um, why is the philosophy of quantum mechanics antithetical to this unmasking epistemology? Well, the answer is uh, the one that Larry Loudon's told us about already. The philosophy of quantum mechanics is positivism in a very strict way. The philosophy of quantum mechanics is precisely this. A theory is good insofar as it achieves predictive success and nothing more can be asked of a theory than that. That's the guiding philosophy, but that's not the unmasking epistemology. Because the unmasking epistemology is a stance towards nature that says, nature has secrets hidden from us. And what we want our theories to do is to give us some glimpse into, as Einstein would say, the secret of the old one. Now, why does quantum mechanics not work to explain the wave-particle duality? Okay, let me just explain to you very quickly. It'll take me about um, three or four minutes, and, um, and I think you can see why it was that Einstein was so dissatisfied with the theory. Typical experiment in quantum mechanics goes like this. We have a source of particles, and we send them through some kind of an apparatus, and we detect them over here. All right, so we have a typical experiment. We have a source of something or other. It goes through some machinery, and we detect the results over here. That's a typical schema for an experiment. Now, what's the problem? Well, one problem is simply the predictive one. If I give you information about the source, OK, and I tell you what this experimental arrangement consists of, um, what wheels and dials and machinery is in here, and what the chemical and physical constitution of the detectors are, all right, and I tell you what the source is spitting out over here, then we have the following predictive problem. Can you predict for me what's going to be detected over here? Okay, we'll get a certain pattern that will arise. Can you tell me the pattern? Okay, now what quantum mechanics does is it solves that problem absolutely perfectly. There is no theory known to man, I think, that solves that kind of problem better than quantum mechanics does. Okay? But that might not be all that we're interested in. What we might be interested in is a somewhat different question. Can you not merely predict what's going to happen, but either before it happens or afterwards, if you like, can you explain to me why the things coming out of this source in the way that you've said um, give rise to that pattern? Okay? And there, quantum mechanics has nothing to say. But what it has nothing to say about is precisely the wave-particle duality. Because in a typical experiment of the kind that I have in mind, um, the only reasonable way to conceptualize the experiment is that we have a source of particles here. And we detect particles over here. Because, for example, if this is a photographic plate, we might detect little dark spots. And we know that's the spot where an atom or molecule or whatever it was hit the plate. Or we have a Geiger counter, and we might hear clicks. And each click is the click where a particle interacts with the machinery of the Geiger counter. So the source emits particles, and the source collects, and the detection collects particles. But in between, if we want to get any picture at all of what's going on, it looks like we have to conceptualize things as waves. Particles come out here, they convert themselves to waves in a way that we don't understand. They behave like waves, and then they're collected up here on the other end like particles. Now, this is a typical account of wave-particle duality. And what does quantum mechanics have to say? Quantum mechanics has to say this. You tell me what's going on here, and I will tell you what's coming out over there. But don't ask me what's going on in between, and don't ask me about the interface here and here, because I have nothing to say about it. 
And since I'm a positivist and I want to be a positivist, and since I have not can predict whatever you want to predict, you shouldn't ask those questions at all. So the philosophy of quantum mechanics is an essentially conservative philosophy. I'm very tempted to say it's a reactionary philosophy. It's the philosophy that says, where my theory can't give you the answers, you'd better not ask questions. Okay? <laughs> now, Einstein probed the theory very, very um, severely, severely enough to know in his, settle in his own mind that it was a perfectly remarkable and splendid theory that its predictive success was uncanny, and as Einstein sometimes put it, there's no question that any future developments in physics will have to incorporate the quantum theory as a limiting case. We've got to maintain that same kind of predictive success. But Einstein himself was not happy with this strategy of don't ask questions, right? And it wasn't because he had a predilection for causality, but he had a predilection for the intelligibility of nature, right? Um, Einstein thought, often expressed this in terms of God. He thought, well, God is malicious. I mean, God, I'm sorry, God is devious but not malicious. This is the sign that hangs up in Fine Hall at Princeton. God is devious but not malicious. And what he meant was, God hides nature behind a mask, okay? But he's not malicious. He hasn't hidden nature so well that we can never get a glimpse of her. And there, then, is the fundamental disagreement between Einstein and the quantum mechanicians and the reason why Einstein stayed out of the developments of quantum mechanics. Because he had laid out a program which was a respectable program for the development of physics, and quantum mechanics met it nowhere, at no particular place. Not philosophically, not in terms of theory construction, and most fundamentally, not in terms of addressing the physical problems of intelligibility or explanation that generated the whole thing. Um, <coughs> it's, um, it's hard to close a lecture on Einstein, um, except um, to repeat um, his own words. And, um, um, towards the end of his life, Einstein realized that his own struggle to provide a better theory than quantum mechanics was a failure. Um, he was not terribly unhappy with that, um, and he remarked in one of his last letters um, that um, it's very difficult um, to make advances in science if one is not willing to remain on the surface. And the implied criticism is very clear. It's the quantum mechanicians who are willing to remain on the surface. Thank you. I'm only 48% of the team. Right. Hmm. Let's see. Does anyone know how to turn this on? Doesn't come on. What's the plug? You go ahead. All right. The story of how Einstein got from the special to the general theory of relativity is one of the most fascinating and, and dramatic stories in all of the history of science. To give you a little of the uh, flavor, I'm going to read uh, some excerpts from Einstein's uh, correspondence. The first uh, letter was written in October of 1912 to uh, Sommerfeld. At the moment, Einstein wrote, I'm working solely on the problem of gravitation. One thing is certain that never in my life have I worked so hard. Compared to this problem, the original theory of relativity is mere child's play. 
Part of the difficulty lay in the nature of the problem itself and part in self-imposed obstacles. Einstein went down a number of false trails before discovering the one which led to what we now know as general relativity. For example, for over two years, he tried to work with non-generally -gener covariant field equations. For, for two or three years, he believed that some sort of natural uh, causality uh, requirement was incompatible with general covariance. All right. Can, can people in the back uh, hear me? Good. Okay. All right. As, as long as it's pointed at what you're talking. All right. Uh, when the final solution was achieved at the end of 1915, Einstein was unable to contain his feelings of relief and joy. To his friend Besso, he wrote, my most audacious dreams have been fulfilled. And later, he urged Besso to read his papers on the gravitational field equations for, quote, they bring the final relief from the misery. And to Sommerfeld, he wrote that the general theory was the most priceless find I've made in my life. Well, this morning, I'll try to describe some of uh, Einstein's initial steps towards the relativistic theory of gravitation, stopping uh, at the year 1912. Now, that, that's a rather unfortunate uh, uh, stopping place uh, in a way because a lot of the excitement and drama of the story comes in the last three years. But, but unfortunately, the, the story also becomes quite technical after that point because uh, it, it involves the tensor calculus. Uh, in uh, 1907, uh, while writing a review article on the principle of relativity, Einstein was struck with what he later called the happiest thought of my life. The thought contained the germ of his famous principle of equivalence, according to which a rest system with a homogeneous gravitational field is physically equivalent to a uniformly accelerated frame. The heuristic value of the principle was demonstrated by deriving from it a prediction of a redshift in the solar spectral lines. But Einstein didn't pursue the subject uh, in 1907, and four years elapsed until he once again returned to the problems of combining relativity and gravitation. In 1911, the principle of equivalence was coupled with the Doppler principle to produce another prediction in, uh, of the redshift. But this time, Einstein noted that the effect seemed to involve an absurdity. For if there's a constant transmission of light from the source to the receiver, in Einstein's little diagram, uh, S2 is the, the source of light, S1 is the receiver. If, if there's a constant transmission of light from the source to the receiver, how can any number of periods per second arrive at the receiver than are emitted at the source? With the aid of hindsight, we know that the redshift constitutes an argument for the curvature of space-time. Einstein's resolution, however, in, in 1911, focused on the only element of the situation he could then see open to adjustment, namely the rate of clocks. He reasoned that since the process in question is a stationary one, the time must be so defined that the number of wave crests between the source and the receiver is constant in time, and therefore that the rate of clocks which measure this time must be adjusted so that a clock at one gravitational potential runs at a different rate than a clock at a point with a different gravitational potential. The, uh, it, it seems to follow from this that the velocity of light becomes a variable quantity in the presence of gravitation. And this, in turn, seems to undermine one of the cornerstones of Einstein's uh, special theory of relativity. Einstein did not shy away from this radical consequence, but rather embraced it and tried to make it the basis uh, of a further uh, prediction, namely the bending of light by a massive body. Though the numerical value of the predicted bending he got in 1911 was only uh, one half of the final, uh, of the correct value given by the final theory. The following year, in 1912, Einstein attempted to build a theory of, of the static gravitational field around the concept of a variable speed of light. But before turning to that theory, uh, uh, I want to just describe uh, one other development, which was to uh, profoundly 
uh, affect Einstein's ideas uh, about uh, the nature of the gravitational field. In 1909, uh, Max Born proposed a criterion for uh, rigid motion in the relativistic setting. Uh, the following year, it was proved uh, that uh, a rotating relativistic motion must take place with a constant angular velocity. And th this is a quite a counter counterintuitive result, at least if one is, is uh, beginning with Newtonian in intuitions, because we know that in classical mechanics, a rigid body can rotate with a variable angular uh, velocity. Well, uh, there, were, there was quite a bit of uh, technical discussion, but even before uh, the appearance of various technical papers, Paul Ehrenfest had described a simple thought experiment which illustrated some of the, uh, some of the central points. So here's uh, Ehrenfest's uh, con construction, which uh, became known uh, in the literature as Ehrenfest's paradox. Uh, let's imagine, uh, or suppose for sake of contradiction, that we can have a cylindrically symmetric rigid body uh, which is originally at rest with, uh, with respect to some uh, inertial frame uh, and which is later set into rotation. So we have a uh, before and after picture. Okay. Now measure the uh, circumference of the cylinder before rotation begins and then measure the circumference after rotation begins, okay? And do the same for the radius. Well, every, uh, every element of the periphery of the rotating cylinder is, is subject to a Lorentz contraction. So we should get the result that C prime, the circumference of the cylinder uh, after rotation begins is smaller than the circumference C before rotation begins because of the, the Lorentz contraction effect. On the other hand, since elements lying along the radial direction uh, of the cylinder don't experience any Lorentz contraction, we should also have the result that R prime, the radius after rotation begins, is equal to R, the radius before rotation begins, okay? But uh, these two conditions lead to an obvious contradiction unless the value of the constant pi changes. Okay. Well, up to 1912, Einstein's only published contribution to the discussion of the Ehrenfest paradox was to reject the su suggestion that the paradox could somehow be dissolved by treating the Lorentz contraction as an apparent rather than a real effect. Einstein argued that the physically real phenomenon. At some point, however, Einstein saw that a distinction must be made between rigid bodies and abstract uh, rigid motions. The former do not find a happy home in relativity theory. Indeed, it's best just, just to uh, drop the notion of rigid body altogether in relativity. But uh, abstract rigid motions can be treated along the lines suggested by Born. And then what Einstein saw was that the reality of the Lorentz contraction, together with Ehrenfest's construction as applied to an abstract rotating reference frame, strongly suggest that the spatial geometry of this frame is non-Euclidean, or to put it somewhat more paradoxically, that the value of the constant pi must change. Though we don't know when Einstein uh, first followed this line of reasoning, we know that it came no later than, than the first months of, of 1912 because it's mentioned explicitly in, in a paper which Einstein sent to the uh, Annalen der Physik in, in February. Lesser minds shied away from such radical consequences. Thus, in an article in, in the Philosophical Magazine, I, I should explain the the Philosophical Magazine was not a, uh, a journal for philosophers, rather it was a physics journal. Uh, uh, in an article in the, physical, in the Philosophical Magazine, Donaldson instead argued that a rotating disk must buckle into a cusp-like form, for they wrote, if the disk were considered remaining plain, we should have, owing to the lessening of the circumference and the invariability of the radius, a change in the value of the constant pi, whereby we are transformed to a real curved space. 
and shying away from such a radical consequence. They contented themselves with trying to compute what uh, shape the uh, uh, disk would buckle into. Well, despite this new and fundamental insight about the need for non-Euclidean geometry, Einstein chose to work uh, within the confines of Euclidean geometry. And his 1912 investigation had as its first aim that of finding how the velocity of light varies with position in a uniformly accelerated frame whose, whose geometry is assumed to be Euclidean. The principle of equivalence would then be used to conclude that a similar behavior of, of light is exhibited in the, in the corresponding static gravitational field. And this behavior would in turn suggest the form of the field equations to be expressed as a differential equation for the variable quantity c, the, the velocity of light. Um, at first, Einstein was pleased by his initial results. To his, to his friend Paul Ehrenfest, he wrote, the investigations of the statics of gravitation are complete and please me very much. I really believe I found the piece of the truth. His pleasure was to evaporate a few months later. With a mixture of puzzlement and consternation, he wrote again to Ehrenfest in June that it seems that the principle of equivalence can be valid only for infinitesimal fields. Why the principle of equivalence fails for finite fields is not yet clear to me. What worried Einstein uh, most was that there seemed to be no way to adjust his field equations to satisfy uh, both the principle of equivalence and the principle of action and reaction. Later that year, Max Abraham published a vicious attack on Einstein's entire theory and the equivalence principle in general, uh, in, in particular. Uh, Einstein responded with a programmatic defense of his principle and a plea for help. He wrote, the principle of equivalence offers an interesting perspective according to which the equations of relativity theory that includes gravitation should be invariant under accelerated and rotational transformations. To be sure, the path to this goal appears to be difficult indeed. I beg every colleague to investigate this difficult problem. Abraham was unmoved by Einstein's plea and his rejoinder was almost contemptuous. Einstein, he wrote, begs credit for tomorrow's relativity and calls upon his colleagues to guarantee it. One would like to be able to say that this thoroughly nasty man was wrong, but the truth is that his criticisms of Einstein's 1912 theory uh, were near the mark. I, I, I should explain uh, for those who perhaps uh, haven't heard the name Abraham before that Abraham was not a nut. He was, in fact, a first-rate uh, scientist, but his uh, rather abrasive personality made it uh, impossible, uh, impossible for him to get a regular academic uh, position in Germany. He finally uh, did obtain a position at, at the University of Milan in Italy, and uh, when an acquaintance uh, wrote to him to ask how he was getting along there, he's reported to have replied, uh, okay so far because I haven't yet learned how to speak Italian. Abraham <laughs> uh, uh, had developed his own theory of gravitation in 1912. Uh, Einstein liked it not at all. To various friends he wrote that Abraham's theory was a monstrosity and a magnificent steed lacking only three legs. Uh, one of the things that Einstein disliked most about this monstrosity was that it reintroduced something very much like the ether or absolute space. Abraham's approach to gravitation proved not to be fruitful, but at least Abraham did have a coherent theory in 1912. Einstein, on the other hand, had ideas which in the long run proved to be more fruitful, but in 1912 he had no coherent theoretical setting for them. Well, not, not only did Einstein not have a coherent theory in 1912, he was not even in possession of the mathematical tools needed to construct one. All of his early scientific triumphs had been achieved without the help of any advanced mathematics. And he confessed that he had viewed the subtler part of mathematics as, quote, a pure luxury. And he referred to himself half-jokingly 
and I think also half seriously as a mathematical ignoramus. In this setting, the failure of Einstein's 1912 theory had a negative importance that ought not to be underestimated. In 1912, there were, se there were several forces pressing Einstein towards the study of the absolute differential calculus and towards the idea that gravity itself might create a, a dynamic four-dimensional geometry. But it seems probable that a general sense derived from the failures of his 1912 theory that the entire business of relativistic principles needed reconceiving was the key factor in convincing Einstein that mathematics could no longer be viewed as a luxury. Later that year, we find him studying the tensor calculus under the tutelage of his old friend and now new colleague, Marcel Grossmann. Several years of wandering, lost in the tensors, followed. Only Einstein, graced with that special power to hit the right path despite every misdirection, could have found his way out. Uh, and now following author uh, Fine's principle that the only way to end a talk uh, on Einstein is to uh, quote a remark from Einstein. I'll, I'll quote one of, one of my favorite remarks, uh, although I'm not, not sure it's relevant to anything uh, I've said or anything anyone else has said. Uh, the uh, remark uh, comes from uh, Einstein's preface uh, to uh, Anton Reiser's uh, biography. Reiser was the pseudonym that Einstein's uh, son-in-law used. And at the beginning of the preface, Einstein says some, somewhat tongue-in-cheek that this book was written by a man who knows me well, and he attests to the accuracy of the facts reported in the book. But then he goes on to say, what has perhaps been overlooked in this book is the irrational, the inconsistent, the droll, even the insane, which nature, inexhaustibly operative, implants in an individual seemingly for her own amusement. But these things are singled out only in the crucible of one's own mind. Should we take? There was quite a lively uh, discussion of Okay, where would you like this? I don't care. How's that? It's pretty good. Oh, I'll talk about this thing. I'll probably overstress it. In John Ehrman's first slide, uh, that you all remember very, very vividly, I'm sure, there was a series of dates and a series of principles and sort of approaches and things that he discovered in those particular years. Most of those things are principles, principles of equivalence, the principle of the Doppler shift, the special principle of relativity. These various things that are called principles um, were very, very important in Einstein's thinking. They were important in getting him off the track up until the time when, when and Professor Ehrman finished in 1907 or so, they were also important in keeping him on the track to the completion of the theory in 1915 and 1916. Um, there are, in fact, four of these principles that people still talk about, and they talk a lot about them. Even physicists, um, who are not supposed to worry about things like principles, do talk about them. Um, they're called the principle of equivalence, which he mentioned several times, the principle of general covariance, which is a, an, oppose, an imposing name, which I'll explain in a second. It's a very simple concept. Um, Mach's principle, which is named after this man, Mach, that we've talked about before with his little horse that can only, that, that can only exterminate vermin. Um, this is one of those principles which exterminated a lot of vermin. Um, and then the principle that I want to talk about today, which is called the general principle of relativity. Now, 
It's just in, it's indubitable that these principles were vastly important in leading to the final form of the theory. Einstein got so confused, as John says, he got lost in the tensors for five years, essentially. It's only a kind of a, of a marvelously intuitive adherence to these principles that got him out of the mathematics and back into the sort of clear um, conceptual aspects of the physics. So no one can deny the dramatic and important, the dramatic importance, the vast, almost, um, uh, just almost fundamental importance of these principles in getting to the final form of the theory. But the final form of the theory is, of course, different from what everything, everything that came before it. That's why it's called the final form. And there remains the question of whether principles which were vital in leading to the theory turn out to be true in the final form of the theory. Now you can say, well, of course they've got to be true. I mean, if they're the things that got you to the theory, how could they possibly not be true when you finally get there? But it turns out to be not quite that clear, because the people who write down theories generally um, don't have a completely sophisticated, mathematically sophisticated, utterly clear idea of what they're about. If they did, there wouldn't be much happening in the theory after it was written down for the first time, and that's not true. The theory is written down and then all sorts of interesting things happen and then all the sort of the lesser folk who couldn't figure it out in the beginning have something to do. They can sort out the implications of it, sort of tidy it up and, and package it neatly and market it to the American public or the universal public. Um, and that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to do um, now. Um, the job of dealing with these principles in the final form of the theory is of getting incredibly mathematically clear about what they say. You want to write down any sort of concepts that, have to, that are in the principle in as mathematically a rigorous form as you can, get the theory written down in as mathematically a rigorous form as you can, and prove almost, although not quite, um, like a theorem in mathematics, that the principle is true in the theory. Um, that's very tricky. And um, it seems to me to be the case that for hardly any of these principles, save perhaps for the principle of general covariance, can you really do that. And even in the case of the principle of general covariance, it doesn't do the job it was supposed to do. Okay, that's by way of introduction. Now let me say a little bit about what these principles are. Well, not, not really only covariance and, um, and relativity principles. The relativity principle that Einstein takes to be embodied in the final form of the general theory, or that got him there, is supposed to be an extension and a generalization of what's called the special principle. So you've got the special principle in the special theory, and the general principle in the general theory. And the general theory is, um, among other reasons why it's general, more general than the special theory, because it embodies the general principle. All the words sort of go together like that. So what, is these, what are these principles of relativity? Well, roughly, um, um, the special principle of relativity says something like, um, the laws of physics look the same regardless of what state of motion you look at them in. Um, except that the states of motion are kind of prescribed. They're only sort of unaccelerated states of motion. States of motion where you don't feel any forces. States of uniform motion, or as physicists say, inertial states of motion. So the special principle is the laws of physics should look the same as viewed from all inertial states of motion. And this principle, in this formulated in more or less this way, is a valid principle for Newtonian theories and for, and for theories in special relativity. And it even does some work for you there. There are certain kinds of Newtonian theories, such as the Newtonian theory of the electromagnetic field, in which the special principle of relativity is not valid. So that gives us a cleaver, and we can cleave that theory off and say, rotten theory, we don't like it. So the principle of special relativity is supposed to distinguish those theories which are good from those theories which are bad. And all the good theories um, satisfy it. And all the good Newtonian theories and um, theories in special relativity. Well, the general principle of relativity is supposed to be a generalization of that, removing the restriction from uniform states of motion, inertial states of motion, to every state of motion that you like. The laws of physics in our general theory have got to be such that they look the same regardless of the state of motion from which you look. Every state of motion is equivalent with respect to the laws of physics. And that's going to be a prescription for writing down the laws of physics. It's in that sense that he was pushed to the particular laws that he wrote down in the general theory. He needed laws which looked the same regardless of how they were looked at, regardless of how accelerated 
um, the, the state of motion from which they were looked at was. Okay. Um, his sort of, he was never really clear about exactly what he meant by the laws of physics or just what it is for the laws of physics to look the same. One thing that Einstein said at various times in his life was it's sufficient for this principle to hold if the laws in their coordinate expression, a law of physics is just something, you know, some, very, some, some functional relationship between various kinds of physical parameters, and these things are often written down in coordinate expressions, and if the laws that you write down have the same form in all coordinate expressions, then that's enough to guarantee that, that the general principle of relativity holds. If you write down the laws of a theory in their coordinate form, and you write them down in any other coordinate form, and they look the same, then that theory satisfies the, special, the general principle of relativity. The view is, of course, that since the state of motion sort of determines a set of coordinates, then if the laws are invariant under all um, switches of coordinates, then they're going to be invariant under all switches from, frame, from states of motion. Well, that's fine, and that's true. It's true in general relativity. The laws of general relativity are such that you can express them in any coordinate system you like, and they look the same every time. But the trouble is, you can also write down the laws of Newtonian theories and special relativistic theories in the same way. Um, that was not the way, the popular way for writing them down at the time in 1912, but we know how to do it now. You can write them down in a particular way in what are called tensor equations, and these equations literally look the same no matter what the coordinate system. In fact, they don't even mention coordinates, so of course they're going to look the same. That principle that the laws hold good in all coordinate systems is what's called general covariance roughly speaking. So interpreting, the, running together, the general principle of relativity and the principle of general covariance does a disservice to Einstein's intuitions with the principle of general relativity because he really felt it to be necessary um, that this principle distinguish the general theory of relativity from the theories that came before. It was supposed to be the theory in which the general principle of relativity held. The other theories were not supposed to be that sort of theory. The special principle was supposed to hold in them. So the question is, is there some other construal of, the princi of principles of relativity that are such that they, that they are special in, in the e earlier theories and general in the later theories? Is there a sense in which the laws of physics, in which a state of motion observes the laws of physics, that is such? that in Newtonian and special relativistic st theories, states of uniform motion see the laws all the same, but not states of accelerated motion, whereas in the general theory, all states of motion, accelerated, uniform, you take your choice, see the laws the same way. Well, there is an intuition about what it means to see the laws of physics in a certain way that goes back to Galileo. Now, Galileo was talking about a little bit different problem, but the way that he put the scenario of discussing the sort of the invariance of the laws of physics is so engaging that I can't help but read it to you, of course. On a visceral thought experiments. He's going to tell you how to think about things in a way that you can really grip. Very similar to Einstein in that way. So here's Galileo's visceral thought experiment to exemplify what it is to see the laws of physics the same way. Shut yourself up with some friend in the main cabin below decks on a large ship and have with you there some flies, butterflies, and other small flying animals. Have a large bowl of water with fish in it. Hang up a bottle that empties drop by drop into a wide vessel beneath it. With the ship standing still, observe carefully how the little animals fly with equal speed to all sides of the cabin. The fish swim indifferently in all directions. The drop falls into the vessel beneath. When you have observed all these things carefully, then have the ship proceed, um, where? Proceed, um, I'm supposed to be reading this, so I've got to read it in sequence. Um, um, right, proceed with any speed you like, so long as the motion is uniform and not fluctuating this way and that. Uniform motion. You will discover not the least change in all the effects named. Nor could you tell from any of them whether the ship was moving or standing still. The droplets will fall as before into the vessel beneath. The fish in their water will swim toward the front of their bowl with no more effort than toward the back and will go with equal ease to bait placed anywhere around the edges of the bowl. Finally, the butterflies and flies will continue their flights indifferently toward every side. 
The two states, the state of rest with respect to the bank and state of uniform motion will see the same laws of physics where the laws of physics relate to the flight of butterflies, flies, fish, and such things as that. A nice visceral image. It's really hard to take a visceral image like that and translate it into a theorem in general relativity. But I'm going to give you an inkling of what the kind of translation, of what a translation would involve. Let's sort of center on the butterflies. I like butterflies better than flies and fish. So I'm going to talk about the theory of butterfly motion. And let's consider this cabin of the boat to be filled with butterflies. Not so filled that they go crashing into each other, but sort of pretty much filled. And let's consider an observer sitting in the ship who watches the butterflies flying all around them. That's a job I could apply for. And, um, and records their positions as a function of time. That would be hard, that it takes six or seven folk. But the idea is he's sitting there in the corner watching all the butterflies flying around, and he's writing down in a large book. He's got all the butterflies numbered, Ralph, Sidney, Arnold, or whatever. And he's writing down. He's got a time. And at the, at, for each, each entry in the book is each butterfly's name and his position. Okay? He develops a large book if he looks at the butterflies long enough. Okay? That book we can call um, a model for the theory of butterfly. All right? Now, the idea is that if he took his book and put it away, and then he had the ship's captain speed up the boat to some other state of uniform motion, and he did the same thing, the two books would look the same. Given any, um, well, there'd be just a correspondence between butterfly trajectories as seen by the guy at rest and butterfly trajectories as seen by the guy in uniform motion. You couldn't tell if you were just given the books and not told which one was at rest and which one was at motion, which one was. They looked the same. That's still not quite um, um, abstracted enough to, to state the kind of principle that I want to state mathematically. So let's step back one step of abstraction and say, well, let's give this observer access not only to a particular set of butterfly trajectories, but all sets of butterfly trajectories. So he's got an even bigger book. And that big book is a set of all accounts of all possible sets of butterfly trajectories. It's a very big book. One chapter is one set of butterfly trajectories. Another chapter is another set of butterfly trajectories and such. Okay? That's for the at rest observer. Then you speed him up to where he's moving again at a uniform speed. And he compiles another large book. Each chapter in that book is a set of butterfly trajectories as seen by him at the other speed. Now the claim now is, given any chapter in the first book, there's an identical chapter in the second book. Okay? Each chapter in each book is a set, a complete set of butterfly trajectories observed over a long time. Any chapter in the first book has a cohort in the chapter in the second book. Well, since I, we didn't say how he should be sped up or speed him up in just this way or turn left at the corner and go backwards, we just said speed up to a state of uniform motion. This is true for any two states of uniform motion. So you've got this whole series of books. Each book corresponds to a complete set of observations of a complete set of butterfly trajectories for that particular state of motion. And given any two books, you can always map the chapters of them one to each other. Each book has an identical chapter corresponding to, each book has a chapter corresponding identically to another chapter in each book. All the states of uniform motion are equivalent in just that way. Given any state of motion, it defines a book. Pick a chapter from that book. Take another state of uniform motion, take its book, you'll find a chapter in that book with exactly the same entries. True for all uniform states of motion, the theory of butterfly satisfies the special principle of relativity. Now, I want to ask, does the theory of butterfly satisfy a general theory of relativity? Is it true that if I take this particular observer and I speed him up any way that I like, I'll be able to have the same kind of correspondence between these vast set of books where each book corresponds to a complete set of butterfly trajectories. Um, the answer is no. Now, why is that the case? Well, the difference between the two systems is this. A ship cabin full of butterflies is a physical system. It sits in space time. So if you say, I have a ship's cabin full of butterflies, you are defining the physical concept, the physical content of space and time. A world in which there was nothing but a ship's cabin full of butterflies would be a cosmos, and, it, and, and, and part of it, it would have this space and time, or space-time as it's popularly called by Einstein and people after him. Um, 
And the physical content of that space-time would be a ship's cabin full of butterflies. Now, in the Newtonian case that we were talking about, where Galileo was talking about, if you take the ship's cabin full of butterflies and speed it up, you don't do anything to the background geometry. The background geometry doesn't care what's in it. It sits there the same way, um, no matter what goes on inside it. But that's just where general relativity is different from Newtonian theories. The physical contents of space and time determine the geometry of space and time according to the general theory, the final form of the general theory. It's just this kind of problem that John was talking about when he was trying to decide, when he was talking about Einstein's trying to decide whether the thing would really form into a cusp as a physical process or whether, or whether three-dimensional spatial sections would have non-Euclidean geometry. He opted for the non-Euclidean geometry, and by opting for that, he declared his allegiance to the principle that the physical content of space and time determines the geometry. He wrote down Einstein's famous equation, called Einstein's equation appropriately enough, although famous doesn't appear in the books. They just say Einstein's equation rather than Einstein's famous equation, but it is famous. And roughly, that equation just says, as I just heard John Wheeler saying on the TV um, two nights ago, matter tells space how to curve and space tells matter how to move. That's essentially the content of Einstein's equation. If someone asks you in a cocktail party next week, hey, you went to this Einstein conference? What's that equation about? You tell them, matter tells space how to curve, and space tells matter how to move. Well, that means that when you change the physical contents of space, you change the background geometry of space. You change the moving instructions. Now, in, in the previous theory, in, Newton, in the Newtonian theory of butterfly, when you take your um, ship's cabin full of butterflies and speed it up, then the observer, who was there before and feels himself to be an unaccelerated observer, will, in the second case, feel himself to be an un unaccelerated observer again. But this isn't true for general kinds of general relativistic theories of butterfly. You can't guarantee that when you speed up the observer and the butterflies, that the observer will feel that he has the same state of motion as he had before. Let's put it another way, viscerally, in terms of the books. Let's add a column of entries to the books. Not only does the observer record the positions of the butterflies as a function of time, but he writes down for each time his own state of motion. Accelerated this way, <coughs> accelerated that way. And he sees he's got now entries not only for every butterfly, Arnold, Sidney, um, um, Jimmy, or whatever, but also Roger. And Roger's got an entry for his acceleration. Now the question, let's ask the broadened question then. Given any set of books where we have all these entries and a chapter corresponding to a complete set of butterflies and a complete set of my accounts of my own state of motion, is there for any other observer a corresponding chapter? Can I find a chapter in his book which has exactly the same entries for butterfly positions as a function of time and for his own dynamical variables as a function of time? The answer is no. And it's precisely because when you speed him up, you change the structure of space-time. So the principle in terms of books doesn't work. Everyone in terms of books, or should I say it again? Okay, just I will say it again. It's always best to say it again. Um, you've got a book. Each chapter is a complete set of butterfly trajectories and an account of my motions at each time. In the old theory, you could find a one-to-one -one correspondence between chapters of books. Any, given any chapter in one book, you could always find a chapter in the other book which had the same thing. That was enough to guarantee the special principle of relativity. And the general theory, if the general, th if the general principle holds, it should be possible for any observer, each observer defines a book, to find a chapter in the first guy's book that corresponds uniquely to a chapter in the second guy's book. For reasons having to do with the relationship between physical content of space and the properties of the geometry of space, that's not true. So the general theory of relativity does not embody a general principle of relativity if you take a general principle of relativity to be captured by this business of ship's cabins full of butterflies and books containing various kinds of entries. Now, I suspect that someone may be thinking, surely there's another way to do it instead, rather than ship's cabins full of butterflies, um, or even whatever bizarre mathematical formulation of that, ha of that that Jones wants to come up with. Um, and all I can say to you is that I've tried a bunch of different ways, and none of them work. Um, that may be only a statement of my own inadequacy, but um, John Ehrman um, has also done this, and since we've all been declared to be in the forefront of research on the subject, I guess you'd have to say that no one knows um, how to do it. Now, what does this mean? 
Well, it means that the, the principles don't really function in the complete, or at least this principle, doesn't really function in the completed theory in the way that Einstein thought it did. It doesn't give you a sense in which all observers are equivalent with respect to the laws of physics, where the laws of physics are general relativistic laws. Or at least it doesn't give you a sense that's capable of distinguishing the general theory from the earlier theories. The general covariance interpretation does the job, but it does the job of making everybody equivalent, but it doesn't distinguish it from the earlier theories. Apparently, as best I can tell, the general principle of relativity is not true in the general theory of relativity. Now again, that's my, that's my point, but of course if everyone has to put it in terms of Einstein's <laughs> ringing statements. Einstein made the closest I can come to an Einstein ringing statement having to do with this kind of universal validity of principles has to do not so much with principles in his case, but with mathematics, again in a different context. He said, um, as far as the laws of mathematics are certain, they do not refer to reality. And as far as they refer to reality, they're not certain. I want to bend that to talk about principles and to say what well, seems to be my experience, not only with the general principle of relativity, but with all the other principles except for the covariance principle, and in fact, with all the principles of physics, and to say the following. Um, insofar as the great principles of physics are precise, well, let me turn it around. Insofar as the great principles of physics are true, they're not precise. And insofar as they're precise, they're not true. All right, that's my statement. That's my end. <laughs> Question about butterflies. What the result is, there do exist general relativistic theories for which you cannot find such a correspondence. Okay. Can you hear me in the back? Is it working? Good. I'd like to uh, make some remarks about Einstein's uh, socialist views, and particularly uh, to relate them to one of the very profound remarks that Rabbi Feldman made for us earlier today. Uh, Rabbi Feldman had suggested, as I'm sure you'll recall, that uh, when one considers a thinker who is recognizably great in a given field uh, with respect to his work in other fields, one does not always find that greatness carrying itself over into the second field. I think what we will find, uh, at least uh, tentatively as I uh, discuss some of Einstein's socialist views, that as a socialist theorist, he was very comprehensive, that he attempted to apply socialist ideas to the 20th century in rather original ways. But nonetheless, I think we'll also see that he can really not be regarded as a major creative socialist thinker. In fact, his socialist views become most ap apparent when we consider that aspect of Einstein's activities that involved his uh, humanitarian work towards causes such as peace, disarmament, world government, refugee relief, and so on. In this context, that is to say relating to uh, the humanitarian activities of Einstein, I think what we will see is that his socialist ideas are quite different from those normally found in the Marxist tradition in one particular and crucial respect. And that is 
that Einstein's socialist commitment is directly and explicitly related to his view of the ethical meaning of human life. In the paper that I read, and I should emphasize just uh, in passing that I will be reading only sections of my paper, which is far too long for a 20-minute presentation, uh, I shall distinguish four main lines of argument on which Einstein grounded his appeal for the transformation of capitalist socialist social institutions into socialist ones. And these can be labeled for uh, sake of um, uh, of uh, following along easily. Uh, first, his ethical arguments. Second, his economic arguments. Third, his political arguments. And fourth, arguments that were grounded upon his concern for the very survival of humanity. And after tracing uh, these, uh, these arguments in some detail, uh, I will try to summarize at the end some of my more critical points concerning the place of Einstein's socialism in the history of socialist thought. First then, the ethical grounds for Einstein's socialism. In broad outline, Einstein's ethical arguments for socialism are of two distinguishable but related types. We might call the first type natural law arguments, and we might call the second type alienation arguments. In his natural law arguments, Einstein postulates, on the basis of certain empirical observations and certain scientific findings, that there are certain givens in human nature, most important of which are certain social drives or instincts, which require for their being fully actualized that societies be organized along certain lines rather than others, and in particular, that a modern industrial society be organized socialistically rather than capitalistically. In his alienation arguments, which are really variations on the natural law argument, Einstein starts from what he takes to be the facts that under capitalistic institutions, individuals are alienated from their nature. He points to evidence uh, such as the uh, widespread prevalence of certain dissatisfactions in social life, frustrations, antisocial behaviors, uh, the prevalence of numerous social injustices. And from these, he infers that there is a need to reorganize society in ways which would eliminate whatever institutions are responsible for causing these alienating effects so as to release individuals from these dissatisfactions, frustrations, uh, antisocial values, and injustices. So, under the ethical arguments, first, the natural law arguments. According to Einstein, man is both a social and individual being, according to his biological argument. He writes, man acquires at birth through heredity a biological constitution, which we must consider fixed and unalterable, including the natural urges which are characteristic of the human species. In addition, during his lifetime, he acquires a cultural constitution, which he adopts from society through communication and through many other types of influences. It is this cultural constitution which, with the passage of time, is subject to change and which determines to a very large extent the relationship between individual and society. Modern anthropology has taught us, through comparative investigation of so-called primitive cultures, that the social behavior of human beings may differ greatly, depending upon prevailing cultural patterns and the types of organization which predominate in society. It is on this that those who are striving to improve the lot of man may ground their hopes. Human beings are not condemned, because of their biological constitution, to annihilate each other or to be at the mercy of a cruel, self-inflicted fate. That was Einstein. We might say that descriptively, Einstein regards every individual as being totally dependent upon society for his physical, intellectual, and emotional experience and existence. An individual cannot be conceived as existing outside society. For such an individual, well, for all individuals, life, language, knowledge, values, and everything else have been made possible only through the work of others, both the, this individual's predecessors and contemporaries. The dependence of the individual upon others is so complete 
in Einstein's opinion, that an individual would remain, as he puts it, primitive and beast-like if left alone from birth. Prescriptively, Einstein holds that each of us exists for other people, not merely with or alongside other people. And just as our inner and outer life depend upon the labor of others, so there exists also a moral obligation of each to exert himself for others. <coughs> Further, because of this dependence of the individual upon his direct and indirect relations to contemporaries and predecessors, society must be considered as responsible for the fate of every individual. At the same time, since society, which may be structured in many different ways, is comprised of socialized individuals, each individual, according to Einstein, is responsible to society for his actions. And indeed, in Einstein's words, man can find meaning in life only through devoting himself to society. Indeed, one's value to the community can be said to depend upon how far one's feelings, thoughts, and actions are directed toward promoting the good of one's fellows. That, again, was, were the words of Einstein. As Einstein puts it still further, quote, the true value of a human being is determined primarily by the measure and the sense in which he has attained liberation from the self, end of quote. In other words, insofar as an individual has become free to devote himself to the good of others. Now, this doesn't mean, according to Einstein, that an individual's personal needs and desires must be ignored. Rather, since ethical behavior, according to Einstein, is based upon sympathy, education, and social needs, and since even one's personal desires are intrinsically directed towards society, despite often being misunderstood as egoistic, purely self-centered, even the actions of an incorrigible nonconformist, that's Einstein's words for what he believed himself to be, can be of the highest value to the community if they are ethically grounded, that is to say, grounded in liberation from egoism. This interdependence of individual and society entails that the health of society depends upon the existence of creative and morally exemplary individuals, as well as upon various societal institutions. And on the other hand, the moral health of individuals depend upon the health, the justice of society. Thus, we can sum up Einstein's natural law argument as follows. Society ought to be reorganized in such a way and the solitary needs, or individual personal needs, of all its members can be satisfied. Because of the interdependence of all individuals and their mutual dependence upon society, such a society that would meet all the needs of its members would have to be a socialist society. Now, this conclusion that such a desired society must be socialist rather than capitalist follows for Einstein because he sees capitalism as immoral, as being based upon egoism, precisely in contrast to his ideal of socialism, which in its essence, in Einstein's words, is directed towards a social ethical end and towards, again in his words, lofty ethical ideals. The argument from alienation, which as we'll see is related to this, despite the inter interdependence of individual and society, Einstein holds that contemporary capitalist society, for the most part, fails to live up to its obligation to meeting the needs of its members. This is the case because capitalist society fosters in individuals tendencies towards competitiveness and egoism which in turn render social existence brutal, insecure, and such as to be characterized generally by what Einstein calls painful solitude and isolation. These symptoms of the frustration of both the solitary needs and the social needs of individuals indicate the alienation of contemporary man from his nature and thus make the transformation of capitalist society into a socialist society desirable from Einstein's point of view. Following Veblen, Einstein sees ours as a historical epoch, which is still part of what he calls the predatory phase of human history. Socialism to Einstein, 
on the other hand, represents precisely the transformation from such a predatory phase to a higher phase, allowing for better scope for the actualization of man's dual nature. In Einstein's words, the real purpose of socialism is precisely to overcome and advance beyond the predatory phase of human development. Indeed, what Einstein calls the crisis of our time revolves around the relation of individual to society. Individuals very commonly feel their relation to society as being threatening, threatening their well-being, violating their natural rights, because, in Einstein's opinion, contemporary society accentuates egoism while causing person, the individual's social drives to deteriorate. Because we are prisoners of such socially reinforced egoism, we feel lonely, insecure, and unable to enjoy life, as Einstein observes. As he puts it, and the phrasing here is utterly direct, the real source of evil in Einstein's words, is the economic anarchy of capitalist society as it exists today. And thus he states, and again I quote him, we see before us a huge community of producers, the members of which are unceasingly striving to deprive each other of the fruits of their collective labor. Not by force, but on the whole in faithful compliance with legally established rules. In this respect, it is important to realize that the means of production that is to say, the entire productive capacity that is needed for producing consumer goods as well as additional capital goods may legally be, and for the most part are, the private property of individuals. That was Einstein. Now, if we leave aside for the moment the economic observations in this last passage, we see that Einstein regards socialism as necessary if individuals are to be able to outgrow and overcome competitiveness and egoism, to become liberated from the self, and if the community is to regain its moral health in general. And further, if reason and prudence are to be applied to the solution of social problems instead of leaving them to the chaotic play of instinct and passion. And not incidentally, as we shall see a little later, only such an ethical culture, in Einstein's phrase, instantiated in social institutions and in individual personalities as well, will permit mankind its chance, its last chance, to avoid global self-destruction with the newly created means of mass destruction of hitherto unimagined magnitude. At the root of Einstein's conception of socialism is his belief that, it is the, that socialism is the necessary means for making possible the fuller ethical development of the personalities of individuals, and this is what Einstein's highest goal is. Thus he tells us that that which is truly valuable is the human personality, which alone can create the noble and sublime. And morally healthy, that is to say non-egoistic personalities and creative individuals alone can make for a healthy community just as only the latter can make the former possible. But essential to the possibility of developing the artistic and intellectual powers of all individuals is the satisfaction of their physical needs, which, as we shall see below, is far from possible under capitalism. Only by inaugurating a planned economy, which would reduce the working time of all, according to Einstein, could everyone obtain the maximum possibility to develop their innate talents and their moral capacities. And in turn, only by promoting the sanity and moral vitality of its individual members could a society survive for, as Einstein puts it, a people that were to honor falsehood, defamation, fraud, and murder would be unable, indeed, to subsist for very long. The security and the time gained from a rationally planned economy and the moral values accompanying these as egoism and competitiveness diminish give Einstein hope that, as he puts it, Future historians will explain the morbid symptoms of present day society as the childhood ailments of an aspiring humanity due entirely to the excessive speed at which civilization was advancing. Now I'd like to turn to Einstein's economic arguments for socialism. Einstein had occasion on, uh, had occasion numerous times to discuss the economic problems of capitalism uh, ranging from those of the Great Depression of the 1930s to the prosperity in the United States uh, of the post-World War II period. 
On all these occasions, however, his analysis remained essentially the same. He focused upon relating, or I should say indicating the relations among capitalism's inability to provide jobs for all workers, its frequent spasms of overproduction, its periodic depressions and recessions, and its characteristic of increasing economic power in ever fewer hands. Fundamental to capitalism, competition, according to Einstein, leads inexorably to throwing people out of work as new technology is introduced, and thus great masses of workers are laid off periodically in recessions and depressions. In the long run, according to Einstein, this shows that capitalism is incapable of solving the problem of unemployment, which is to say, of providing for enough consumer demand to sustain its own prosperity. On the other hand, in Einstein's words, the logically simplest, but also the most daring method of achieving this, in other words, of maintaining reasonable wages for all workers, is a completely planned economy in which consumption goods are produced and distributed by the community, end of quote. Specifically, Einstein focuses upon the lack of responsibility of those who control a capitalist economic system. Quote, if the socioeconomic problem is considered objectively, it appears as follows. Technological development has led to increasing centralization of the economic mechanism. It is this development which is also responsible for the fact of relatively few. These people in the capitalist countries do not need to account for their actions to the public as a whole." End of quote. Thus, in Einstein's view, we have the height of immorality, an economic system which breeds egoism, which requires it, and which places control over social production in the hands of the most successful egoists, those who are least responsible to society. And this is the main reason why Einstein regards economic planning in the interest of society as a whole as necessary. He states the case as follows. I share the view that a socialist economy possesses advantages which definitely counterbalance its disadvantages whenever the management lives up, at least to some extent, to adequate standards. I also believe that capitalism will prove unable to check unemployment which will become increasingly chronic because of technological progress and unable to maintain a healthy balance between production and the purchasing power of the people, unquote, the last condition, of course, leading to uh, recession or depression. In the light of the ethical considerations which I've mentioned above, we can see that Einstein's uh, so-called economic observations on capitalism's shortcomings possess Thus, he argues directly from the physical, psychological, and moral effects of capitalism to the desirability, indeed the moral necessity of transformation to, capital, to socialism. The moral foundation of his conception of a socialist economy is perhaps made most clear in the following passage, in which Einstein describes what he calls the worst evil of capitalism. I quote him, unlimited competition leads to the crippling of the social consciousness of individuals. This crippling of individuals, I consider the worst evil of capitalism. Our whole educational system suffers from this evil. An exaggerated competitive attitude is inculcated into the student who is trained to worship acquisitive success as a preparation for his future career. And Einstein then concludes from this, I am convinced that there is only one way to eliminate these grave evils, namely through the establishment of a socialist economy, accompanied by an, ec an educational system which would be oriented towards social goals. More than changing attitudes, though, and changing institutions, what is necessary for socialism to work in Einstein's view is that the political power of all members of society become equalized. And this, in fact, brings us from the realm of economics to the realm of politics. As far as Einstein's political arguments for socialism are concerned, he is on record repeatedly as an advocate of democratic institutions. He says, my political ideal is democracy. Let every man be respected as an individual and no man be idolized. Unquote. 
But the concentration of enormous wealth in the hands of the privileged few effectively undermines democracy. For the people are unable to choose their leaders, the choices having been made for them by the oligarchy of capital or the plutocracy, as Einstein calls it. Einstein outlines this threat to democracy from the increasing concentration of capital in a number of hands uh, as follows, quote, the result of these developments is an oligarchy of private capital, the enormous power of which cannot be effectively checked, even by a democratically organized political society. This is true since the members of legislative bodies are selected by political parties, largely financed and otherwise influenced by private capitalists, who for all practical purposes separate the electorate from the legislature. The consequence of this, pardon me, the consequence is that the representatives of the people do not in fact sufficiently protect the interests of the underprivileged sections of the population. Moreover, under existing conditions, private capitalists inevitably control, directly or indirectly, the main sources of information, press, radio, education. It is thus extremely difficult, and indeed in most cases quite impossible, for the individual citizen to come to objective conclusions and to make intelligent use of his political rights." End of quote. Such a system amounts essentially to the application of force by one class against the others, whether violently, institutionally, legally, or any combination thereof. And as Einstein observes, force always attracts men of low morality. The real political issue here, at least by implication, is whether democracy can be made to work within a capitalist society or can better be made to work in a socialist one. Einstein's position, as you of course can see already, is that only by fostering independence of spirit and a sense of justice in the citizen, in other words, by overcoming egoism in civic matters, can democracy work. But since egoism is endemic to capitalism, and at least he hopes it will be diminished in, under socialism because it will no longer be socially reinforced in the economy. It is fair to say that for Einstein, democracy is seen as having a better chance of working effectively under socialism than under capitalism. I point out in passing, uh, I won't read you this, that uh, Einstein discusses bureaucratization uh, which, of course, he recognizes as an uh, uh, anti-democratic tendency which uh, began as early as the, uh, the, well, the, the, the revolutionary period in the Soviet Union. Einstein is uh, uh, consistently critical of bureaucratization. He regards bureaucracy as what he calls the death of any achievement. And as a result, Einstein's conception of socialism uh, entails that the education of individuals in a socialist society must involve their education in alertness to and action against all bureaucratic tendencies. But to return to the question of the rapid growth of state power in the capitalist countries, we see that Einstein relates this tendency to the historical process of the centralization of capital. Among the more dire consequences of the aggrandizement of state power are the ideologies of nationalism and militarism, the two greatest threats to world peace in Einstein's view. He observes, quote, the desire of nations to be constantly prepared for warfare has repercussions over the lives of men. The power of every state over its citizens has grown steadily during the last few hundred years no less in countries where the power of the state has been exercised wisely than in those where it has been used for brutal tyranny. The function of the state to under, pardon me, the function of the state to maintain peaceful and ordered relations among and between its citizens has become increasingly complicated and extensive, largely because of the concentration and centralization of the modern industrial apparatus. In order to protect its citizens from attacks from without, a modern state requires a formidable, expanding military establishment. In addition, the state considers it necessary to educate its, system, its citizens for the possibilities of war and education, not only corrupting to the soul and spirit of the young, but also adversely affecting the mentality of adults. No country can avoid this corruption. It pervades the citizenry even in countries which do not harbor outspoken aggressive tendencies. 
The state has thus become a modern idol whose suggestive power few men are able to escape." Unquote. These remarks on the expanding state take us from the realm of the properly political into the practical, Einstein's quest for disarmament for world peace and world government. The very possibility of the survival of civilization as we know it is threatened by two factors new in the 20th century. First, the tremendous, we might say, tremendous quantitative increase of tendencies towards nationalism and militarism. And secondly, the development and spread of nuclear weapons. The values of nationalism and militarism, two of the most important contributing causes of war, according to Einstein, have been accentuated by capitalist institutions. Speaking of the relation of capitalism and war, Einstein observed, quote, I believe this bogey, war, would have disappeared long ago had not the sound sense of the peoples, had the sound, had the sound sense of the peoples not been systematically corrupted by commercial and political interests acting through the schools and the press, unquote. Although it is simplistic to attribute the sole cause of war to those commercial and political interests which most directly benefit from it, there can be no question that these interests have played and continue to play important roles in perpetuating the system of state power, war preparedness, weapons research and development, militaristic, nationalistic, and racist ideologies, and so on, which increase rather than decrease the likelihood of war. But toward the end of his life, the urgency of nuclear disarmament apparently began to force Einstein to view war preparation and the need for peace within a context other than that of criticizing capitalist institutions and arguing for socialist ones. His focus turned to the failure of governments, all governments, and international organizations to reduce the danger of war. He says, in relations among separate states, complete anarchy still prevails. I do not believe that we have made any genuine advance in this area during the last few thousand years." Unquote. Towards the end of his life, Einstein seems to have wavered between treating the problem of war as a social one related primarily to capitalism's shortcomings or as a survival problem transcending all social and political systems. On the one hand, we find the familiar refrain to the effect that the causes of war must be sought in the shortcomings of ethical, political, and social life in societies uh, such as capitalist ones implying the necessity of uh, transformation to socialism. On the other hand, Einstein's arguments for world government, which he regarded as the immediate necessity to avoid nuclear confrontation, do not require the prior socialization of the economies of the major capitalist countries, nor in practical terms could they, for the danger of war is immediate that it must be dealt with on its own terms. Thus, Einstein found himself beginning about 1948, defending capitalist America against the attacks of some Soviet scientists who saw in US disarmament proposals only a subterfuge for maintaining the United States nuclear monopoly. Whereas these critics held to the concept of national sovereignty to facilitate the defense of Leninist socialism in the USSR, Einstein took the position that the cause of peace and disarmament must take precedence over every other objective presumably even over that of the ethical socialist transformation of the major capitalist countries. So Einstein wrote, and I quote, if we hold fast to the concept and practice of unlimited sovereignty of nations, it only means that each country reserves the right for itself of pursuing its objectives through warlike means. Under the circumstances, every nation must be prepared for that possibility. This means that it must try with all its might to be superior to anyone else. This objective will dominate more and more our entire public life and will poison our youth long before the catastrophe is itself actually upon us. Thus, we, we must not tolerate this, however, as long as we still retain a tiny bit of calm reasoning and human feelings. I advocate world government because I am convinced that there is no other possible way of eliminating the most terrible danger in which man has ever found himself. The objective of avoiding total destruction must have priority over any other objective. It would appear then that this assignment of the highest priority to peace is the one significant breach in Einstein's socialist orientation. 
When I began, I mentioned that I would make a few remarks concerning Einstein's place within the socialist tradition. I see that uh, reading what I have written has taken more time than uh, uh, I had anticipated. So I'll make the remarks very brief. The most important point to recognize is that Einstein's socialism is quite different from that that we find in the Marxist tradition. In fact, Einstein apparently uh, was ignorant of the intellectual tradition out of which Marxism arose and of the Marxist tradition itself. He appears to have become a socialist on the basis of his pacifist and uh, anti-militarist uh, feelings rather than on the basis of any theoretical concerns. And for this reason, on a number of very important points, some of which uh, I would say, and you, you can see it in the proceedings when they're printed, on some of these I think Einstein is the better socialist theorist than the Marxists, or let's say of Marx. On others, I give arguments to show that he's not uh, the better socialist theorist. Uh, the important point to bear in mind, I would suspect, is that uh, Einstein Einstein's socialist writings covered the entire gamut of the major socialist problems, some of which he solved in creative ways, others of which, unfortunately, he did not. Uh, my suspicion is that in the present era, when, when people even use the word socialism, uh, the automatic assumption is that we are talking about a form of Marxism, uh, There are advantages and disadvantages of being late in the program like this. The disadvantages, of course, are that many of the remarks I have to, made, uh, have to make are already familiar to you, although that may be something of an advantage because I need to go over the material that I have fairly quickly. Um, the advantage is that I did have a chance to modify my remarks to make them uh, more appropriate in the context of what has preceded. I must confess, however, that I have not done that. Um, <laughs> the, on, the only answer I can give is one that Martin Luther, I think, gave in an entirely different context. Ich kann nicht anders. I can do nothing else. Uh, so you'll have to bear with me if I uh, say some things that uh, are probably going to be unpleasant or offensive to uh, many of you. but. Uh, that perhaps links me more directly with Einstein and a characteristic of his that has been mentioned here earlier, that is his hotspot. I'm going to give a positive answer to the question my title poses. Einstein's work is relevant to the study of literature. But before I do, I must make some negative remarks. First, Einstein had very little to say directly about literature. I know of only a few scattered comments in his letters, and these comments are rather ordinary. Now, this may change when further publications, further publications of his letters come out, and I hope this is true, but I'm not too sanguine about that. He was certainly not hostile to literature. In fact, he had a deep respect for writers as different as Dostoevsky and George Bernard Shaw. But I find his remarks on literature of minor interest. Second. Although I am convinced that Einstein's physics can be made relevant to literature, I find most writers and critics have trivialized his theories in translating them into literature and criticism. The list of such trivializations is long, and most are based on the mistaken notion that the theories imply some sort of philosophical relativism. Almost no one has taken the trouble to become familiar with the theories themselves, either through Einstein's papers or re respectable expositions of them. Most have gone instead to sensational accounts like Sir James Jean's Physics and Philosophy, as, for instance, Lawrence Durrell did when he took the form and philosophy for his novel series, The Alexandria Quartet, from Special Relativity and the Space-Time Continuum. Critical applications of his theories have usually been no more sophisticated. Just one example, this from a critic who writes that in Thomas Mann's novel, The Magic Mountain, quote, Hans Kastorp's stay in the TB sanatorium begins near the peak of the metaphoric space-time mountain. Space and time set in densely. 
Kastorps relishes uh, time on his arrival, minute by minute, space inch by inch, space time, inch minute by inch minute, <laughs> end quote. My concern today, however, is not with the application of Einstein's physical theories to the study of literature, but with his philosophy, particularly his philosophy of science. And this brings me to my third negative remark, which is that Einstein's work is not relevant to literature as long as many of the epistemological and ontological assumptions prominent in criticism today, most of them connected in some way with contemporary science and its philosophy, are taken as final. The first of these assumptions is that language is not merely a means of expression used to give form to pre-existing ideas, but the fundamental determinant of these ideas. Nietzsche wrote a century ago that, quote, we have to cease to think if we refuse to do it in the prison house of language, end quote. And half a century later, Heidegger said that language speaks, man speaks, only insofar as he skillfully complies with language. Now, anyone who has struggled with language, particularly in attempting to express complex or subtle ideas, recognizes a measure of truth in these statements, though he may not want to go as far as they go. But others have gone farther, particularly 20th century linguists influential among literary critics. Edward Sapir, after extensive work with American Indian languages, came to the belief that our language, quote, powerfully conditions all our thinking about social problems and processes. Human beings do not live in the objective world alone, but are very much at the mercy of the particular language which has become the medium of expression for their society. It is quite an illusion to imagine that language is merely an incidental means of solving specific problems of communication or reflection. The fact of the matter is that the real world is to a large extent unconsciously built up on the language habits of the group, end quote. Thus, the world we know, the only world we can know, is a world determined by our language. And this is true regardless of which language or languages we know. Sapir made his statement in 1926. Much more recently, Roland Barthes, preeminent among French critics of the structuralist school, insisted even more strongly on the primacy of language in an article called Science Versus Literature. Barth's aim was to attack the belief fostered by science that, quote, language is simply an instrument which can be transparent and neutral and which is subordinate to the matter of science. Every utterance, Barth continued, implies its own subject, and thus objectivity is as imaginary as anything else, end quote. By its very nature, to the science of writing, structuralism in one of its several manifestations, belongs the task of, quote, smashing the theological idol set up by a paternalistic science, for only writing can oppose the self-assurance of the scientist and point out to him the sovereignty of language, end quote. Barth directed his remarks against the scientist because he knew that every right-thinking literary critic is already well aware of language's sovereignty. I think it is worth stressing that Barth is not arguing the difficulty of attaining objectivity, but its impossibility. For him, the distinction Frege made in his Grundlage between the origin of an idea and its proof does not hold, since both are subtly controlled by psychological and social factors, the latter embedded in language itself. The British critic Frank Kermode made the same point in another context. Writing about fictions, those we live by, as well as those we find in our imaginative literature, Kermode paused long enough to sweep the concepts and laws of physics in with fictions, that is, with those mental structures which are neither true nor false, subject neither to proof nor to disconfirmation, but only, like literary fictions, to neglect once they have outworn their usefulness. Kermode's justification, which comes, incidentally, by way of Hannah Arndt from Heisenberg and Bohr, 
is that the answers to the questions the physicists put to nature are purely human. All knowledge is ultimately self-knowledge. The second assumption is that we have no valid criterion for determining what constitutes a poem or, by extension, any other work of literature. A work becomes a poem when we decide to read and interpret it as such. Otherwise, it exists as a piece of prose, perhaps not even as a work of literature at all. To show how plausible this idea is, Jonathan Culler, an astute apologist and critic of structuralism, takes a short item from a French newspaper, prints it as a poem, and then shows how it can be read as a poem. Later, he takes a short poem by William Carlos Williams and prints it as prose, and it reads like prose. If this view of the nature of poetry seems strange beyond belief, then think about Heisenberg's remark on the path of the electron, which he says comes into existence only when measured and by virtue of, limita of the limitations of measurement at the subatomic level, exists as a set of points and not as a continuous curve. The path has no existence as such until one measures it. So neither a poem nor the path of a subatomic particle exists in and of itself, but only insofar as we decide to consider it as such. The poem and the path have no intrinsic reality. In criticism, this idea leads to anarchy, to the principle that a well-turned argument is a valid argument. In physics, it leads, along with other aspects of the Copenhagen interpretation, to controversies which have made quantum mechanics seem at times more like a branch of philosophy than an exact science. I'm sorry about that remark, but there it is. <laughs> the third assumption is the logical consequence of the first two. In the preface to his study of structuralism and Russian formalism, the American critic Frederick Jameson wrote that the history of thought is the history of its models. Jameson cited a number of models, including classical mechanics and the electromagnetic field, then charted the lifetime of a model, which, quote, knows a fairly predictable rhythm. Initially, he says, the new concept releases quantities of new energies, permits hosts of new perceptions and discoveries, causes a whole dimension of new problems to come into view, which result in turn in a volume of new work and research. Throughout this initial stage, the model itself remains stable, for the most part serving as the medium through which a new view of the universe may be obtained and cataloged. In the declining years of the model's history, a proportionately greater amount of time has to be spent in readjusting the model itself, in bringing it back into line with its object of study. Now research tends to become theoretical rather than practical, and to turn back upon its own presuppositions, the structure of the model itself, finding itself vexed by the false problems and dilemmas into which the inadequacy of the model seems increasingly to lead it. And at length, a model is exchanged for a new one." End quote. If we substitute the term paradigm, wherever Jameson uses model, we get a description similar to Thomas Kuhn's view of science as moving from one set of concepts, theories, and so on to another set without necessarily moving any closer to the truth about nature. Jameson cites the structure of scientific revolutions, though not here and only in passing. But it is hardly coincidental that his model of the history of criticism looks so much like Kuhn's model of the history of science. Moreover, I think it would not be wrong to say that the two views have more in common than Jameson's descriptions of models suggests. I refer specifically to Kuhn's sociologism, his assertion that, quote, there is no standard higher than the ascent of the relevant community, end quote, for determining which paradigm, or even, he implies, any problem solution is to be considered correct. Where does Einstein fit into this picture? Chiefly, I think, in opposition to these widespread and rather pessimistic uh, beliefs about knowledge and reality. 
He believed in a real external world which one could, through daring hypotheses and patient, disciplined effort, come ever closer to knowing, not as a reflection of oneself, one's community, or even one's language, but as it really is. I note in passing that Einstein committed the Nietzschean heresy, believing that he did not think within the prison house of language, but rather in signs and images. And he had very good reasons for his belief, reasons which are ignored by many scientists and philosophers of science and by virtually all students of literature. This is a pity because his belief could stand as a corrective to many of the excesses practiced sometimes even in his name in both philosophy and criticism these days. I cannot explain or justify Einstein's belief in any detail today, but I can point to some of its most important aspects and try to find and try to suggest why I find them compelling. In his youth, Einstein became intensely religious for a while, as you know, then rejected religion as he began to read popular scientific books and to question the authority of the Bible and with it every kind of authority, most notably that of the state and the rigidly disciplined school system he was raised in. Looking back later at his brief spell as a believer, however, he saw it as, quote, a first attempt to free myself from the chains of the merely personal from an existence which is dominated by wishes, hopes, and primitive feelings, end quote. Soon after this, he realized that physics offered him a much finer opportunity to devote himself to something outside himself. Out yonder, he wrote in one of the most striking passages of his autobiography, quote, out yonder there was this huge world which exists independently of us human beings and which stands before us like a great eternal riddle, at least partially accessible to our inspection and thinking. The contemplation of this world beckoned like a liberation, and I'm omitting something here, and understanding it swam as highest aim, half consciously and half unconsciously before my mind's eye." End quote. The religious paradise Einstein gave up was that of conventional religion. He never again espoused a sectarian faith, but he did come to believe in what he called cosmic religion. This religion, quote, knows no dogma and no God conceived in man's image, end quote. It moves beyond anthropomorphism to a view of God as nothing more nor less than the, quote, sublimity and marvelous order which reveal themselves both in nature and in the world of thought, end quote. The Greeks were the first to catch a glimpse of this sublimity, and thereafter it became one of the inspiriting forces of scientific advancement. It led, after centuries, to what we now call the scientific method, and it leads as well as Einstein's relentless fight for peace and constant concern for others amply demonstrate for one life to release from the prison of individual existence, and it allows one to, quote, experience the universe as a single significant whole. The study of physics as Einstein conceived of it and the glimpse of the marvelous order it led him to seem very much like the way the study of literature was often thought of until a few decades ago. In fact, Einstein sounds a little like Matthew Arnold when he says of his cosmic religion that, quote, it is the most important function of art and science to awaken this feeling and keep it alive, end quote. Much contemporary criticism, on the contrary, focuses on the work in relation to the self, glorifying individual and idiosyncratic responses rather than encouraging a view of the work and the self in relation to the world, resting on premises akin to the linguist structuralist concept of language in much the same way that subjectivism in physics arises from apparently objective positivist premises, it invites the reader to believe that he can know the work only as a reflection of himself. Now, this larger view is not easily won, as Einstein well knew from his struggles to grasp nature's secrets. 
but that it could be one was a conviction he held to throughout his career. Look at his worldview from another perspective. In his Herbert Spencer lecture of 1933, Einstein posed and answered a crucial question. Quote, if it is true that the axiomatic basis of theoretical physics cannot be abstracted from experience but must be freely invented, can we ever hope to find the right way? Nay, more. Has this right way any existence outside our illusions? Can we hope to be guided safely by experience at all when there exist theories such as classical mechanics, which to a large extent do justice to experience without getting to the root of the matter, end quote. Einstein's answer was unequivocal. Quote, there is, in my opinion, a right way and we are capable of finding it, end quote. Now this answer may seem strange coming from the very man who proved to nearly everyone's satisfaction that classical mechanics, long felt to be the one true description of the physical universe, does not get to the root of the matter. Yet the answer is perfectly in keeping with his epistemology, which combines empiricism and rationalism, taking the best aspects of each and rejecting what is problematic. Knowledge of the physical world is not to be sought directly through induction, but indirectly by way of imaginative guesses, bold theories or hypotheses guided, uh, guided by mathematical principles. Induction from experience will not yield the secrets of nature, first because physics has advanced beyond the explanation of surface phenomena to the abstract laws which lie beneath them, second because unbiased observation is not Quote, Knowledge cannot spring from experience alone, Einstein said, but only from the comparison of the inventions of the intellect with observed fact, end quote. But if induction from experience will not lead us to the general laws governing the universe, experience is nevertheless the supreme arbiter. In fact, as Einstein said, quote, all knowledge of reality starts from experience and ends in it, end quote. The physicist, prompted to explain the phenomena of his everyday world, finds the ultimate test of his explanations in this same world. Thus, every theory, though conceived by an imaginative act, must be constructed so as to yield, through rigorous logical deduction, empirical consequences which can be tested by anyone with the proper training and instruments. In this way, Einstein combines rationalism, setting up the theory, with empiricism, testing the theory. His method demands numerous guesses and that the many wrong guesses we are bound to make be dismissed. Man proposes, but nature disposes ruthlessly. And when nature fails to dispose of, other scientists try their best to finish off. Here, too, we have in barest outline a model for criticism. First, it suggests that we give up the notion that a poem is a poem only when we consider it as such, and that instead we attribute to it enough self-identity to keep it from dissolving into prose when we stop thinking about it. Second, the model suggests that rather than regard our interpretations as fictions, as Commode and others suggest, that we take them as either true or false. More specifically, it suggests that we should make bold hypotheses guided by formal criteria and that we accept the fact that most of our hypotheses will be refuted by a closer reading of the text or fail to stand up to further critical scrutiny. The model also calls for formal criteria to play a role analogous to the role mathematics and logic play in the natural sciences. I have only the vaguest notion of what these criteria might be. A few critics have begun, I think, to formulate some that may well be valid. But I am convinced that they must not perpetuate the sociologism Kuhn argues for in the sciences and which now operates pervasively and perniciously in literary criticism. But no criterion can be accepted a priori. Einstein rejected the Kantian category of the synthetic a priori, both explicitly in some of his essays and implicitly by destroying the concepts of absolute space and time and in replacing Euclidean with Romanian geometry as the geometry of the real world. 
This suggests that whatever criteria are adopted, they must be submitted to constant reappraisal in light of experience. It also suggests that no language has an absolute hold on us. And here I'm thinking not only of spoken and written languages, but of the language of mathematics. No one nowadays shares Descartes' belief that mathematics is the sole key to the physical universe, the language in which the book of nature is written. Today, mathematics is widely believed to be a human invention which grows and changes in interaction with experience. So too with natural languages, that these languages constrain and determine our view of the world partially, and what we can say about it is, as I said before, true. But that they do not absolutely determine our worldview is, I think, almost self-evident, though not to many contemporary students of literature. Einstein knew this in another context. He was well aware that everyday thinking is a complex affair. In his essay on physics and reality, he argued that the physicist, in analyzing what he does and its implications, must not restrict himself, quote, to the examination of the concepts of his own specific field, end quote, that he cannot even get started, quote, without considering critically a much more difficult problem, the problem of analyzing the nature of everyday thinking, end quote. Thus Einstein moved the analysis of the scientific method back to the thinking process, to the common ground from which all views of the world originate. He suggested that we do not simply observe the world, since that would result in a chaos of sense impressions. Instead, we form concepts and from them build up our picture of the world. Quote, out of the multitude of our sense impressions, we take certain repeatedly occurring complexes of sense impressions, and we correlate to them a concept, the concept of the bodily object. Considered logically, this concept is not identical with the totality of the sense impressions referred to, but it is a free creation of the human mind." End quote. Now this much corresponds to what linguists like Sapir and structuralists like Bart say about language. But whereas they, whereas they ignore the feedback process, the impact of our experience on our ideas about the world, Einstein recognizes its essential role. Concepts and their interrelationships formed as free mental creations are continually compared with experience, and they are justified, quote, only insofar as they are connected with sense impressions between which they form a mental connection, end quote. During his lifetime, Einstein dared to challenge some of the most venerated laws of physics and principles of mathematics. Now, 100 years after his birth, we can find in his philosophy a challenge to some of the most fashionable epistemological and ontological principles of literary criticism and, as well, suggestions for formulating better principles to take their place. Thank you. speakers we've heard this morning. Her original training was in science, although she then moved on to specialize in literature. And again, because of the blind review process, I was unaware of her previous achievements until quite recently. But she um, turns out to be the author of a string of papers with such intriguing titles as Virginia Woolf and Wave Mechanics, and uh, William Carlos Williams and Einstein. Um, among other things, she teaches an interdisciplinary course in physics and literature. Um, and she comes to us fresh from the Modern Language Association, where she's pre been presenting other work of this nature on the relationship between uh, the fine arts and science. Um, the subject of her talk this morning is Einstein's influence on modern American poetry. Dr. Donnelly.
This will be quick. On November 10th, 1919, the headlines in the New York Times read, Light all askew in the heavens, Einstein's theory triumphs. The following Sunday, the paper carried two articles and an editorial devoted to the new theories. Printing 16 articles on relativity that November, the Times was joined by many newspapers and magazines throughout the country reporting the results of Arthur Eddington's eclipse expedition and its partial verification of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Suddenly, Einstein became a popular culture hero, and the mind-boggling implications of his relativity theories caught the public imagination. Relativity cartoons, limericks, and jokes permeated the press. A New York Times editorial quips, quote, the rays of logic emanating from the mayor's office are bent as badly as Einstein's rays, and a man who annihil annihilated space may be able to provide our municipal government with some happy thoughts on the rapid transit problem. <laughs> the London Times complained about, quote, the craze to discuss Einstein between two rubbers of bridge, end quote. Everyone from art critics and cartoonists to the physicists themselves tried to explain the new theories to an eager public, and the explanations ranged from the erudite to the simple-minded. Many American poets paid attention to these popular discussions and incorporated their impressions of Einstein and relativity in their poetry. Their poetic response to relativity appears both in content and in form. In the first, the scientist and his new ideas become subject matter of the poem. In the second, the form or structure of the poem becomes, quote, relativized, end quote, whether or not the content refers to science. The following discussion examines both these characteristics as they appear in selected 20th century poetry. One of the first American poets to write about Einstein was William Carlos Williams, whose St. Francis Einstein of the Daffodils appeared in the magazine Contact in 1921. Written on the occasion of Einstein's visit to the United States, the three-page poem celebrates the physicist as a saint and a liberator, bringing freedom for all the daffodils. Put a copy of it up here for you to see. This is just a short selection from the long poem. April Einstein, through the blossomy waters, rebellious, laughing, under liberty's dead arm, has come among the daffodils, shouting that flowers and men were created relatively equal. Old-fashioned knowledge is dead under the blossoming peach trees. The old ways are all dead in the fresh-turned garden, all dead. All flesh that they have sung is long since rotten. Sing of it no longer. Sing of wise newspapers that quote, quote the great mathematician. As the revolution in physics progresses, it seems like spring days, swift immutable, winds blowing four ways. The orchard owner in his poem sleeps with open windows and throws off his covers one by one in response to the promising change, much as the revolutionaries in all fields discarded the old conventions and opened up to new possibilities suggested in the new theories of relativity. I'll close out for a moment. Einstein has come, wrote Williams, bringing April in his head. Einstein has come bringing springtime of the mind. Williams' enthusiastic welcoming of Einstein and his new ideas belongs with his concern with his own time and place, in contrast to such poets as Ezra Pound and T.S. Eliot, whose embrace of the rich traditions of past cultures made them see the modern world as a wasteland. A number of modern poets, however, assimilated the ideas of the new physics, or distortions of them as they were popularized, along with the new ideas showing up in modern art and music, and they attempted to translate them into poetry. One such figure was Archibald MacLish, who, like Williams, not only read the popular newspaper accounts, but seriously studied the new concepts in such works as Whitehead Science and the Modern World. As Hyatt Howe Wagner points out, MacLish's long poem, entitled Einstein, is, quote, not only the finest poetic tribute to the scientist, it is also an informed and interesting a comment on the philosophical significance of Einstein's achievement. The chief idea to emerge from the poem is that the new Einsteinian science 
has at once emphasized the centrality and the increased loneliness of the knowing mind, end quote. This poem opens with Einstein contemplating infinity, particularly his own physical limits in space and time. And I quote from the poem, he is small and tight and solidly contracted into space, opaque and perpendicular which blots earth with its shadow. And he terminates in shoes which bearing up against the sphere attract his concentration. But Einstein's mind does not share such limits nor could Jehovah and the million stars staring within their solitudes of light, nor all night's constellations be contained within his boundaries. After rejecting a hypothesis of subjective reality, quote, a world in reason, which is in himself and has its own dimensions, Einstein, the protagonist of this poem, seeks unsuccessfully for images and models capable of expressing his ideas but models cannot portray a four-dimensional space-time continuum. He then turns to violins that, quote, can sing strange nameless words that image to the ear what has no waiting image in the brain, end quote. But the music vaguely ravels into sound and cannot be the language of his thoughts. Words do not work either. Quote, there, are no, there is no clear speech that can resolve their texture to clear thought. Now there are no words, nor names to name them, end quote. So the physicist's reason moves into further abstractions until, in his mind, he comprehends the cosmos. And I'll show you another section from this long McClish poem on Einstein. Okay. He lies upon his bed, exerting on Arcturus and the moon forces proportional inversely to the squares of their remoteness, and conceives the universe, atomic. He can count oceans and atoms and weigh out the air in multiples of one and subdivide light to its numbers. If they will not speak, let them be silent in their particles. Let them be dead, and he will lie among their dust and cipher them undo the signs of their unreal identities and free the pure and single factor of all sums, solve them to unity. Einstein's loneliness, which so many critics notice in this poem, derives partly from the extraordinary sense of space McClish creates by portraying the cosmos through Einstein's eyes. He is alone in his contemplation all other humans are conspicuously absent in this poem as Einstein's isolated intelligence makes images, quote, pattern from eddies of air, which are perhaps not shadows, but the thing itself and may be understood, end quote. Still, beyond the power of his prodigious mind, outside the laws of his finite but unbounded universe, he finds himself, quote, something inviolate, a living something, which cannot be explained by physics and which connects him with the rest of us. A similar sense of loneliness in cosmic, cosmic space appears in Robert Frost's sonnet, Any Size We Please. This time, however, the loneliness occurs in contemplating a Newtonian universe which extends to infinity, while the curved space of modern physics seems a much more friendly place to be. I'll give you an example. No one was looking at his lonely case, so like a half-mad outpost sentinel indulging in an absurd dramatic spell, albeit not without some shame of face, he stretched his arms out to the dark of space and held them absolutely parallel in infinite appeal. Then saying, hell, he drew them in for warmth of self-embrace. He thought if he could have his space all curved, wrapped round in itself, and self-befriended, his science needn't get him so unnerved. He had been too all out, too much extended. He slapped his breast to verify his purse and hugged himself for all his universe. <laughs> Note that Frost shifts from the Newtonian to the modern universe halfway through the poem at the Sejura in line seven. The rhyming in that quatrain of parallel with hell 
refers to an infernal loneliness the persona felt confronting absolutes and infinity. On the other hand, Frost's treatment of a comforting curved space carries an ironic tone. The persona turns inward and shrinks the curved cosmos down to his own size. He hugged himself for all his universe and did not feel secure with any larger conception. Frost remained skeptical of so-called scientific progress, though he could not fairly be accused of being against pure science. Always he maintained a stubborn faith in individual human intelligence, whether the individual be a farmer or a physicist. Still, he usually responded to aspects of contemporary physics by acknowledging the concepts and then rejecting them for his own personal reasons, as if he were choosing to work with truths that science did not address. The poem Skeptic serves as a typical example. Far star that tickles for me my sensitive plate and fries a couple of ebon atoms white. I don't believe I believe a thing you state. I put no faith in the seeming facts of life. I don't believe I believe you're the last in space. I don't believe you're anywhere near the last. I don't believe what makes you so red in the face is after explosion going away so fast. The universe may or may not be very immense. As a matter of fact, there are times when I am apt to feel it close and tight against my sense, like a call in which I was born and still am wrapped. Note that Frost's poetry retains traditional formal patterns of sonnets and quatrains, the controlled rhyme and rhythm providing clear structures and boundaries. His adherence to these traditional forms corresponds to his fairly traditional attitude of the poet towards science which is one of skepticism, if not out-and-out -out antagonism. Many modern poets, however, have tried to liberate their poetry from such restrictions in an effort to let the formal structure emerge from the content rather than forcing the content into an already given structure. Without abandoning form, many poets attempted to invent open patterns that gave shape to contemporary ideas. William Carlos Williams explained that his experimentation with poetic measure found justification in Einstein's relativity. From his reading of Alfred North Whitehead and of Charles Steinmetz's four lectures on relativity and space, Williams learned that the measurements of space and time varied with the observer's frame of reference. But poems for Williams are measures of space and time. In adapting relativity to the measure of a poetic line, Williams wrote that, quote, poems cannot any longer be made following a Euclidean measure, beautiful as that may make them. The very grounds for our beliefs have altered. <coughs> relativity gives us the cue. We have to do with the poetic as always, but with a relatively stable foot, not a rigid one." End quote. Williams consistently related the necessity for a changed poetic line to the theory of relativity. He asked, quote, how can we accept Einstein's theory of relativity, affecting our very conception of the heavens above us of which the poet writes so much, without informing, excuse me, without incorporating its essential fact, the relativity of measurements, into our own category of activity? Do we think we stand outside the universe? Relativity applies to everything, end quote. In the book-length poem, Patterson, Williams incorporates the same idea as he links the need for a new poetic form with Eddington's eclipse expedition and his measurement of the apparent displacement of stars. Quote, without invention, nothing is well spaced. Unless the mind change, unless the stars are new measured according to their relative positions, the line will not change. The necessity will not matriculate. Unless there is a new mind, there cannot be a new line, end quote. Note that in these examples of poetry from Williams and from McClish, the old formal patterns of rhyme and meter have been replaced by new forms. The rhythms of these new lines, while certainly apparent, still cannot be subjected to a standard scanning, no steady iambic pentameter, for instance. Rhymes have been abandoned in favor of careful attention to assonance and alliteration within the lines. Few lines complete a phrase or sentence at the end of the line, but instead continue the thought and rhythm on into the next line. For Williams, all these changes reflect the poet's effort to make the form of the poem relative to its content. Another poet experimenting with poetic forms was E.E. E. Cummings, whose visual jokes and typographical games made him famous as an avant-garde writer. 
even though its content was often conventional. Cummings, too, paid attention to the achievements of the new physics, but that awareness did not increase his respect for man's wisdom or humanity. Cumming, Cummings, in his poem, Space Being Don't Forget to Remember Curved, connects the change brought on by relativity with those occurring in the rest of the culture, especially the loss of religious faith, coupled with the increase of man's own sense of power. I'll show you this Cummings poem. Okay. Space being, don't forget to remember, curved. And that reminds me, who said, oh yes, frost, something there is which isn't fond of walls. An electromagnetic, now I've lost them. Einstein expanded Newton's law preserved continuum, but we read that before. Of course, life being just a reflex, you know, since everything is relative, or to sum it all up, God being dead, not to mention interred, long live that upward-looking, supreme, serene, illustrious, and beatific Lord of creation, man, at a least crooking of whose compassionate digit Earth's most terrific quadruped swoons into billiard balls. While at first this poem may seem to be without form, a closer Examination reveals that it is a fractured and recombined sonnet with rhymes at the ends of the lines. Capitalization forces emphasis, both for important words and for accenting the rhythm. Note that God is in small case in contrast to Lord of creation man. The ironic tone, of course, indicates Cummings' attitude towards modern man, who at one moment conceives of curved space in a finite but unbounded universe, and at the next, arrogantly kills the largest land animal in order to use its ivory for human toys. In other words, Cummings notes that in spite of man's brilliant achievements in science, he remains irresponsible and selfish, and therefore is not a very wise or safe god for this world. In conclusion, it is interesting to note that the scientists often regard the poets as being those people in society most in opposition to their discipline or else most ignorant of science. In physics texts written for non-scientists, for instance, one can find poets debating with physicists, as in Baker's Modern Physics and Anaphysics, for example. Or one can read March's Physics for Poets, the title of which indicates that if poets can understand this, anybody can. <laughs> Apparently, however, many American poets did pay attention to the new ideas developed in modern physics, and several of them, Williams and McClish in particular, respected and honored Einstein as a great man whose introduction of a new physics meant a new metaphysics and for them a new aesthetics for the 20th century. Finally, allow me to close with a limerick which may have been written by Einstein himself. It indicates his awareness of interdisciplinary relationships and his great sense of humor which let him smile back at God and laugh at himself. Limerick goes this way. In a notable family named Stein, there was Gert, and then Epp, and then Ein. Gert's writing was hazy, Epp's statues were crazy, and nobody understood Ein. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, the uh, group here that's assembled this morning is the result of several meetings of a planning group that consisted of, of, of uh, people from the different departments within the university and the uh, teachers and science supervisors from both the public and private school systems throughout the Memphis area. Uh, we're here for, we have really three, as I saw, three different, pers uh, three different purposes for meeting here. One is to determine what are the specific needs of science teaching in this area and the students and uh, how, how these could be met by facilities of both the university and the school system to determine how these needs can best be implemented. And finally, we would like to be able to determine how to per per perpetuate and continue any successful programs that may grow out of this particular meeting. Uh, we uh, sincerely hope that this meeting will launch a uh, long continuing era of uh, fruitful cooperation for all of us and in order to uh, get this meeting underway just as soon as possible because we have a long program, I think this program will unfold and its purposes will become self-evident. I just would now like to introduce a person who would like to a few words to welcome on part of the university, Dr. Jerry M. Boone, who is our academic uh, president for, uh, vice president for academic affairs, <laughs> excuse me, and uh, that's well, what it means is he's the boss of everything going on in the academic area around here, and Jerry, if you take over. <laughs> It uh, has been a great week at Memphis State University, and this is a, a fine uh, way to wind it up. It's been a good week for the sciences. It's been a good week for philosophy. It's been a good week for the humanities. Uh, it's been one of the finest weeks for scholarship of all kinds that I think we've seen at Memphis State. I, I certainly hope that uh, many of you from outside the university as well as from inside had an opportunity to attend uh, the earlier sessions this week the Einstein celebration because they were uh, just fabulous and any of you who missed them uh, missed a lot. Uh, it's particularly uh, good uh, and fine I think this morning uh, to have the science faculty and the, the science education faculties of Memphis State join with the uh, Shelby County Schools and the Briarcrest System and the Memphis City Schools and the schools of the Catholic Diocese to uh, bring together all of the science teachers and science students, not quite all of them, uh, for this session this morning. And like Glenn, uh, I hope that uh, uh, you all will grace us again with your presence to uh, do the same thing. Uh, you, uh, those of you who did attend some of the Einstein series yesterday, uh, know what a treat you have in store for you this morning, and you want me to sit down so you can get on with it uh, to hear Dr. Posen again. Those of you who weren't here, well, I'll tell you you're in for a treat. Um, Dr. Posen, I will not try to introduce him because that will be done by someone else, but I do want you to know that you have a very eminent gentleman to speak to you today who, uh, among other distinctions, has the honor to have addressed in 1946 the Engineers Club of Fargo, North Dakota. Uh, I'll get out of the way and uh, again say welcome. sometimes gets to be a problem. I'm Pete Sugar, chairman of the physics department here at Memphis State, and I have the delightful privilege of introducing our guest speaker this morning. There are many things that I could say about Dr. Posen. Uh, I met him on Thursday of this week. Uh, I have known him for a very long time. Now, when I say I have known Dr. Posen for a very long time, 
I don't mean that we have met um, by mail or by telephone, anything of that sort. I met Dr. Posen through the many excellent teachers that I've had through the years. I think you're going to find that he's the embodiment of all of the great teachers that you have had a chance to know. That's the way I felt about him. Uh, his background, his, he's, a he's a native of Russia, educated at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, he has received six Emmy Awards for his educational television productions. Written, he told us yesterday, some 32 books. He's lectured all over the world. But most important, from your point of view and from our point of view, is that Dr. Posen is a teacher, a teacher in the rare and real sense. He was a colleague of Einstein's, but I think even more important than that, he was a teacher, and he is a teacher. Dr. Daniel Q. Posen, professor of physics and chairman of the interdisciplinary sciences at San Francisco <coughs> State University, Dr. Posen. tender and tolerant loving care to possible development for about four billion years. This guy hasn't got it. He's got other plans. He's going to make life, but uh, you know, I told you how. And so he explodes in two million years. The moral is, if you leave our solar system, don't go to the zone of life of an old type star. See, because probably about when you get there, meow. <laughs> Now, the same thing here. This type doesn't live long. I'm looking for about four billion years. You get it right here with the Fs. The Fs live at least four billion years, some longer. There are gradations of F. And so that would be, again, talking about our type of life, could be handled. Ours is certainly very nice. K is still better, to tell you the truth. Zone is narrow, but if a planet is there, a K could live for 50 billion, 50 billion years before puffing. There's a little bit of trouble with M. M lives the most. It has a narrow zone of warmth, a zone of life. If there's a planet there, uh, you would figure, well, that's fine. Development can occur with billions of years to spare. Uh, but the M's are not hot enough to make sufficient ultraviolet light for our type of life. We don't count them. Just, just too bad. We need some ultraviolet. We don't need to get uh, sunburned at the beach, but we need normal ultraviolet light. And the M's don't make enough, but they're not hot enough. So if I were traveling from uh, this system, which is one of these, we, our sun is a G from one of these to somewhere else. I would go to a K position here, or to an F star, or why not to another G, which hasn't been living that long yet. So when we talk about the life in the universe, that the black hole thing you gave me gave, gave a whole latitude of things uh, to mention here, and I'll change subjects in a moment. When we talk about going to another visiting another solar system. Of course, everybody knows here that this is, not, this is very elementary. Uh, this is Mercury right here, and Venus, and Earth, and Mars <coughs> with a couple of moons, and Earth with one, and Jupiter, right? Uh, Saturn with some moons, and Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, and Pluto. Uh, I'm not talking about travels like that. That's in the bag. Travels like that are in the bag, uh, either automatically <coughs> or spaceships. That's nothing. We could do that any time. Not that I'm pushing. I'm just examining ideas. Uh, OK, maybe money should be used some other way. I don't care. But, OK, and we could do this, and we could go to Pluto very soon, any time we wanted to. That's not what they mean when they say UFOs, for example, unidentified flying objects. They mean, people mean, if they understand the thing at all, they mean from another G or another F or whatever. And here they are. Here are some beings. And they left and they come here. Or they come here like that. Who's got any questions? Just 
wanted to make that part clear. Yes. <clears throat> could could there be two of these close together that do something? The two solar systems? No, no. Two, two of the black holes close together. Oh, that would be extremely rare. If you had two black holes, one of them would win because of gravity. And mesh and make a super black hole, which would collapse even faster and travel through the tunnel we think and give out the energy. What else? Yeah. So, a question. Where I, um, I'm going to get to Einstein, don't worry. Yeah. Okay, what I've studied about uh, stars is the uh, irony is about the limit on the elements in the star accumulation. Where, where do we, where we get uh, the heavier elements? The heavier he, he knows that the, by that fusion technique, you can get, remember I was doing like three lithiums, me three lithiums, that's a carbon. And then I said there's another process. By this technique, you can get to building up to iron. And beyond that, these hunks have been so successively squeezed. Remember, the lithiums, they were hydrogens that got squeezed to helium, the squeeze, squeezed. I mean, how much can you get? Uh, so by the time you make iron, you have squeezing the squoze out of these things, you know? <laughs> and thereafter, another process takes place. Isn't that a marvelous thing? Somebody figured it all out that um, a, a neutral particle, let's say here's iron. He knows that the iron can be made this way. This is an iron nucleus with a bunch of pluses in here and a bunch of neutral particles. And this is a very happy iron particle, just one. Normally, it would have the electrons running around. But in the star, I remember I said the star or electrons stripped off usually. But uh, if a neutron should fly in here from uh, surroundings, there are neutrons and there are protons and there are lithiums and cal If a neutron should fly in here, it would upset this delicate balance. I mean, this iron, the iron was happy the way it was made. And this flies in, we believe, and upsets the balance. I'll, I'm going to let it fly in. And it makes the whole thing unstable. And then one of the neutrons, watch now gives out a minus from its innards. Now you should immediately say, I don't see any, I don't see any minus in a neutron. Well, I'm going to say it again. One of the neutrons gives out a minus and thereby becomes a plus. Now I'm all right, because if you put the minus back, it cancels the plus. That's OK. So one of the neutrons gives out a minus because it was, the whole thing was disturbed. And thereby, thereby becomes a plus, see? a posteriori. And now if you look at it, that's not iron. That's cobalt. Because it's got another plus. So the elements get built up beyond iron by what we call neutron capture and the beta decay. Beta, they call these, they, they didn't know what these were a long time ago. They're just electrons, but from the nucleus, they call them beta. And they didn't want to call them X because the can use X for something else. So they call it beta, uh, just like, well, that's enough of that. Don't want to confuse the issue. So uh, it's by neutron capture and beta decay. How are we doing? And if the, another neutron enters this cobalt, I mean, not all of them. This guy's happy now. But another neutron actor enters the cobalt, and if that's upset, we're going to go up one more, and that's it. What other questions? I better do relativity now. Hmm? Einstein, after all. Do you have a question? Okay, a question was about black holes, and I was saying nothing can get out. Hawking, Stephen Hawking, actually says that some radiation gets away, not out, but gets away. Now, in the, you know, I start, gee whiz, I started to tell you there are four types of black holes. And I only did one, but it made us do a lot of things. Well, maybe I'll do the others, but uh, stick around. I've got to answer that one. Look, here's the remnant, and it's on the way to being squeezed, and everything <coughs> is being captured, and nothing can get out 
but Hawking has in mind the following. He says you could have like a gamma ray come through, interact with something, and produce, let's say, remember I did that before? There, it's still there. Produce, let's say, a plus, and produce a minus, and this one is captured, and this one gets away, and you and I are out here, we say, wow, the black hole's emitting electrons. <laughs> See it? It's from adjacent conversion. Why don't I uh, hit through the other kinds of black holes just around it? Because you, 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 you won't encounter it, really, if they don't write it up. Uh, this is called normal, and we've been through it. I, I think that's pretty good. I think, I think I understood what it did. Now, the second kind is a Hawking, again, mini black hole, M-I-N-I, M-I-N-I. -I. And that means miniature, see? And he s believes, he does his mathematics, he assumes things, he believes that when the universe began, now this is, this is a kind of thinking that comes from Big Bang universe notion. Now, I think almost everybody knows, but I'm going to do it really rapidly. 30 seconds. Uh, once upon a time, there was a great sphere at 100 trillion degrees. And if you ask me who put it there, I have to say God, or I don't know. You know. Uh, okay, a great big sphere, and nothing else, at 100 trillion degrees, and gamma rays, in it. that's all, gamma rays. No particles, because this temperature is so great. The gamma rays are so ferocious that uh, a particle couldn't be formed. It would be dissolved right away. You know, gamma rays can disintegrate things, and how? So gamma rays, and then yeah, that happened. I mean, it's a sphere, it's a bomb, sort of. A great expansion takes place. I like expansion better than explosion. Sudden expansion takes place. Now the cooling. See, all oh, the gamma rays convert to a, a lesser radiation through a certain process, I'll tell you later, maybe. Anyway, so expansion and cooling, expansion and cooling. But, and until we get today, what we are, and particles can form, and here we are. But, about Hawking. During this a sudden expansion, there are c miniature collisions in many places, billions, trillions, I mean shock waves, which make tiny black holes. That's Hawking. Make tiny black uh, We haven't found them. Hey, you should have asked me, have we found any, have we found any regular black holes? Mm -hmm. Well, save that. Let me finish this. So the mini black hole, that's his theory. And and so the universe may be populated now with uh, uncountable numbers of miniature black holes. And they are unstable. Now, here I show the regular black hole being unstable by this technique and very little, see how occasional? <coughs> but with Hawking calculations about the mini black holes, uh, we get the answer that after about 20 billion years of existence, they pop, <laughs> they pop. The concentration has been building and building and diminished to a bomb, and he calculates about now they ought to be popping. Because <laughs> the Big Bang people think that the universe is about 20 billion years old. So uh, many black holes should become <laughs> little white fountains yeah at any moment. When we go out, maybe they'll be, we'll take a good look at the psychology buildings, see if it's popped around. Uh, that's second type of black hole. So I gave you a regular, uh, this is mini. The third one is uh, massive black holes. Now we had a speaker from Harvard University yesterday, Dr. Chason who reported about massive black holes, maybe. Well, we have known, uh, before Harvard, we have known about a galaxy called M87, in which a central region seems to be executing swirls, uh, uh, forcing swirls there. Now, remember, though, this is all supposed to be stars, you know, billions, 200 billion, 300 billion, and so on, stars. But in the central region, in that galaxy, there seem to be swirls executed with radiation coming out. And the pattern of the way the radio waves come out uh, makes you think that this is a giant black hole swallowing stars. 
not just a stray atom or a spaceship, started swallowing stars, solar systems. And the size of this thing is bigger than our entire solar system. Not, not like a star, you know, that's like 7 billion miles wide, bigger than that. That's a giant black hole. And Dr. Now, we knew about this one, the possibility, that's sort of recent. And Dr. Chasen then reported that the Harvard people believe that there's one of these in our own galaxy. And you can thank your stars. <laughs> hey, that's pretty good. I got to remember that one. Never said that before. You can thank your stars that we live, like that, Joe, that we live far out that we're not here in our galaxy. Remember, we are out here. And if there's swirling to be done, you can have it, brothers, you know? Uh, yeah, me, I'm for living in the suburbs. <laughs> That's where we live. So giant, we've got three now, huh? Giant black holes. Now, I invented one, theoretically. Number four. So here is our universe, <clears throat> our galaxy. Yeah. Uh, here's the Andromeda galaxy. By the way, it's much, much bigger than our galaxy. Galaxy is a great collection of stars, right? Don't mix it with the solar system. Solar system is just one of these with some planets, another with a planet, another, another. You know. Okay. And uh, here's another galaxy, another galaxy, and so on. And let's say uh, there's a limit. Let's believe. Let's believe the astronomers and the physicists for a while about the Big Bang. And uh, now the universe is about this big. See? <clears throat> now, now, Einstein. Uh, that, that's, I really was thinking of relativity, but uh, this is part of relativity. I, I'm going to do something more direct later. Uh, I'm thinking about him now. And if a light beam should start from Earth, remember this is not a flat pizza plate, it's a sphere, uh, then there's curvature all around. Masses affect light. He predicted that and was discovered in 1919. It'll go all the way around and come back. Like uh, if I'm outdoors and I want to see how long my hair is, I don't need a mirror. There's a harder way to find out, much harder. I just stand here like this and I look and I look, and the image of the hair has started, and going, you know, outdoors, <laughs> and going, and going, and I wait, and then finally I see, and by that time, there's no doubt about it that I need a haircut, you know. <laughs> you know? Uh, well, anyway, it goes all around, S all around. Are you with me? Nothing can escape our universe because of the mass effect of the holding action. Watch. So if you are out here, or a cousin of yours, you see a black hole, only you don't see it. Because nothing can get out here. The universe is a super black hole on the Big Bang theory. Well, while, I, while I'm hitting this, I want to tell you about a very imaginative astronomer. Uh, many of you know who I'm going, whom I, I will mention, Fred Hoyle, who says, yeah, I guess I believe this about the size, about the Big Bang, about the origin of the universe. Uh, you've convinced me. He used to have a different idea. I need more room, so I'm going to draw our universe about like this. Here was the Big Bang. Now we're up to here. That's it. And okay. And the uh, Hoyle says, "You convinced me. I guess that's right." Uh, Mount Palomar says, "That's the universe. This is the universe. Big Bang, 20 billion years ago. This is it." Hoyle says, "Great. What do you call it? Uh, Big Bang, the universe." Hoyle says. I could believe that, but I think there's another one just like that out here. Yeah, and uh, that's a big bang. And there's another one over here. Like that. That's a big bang. And there's another one over here. That's a big bang. 
And this one's going to bang next Thursday. <laughs> and this one did a ages ago. And this one's on. He wants an infinite number of these. And he doesn't want to call this universe because we've got problems with words. Universe, universe. So let's call this sub universe. Sub universe. Palomar doesn't like that. They want this is it. See, sub universe, sub universe, and all put together, infinite number, that's the universe. See? So he believes in an infinite number of little big bangs. See, like that. And each one is a black hole whole when viewed from the outside. There's no communication because yeah, yeah, yeah. How are we doing? Any remarks? Let's do a little relativity before I get kicked out of here. We've got some kind of time limit? Bob? Uh, Pete? Pretty sure. Well, I better do a little outline and then a few Words uh, pretty short.